Chapter One of Mr. Waddington of Wick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair. Chapter One. One. Barbara wished she would come back for the last hour fanny waddington had kept on passing in and out of the room through the open door into the garden bringing in tulips white pink and red tulips for the flowered low stuffed bowls hovering over them caressing them with her delicate butterfly fingers humming some sort of song to herself the song mixes itself up with the stores list barbara was making two dozen glass towels twelve pounds of sprats puppy biscuits one dozen gents all silk pyjamas extra large size a hum hum a hum hum that impromptu of schubert's and with the notes barbara was writing mrs waddington has pleasure in enclosing fanny waddington would always have pleasure in enclosing something a hum boom hum he a sound so light that it hardly stirred the quiet of the room if a butterfly could hum it would hum like fanny waddington barbara madden had not been two days at lower wick manor and already she was at home there she knew by heart fanny's drawing-room with the low stretch of the tudor windows at each end their lattices panelled by the heavy mullions the back one looking out on to the green garden bordered with wallflowers and tulips the front one on to the round grass-plot and the sundial the drive and the shrubbery beyond down the broad walk that cut through it into the clear reaches of the park she liked the interior the persian carpet faded to patches of grey and fawn and old rose the port wine mahogany furniture the tables thrusting out the brass claws of their legs the latticed cabinets and bookcases the chintz curtains and chair covers all red dahlias and powder blue parrots on a cream-coloured ground but when fanny wasn't there you could feel the room ache with the emptiness she left barbara ached she caught herself listening for fanny waddington's feet on the flagged path and the sound of her humming as she waited she looked up at the picture over the bureau in the recess of the fireplace the portrait in oils of horatio bish waddington fanny's husband he was seated heavily seated with his spread width and folded height in one of the brown leather chairs of his library dressed in a tweed coat putty-coloured riding breeches a buff waistcoat and a grey-blue tie the handsome florid face was lifted in a noble pose above the stiff white collar you could see the full slightly drooping lower lip under the shaggy black moustache there was solemnity in the thick rounded salient of the roman nose in the slightly bulging eyes and in the almost imperceptible line that sagged from each nostril down the long curve of the cheeks this figure one great thigh crossed on the other was extraordinarily solid against the smoky background where the clipped black hair made a watery light his eyes were not looking at anything in particular horatio bish waddington seemed to be absorbed in some solemn thought his wife's portrait hung over the card-table in the other recess barbara hoped he would be nice she hoped he would be interesting since she had to be his secretary but of course he would be anybody so enchanting as fanny could never have married him if he wasn't she wondered how she barbara madden would play her double part of secretary to him and companion to her she had been secretary to other men before all through the war she had been secretary to somebody but she had never had to be companion to their wives perhaps it was a good thing that fanny as she kept on reminding her had secured her first she was glad he wasn't there when she arrived and wouldn't be till the day after to-morrow he had wired that morning to tell them so that for two days more she would have fanny to herself two well what do you think of him fanny had come back into the room she was hovering behind her i i think he's jolly good-looking well you see that was painted seventeen years ago he was young then has he changed much since dear me no said fanny he hasn't changed at all no more have you i think oh me in seventeen years she was still absurdly like her portrait after seventeen years with her light slender body poised for one of her flights 
her quick movements of butterfly and bird with her small white face the terrier nose lifted on the moth-winged shadows of her nostrils her dark blue eyes that gazed at you close under the low black eyebrows her brown hair that sprang in two sickles from the peak on her forehead raking up to the backward curve of the chignon a profile of cyclamen and her mouth the fine lips drawn finer by her enchanting smile all these features set in such strange sensitive unity that her mouth looked at you and her eyes said things no matter how long she lived she would always be young oh my dear child she said you are so like your mother am i were you afraid i wouldn't be a little just a little afraid i thought you'd be modern so i am so was mother not when i knew her afterwards then a sudden thought came to barbara mrs waddington if mother was your dearest friend why haven't you known me all this time your mother and i lost sight of each other before you were born mother didn't want to nor i mother would have hated you to think she did i never thought it she must have known i didn't then why did we lose sight yes why people don't if they can help it if they care enough and mother cared you're a persistent little thing aren't you are you trying to make out that i didn't care i'm trying to make you see that mother did well my dear we both cared but we couldn't help it we married and our husbands didn't hit it off didn't they and daddy was so nice didn't you know how nice he was oh yes i knew my husband was nice too barbara though you mightn't think it oh but i do i'm sure he is only i haven't seen him yet so nice but said fanny pursuing her own thought he never made a joke in his life and your father never made anything else daddy didn't make jokes they came to him i've seen them come he never sent any of them away no matter how naughty they were or how expensive i used to adore his jokes but horatio didn't he didn't like my adoring them so you see i see i wonder said barbara looking up at the portrait again what's he thinking about i used to wonder but you know now yes i know now fanny said what'll happen said barbara if i make jokes nothing he'll never see them if he saw daddy's oh but he didn't that was me barbara was thoughtful i dare say she said you won't keep me long supposing i can't do the work the work fanny's eyes were interrogative and a little surprised as though they were saying who said work what work well mr waddington's work i've got to help him with his book haven't i oh his book yes when he's writing it he isn't always does he look said fanny like a man who'd always be writing a book no i can't say he does exactly hm. what did he look like well then it'll be all right i mean we shall be i only wondered whether i could really do what he wants if ralph could said fanny you can who's ralph ralph is my cousin he was horatio's secretary was barbara considered it did he make jokes then lots but that wasn't why he left it was an awful pity too because he's most dreadfully hard up if he's hard up barbara said i couldn't bear to think i've done him out of a job you haven't he had to go fanny turned again to her flowers and barbara to her stores list are you sure fanny said suddenly you put striped striped the pajamas no i haven't then for goodness sake put it in suppose they sent those awful futurist things why he'd frighten me into fits can't you see horatio stalking in out of his dressing-room all magenta blobs and forked lightning i haven't seen him at all yet said barbara well you wait does my humming annoy you not a bit i like it it's such a happy sound i always do it said fanny when i'm happy you could hear feet feet in heavy-soled boots clanking on the drive that ringed the grass plot and the sundial the eager feet of a young man fanny turned her head listening there is ralph she said come in ralph the young man stood in the low narrow doorway filling it with his slender height and breadth he looked past fanny warily into the far corner of the room and when his eyes found barbara at her bureau they smiled oh come in fanny said he isn't here he won't be till friday this is ralph bevan barbara and this is barbara madden ralph 
he bowed still smiling as if he saw something irrepressibly amusing in her presence there yes said fanny to the smile your successor i congratulate you miss madden don't be an ironical beast she's just said she couldn't bear to think she'd done you out of your job well i couldn't said barbara well that's very nice of you but you didn't do me out of anything it was the act of god it was horatio's act not that miss madden meant any reflection on his justice and his mercy i don't know about his justice ralph said but he was absolutely merciful when he fired me out is it so awfully hard then said barbara you may not find it so oh but i'm going to be mrs waddington's companion too you'll be all right then they wouldn't let me be that he means you'll be safe dear you won't be fired out whatever happens whatever sort of secretary i am yes she can be any sort she likes in reason can't she well she can't be a worse one than i was anyhow barbara was aware that he had looked at her a long look half thoughtful half amused as if he were going to say something different something that would give her a curious light on herself and had thought better of it fanny waddington was protesting my dear boy it wasn't for incompetence she's simply dying to know what you did do you can tell her he wanted to write horatio's book for him and horatio wouldn't let him that was all oh well i shan't want to write it barbara said we thought perhaps you wouldn't said fanny but barbara had turned to her bureau affecting a discreet absorption in her list and presently ralph bevan went out into the garden with fanny to gather more tulips end of chapter one recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter two part one she had been dying to know what he had done but now after ralph had stayed to lunch and tea and dinner that first day after he had spent all yesterday at the manor and after he had turned up to-day at ten o'clock in the morning barbara thought she had made out the history though they had been very discreet and fanny had insisted on reading tono bungay out loud half the time ralph of course was in love with his cousin fanny to be sure she must be at least ten years older than he was but that wouldn't matter and of course it was rather naughty of him but then again very likely he couldn't help it it had just come on him when he wasn't thinking and who could help being in love with fanny you could be in love with people quite innocently and hopelessly there was no sin where there wasn't any hope and perhaps fanny was innocently ever so innocently in love with him or if she wasn't horatio thought she was which came to much the same thing so that anyhow poor ralph had to go the explanation they had given barbara thought was rather thin not quite worthy of their admirable intelligence it was friday barbara's fifth day she was walking home with ralph bevan through the waddington's park down the main drive that led from wick on the hill to lower wick manor it wouldn't be surprising she thought if fanny were in love with her cousin he was as she put it to herself so distinctly fallible in love with she could see fanny surrendering first to his sudden laughter his quick delighted mind his innocent engaging frankness he would she thought be endlessly amusing endlessly interesting because he was so interested so amused there was something that pleased her in the way he walked hatless his head thrown back his shoulders squared his hands thrust into his coat pockets safe from gesture something in the way he spun round in his path to face her with his laughter he had fanny's terrier nose with a ghost of a kink in it his dark hair grew back in a sickle on each temple it wouldn't lie level and smooth like other people's but sprang up curled from the clipping his eyes were his own dappled eyes green and grey black and brown sparkling so was his mouth which was neither too thin nor too thick determination in the thrusting curve of that lower lip and his chin which was just a shade too big for it a shade too big for his face his cheeks were sunburnt and a little shower of ochreish freckles spread from the sunburn and peppered the slopes of his nose she wanted to sketch him doesn't mrs waddington ever go for walks she said 
fanny no she's too lazy lazy well too active if you like in other ways how long have you known her just five days five days yes but you see years ago she was my mother's dearest friend that's how i came to be their secretary when she saw my name in the advertisement she thought it must be me and it was me they hadn't seen each other for years and years my father and mr waddington didn't hit it off together i believe you haven't seen him yet no there seems to be some mystery about him mystery yes what is it or mayn't you tell i won't tell it wouldn't be kind then don't don't i didn't know it was that sort of thing ralph laughed it isn't i meant it wouldn't be kind to you i don't want to spoil him for you then there is tell me one thing shall i get on with him all right oh, don't ask me that i mean will he be awfully difficult to work with because he sacked me no only you mustn't let on that you know better than he does and if you want to keep your job you mustn't contradict him well, now you've made me want to contradict him whatever he says i shall have to say the other thing whether i agree with him or not don't you think you could temporize a bit for her sake did you temporize oh rather i was as meek and servile as i knew how as you knew how do you think i shall know better yes you're a woman you can get on the right side of him will you try to because of fanny i'm most awfully glad she's got you and i want you to stay between you and me she has a very thin time with waddington there it is i know i know i know i'm going to hate him oh no you're not you can't hate waddington you don't oh lord no i wouldn't mind him a bit poor old thing if he wasn't fanny's husband he had almost as good as owned it almost put her in possession of their secret she conceived it his secret fanny's secret as all innocence on her part all chivalry on his tender and hopeless and pure part two they had come to the white gate that led between the shrubberies and the grass plot with the yellow grey stone house behind it it was nice she thought of fanny to make mr bevan take her for these long walks when she couldn't go with them but barbara felt all the time that she ought to apologize to the young man for not being fanny especially when mr waddington was coming back to-day by the three forty train and this afternoon would be their last for goodness knew how long and as they talked about ralph's life before the war and the jobs he had lost because of it he had been a journalist and about barbara's job at the war office and air raids and the games they both went in for and their favourite authors and the room he had in the white hart inn at wick as they talked fluently with the ease of old acquaintances almost of old friends barbara admired the beauty of mr bevan's manners you would have supposed that instead of suffering as he must be suffering agonies of impatience and irritation he had never enjoyed anything in his life so much as this adventure that was just coming to an end he had opened the gate for her and now stood with his back to it holding out his hand saying good-bye aren't you coming in she said mrs waddington expects you for tea no he said she doesn't she knows i can't come if he's there he paused by the way that book of his it's in an appalling muddle i hadn't time to do much to it before i left if you can't get it straight you must come to me and i'll help you well that's very good of you rather not it was my job you know he was backing through the gate saluting as he went and now he had turned and was running with raking athletic paces up the grass border of the park end of chapter two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter three part one tea is in the library miss this announcement together with partridge's extraordinary increase of importance would have told her that the master had returned even if she had not seen through the half-open door of the cloak-room mr waddington's overcoat hanging by its shoulders and surmounted by his grey slouch hat with a rapid furtive movement the butler closed the door on these sanctities and she noted the subdued quiet of his footsteps as he led the way down the dark oak-panelled corridor through the smoke-room and into the library beyond 
she also caught a surprising sight of her own face in the glass over the smoke-room chimney-piece her dark eyes shining the cool wind-beaten flush on her young cheeks the curled mouth flowering geranium red on rose white this barbara of the looking-glass smiled at her in passing with such gay irresponsible amusement that it fairly took her breath away its origin became clear to her as ralph bevan's words shot into her mind i don't want to spoil him for you she foresaw a possible intimacy in which horatio bysshe waddington would become the unique though unofficial tie between them she was aware that it pleased her to share a secret jest with ralph bevan she found fanny established behind her tea-table in the low room dim with its oak panelling above the long lines of the bookcases where fanny's fluttering smile made movement and a sort of light her husband sat facing her in his brown leather chair and in the pose the wonderful pose of his portrait only the sobriety of his navy blue serge had fined it down giving him a factitious slenderness he hadn't seen her come in he sat there in innocence and unawareness and afterwards it gave her a little pang of remorse remembering how innocent he had then seemed to her and unaware this is my husband barbara horatio you haven't met miss madden his eyes bulged with the startled innocence of a creature taken unaware he had just lifted his face with its dripping moustache from his teacup and though he carried off this awkwardness with an unabashed sweep of his pocket handkerchief you could see that he was sensitive he hated you to catch him in any gesture that was less than noble all his gestures were noble and his attitudes he was noble as he got up slowly unfolding his great height tightening by a movement of his shoulders his great breadth he looked down at her superbly and held out his hand it closed on hers in a large genial clasp so this is my secretary is it yes and don't forget she's my companion as well as your secretary i never forget anything that you wish me to remember only he said neva and remember he bowed as he said it in a very courtly way barbara noticed that his black hair and moustache were lightly grizzled there was loose flesh about his eyelids his chin had doubled and his cheeks were sagging from the bone otherwise he was exactly like his portrait these changes made him look if anything more incorruptibly dignified and more solemn he had remained on his feet for his breeding was perfect moving between the tea-table and barbara bringing her tea milk and sugar and things to eat altogether he was so simple so genial and unmysterious that barbara could only suppose that ralph had been making fun of her of her wonder her curiosity my dear what a colour you've got fanny put up her hands to her own cheeks to draw attention to barbara's you are growing a country girl aren't you you should have seen her white face when she came horatio what has she been doing to herself he had settled again into his chair and his attitude she's been out walking with ralph with ralph is he here still why shouldn't he be mr waddington shrugged his immense shoulders it's a question of taste if he likes to hang about the place after his behaviour poor boy whatever has he done behaviour makes it sound as if it had been something awful we needn't go into it i think but you are going into it darling all the same do you mean to keep it up against him forever oh, i'm not keeping anything up what ralph bevan does is no concern of mine since i'm not to be inconvenienced by it since miss madden has come to my rescue so charmingly i shall not give it another thought he turned to barbara as to a change of subject had you any difficulty his voice was measured and important in finding your way here none at all ah that one thirty train is excellent excellent but if you had not told the guard to stop at wick on the hill you would have been carried on to cheltenham which would have been very awkward for you very awkward indeed my dear horatio what did you suppose she would do my dear fanny there are many things she might have done she might have got into the wrong coach at paddington and been carried on to worcester and that said barbara would have been much worse than cheltenham the very thought of it said fanny makes me shudder but thank god barbara you didn't do any of those things mr waddington shifted the crossing of his legs as a big dog shifts his paws when you laugh at him the more fanny laughed the more dignified and solemn he became you haven't told me yet horatio what you did in london i was just going to tell you when miss madden so delightfully came in 
at that barbara thought it discreet to dismiss herself but fanny called her back what are you running away for he didn't do anything in london he wouldn't like you to hear about on the contrary i particularly wish miss madden to hear about it i am starting a branch of the national league of liberty in wick you may have heard of it yes i've heard of it i've even seen the prospectus good well fanny i lunched yesterday with sir maurice gedge and he's as keen as mustard he agrees with me that the league will be no good no good at all until it's taken up strong in the provinces he wants me to start at once just as soon as i can get my committee my dear if you've got to have a committee first you'll never start it depends altogether on who i get and it'll be my committee mr maurice was very emphatic about that he agrees with me that if you want a thing done and done well you must do it yourself there can only be one moving spirit the committee will have nothing to do but carry out my ideas well then be sure you get a committee that hasn't many of its own that will not be difficult said mr waddington in wick the first thing is the prospectus that's where you come in miss madden you mean the first thing is that barbara draws up the prospectus under my supervision the next thing fanny said is to conceal your prospectus from your committee till it's in print you come to your committee with your prospectus you don't offer it for discussion supposing barbara said they insist on discussing it they won't said fanny once it's printed especially if it's paid for you must get pyecraft to send in his bill at once and if they do start discussing you can put them off with the date and place of the meeting and the wording of the posters that'll give them something to talk about i suppose you'll be chairman well i think in the circumstances they could hardly appoint anybody else i don't know somebody might suggest sir john corbett mr waddington's face sagged with dismay as fanny presented this unpleasant possibility i don't think sir john would care about it i shall suggest it to him myself but i don't think after all sir john corbett was a lazy man when you've roused sir john if you ever do rouse him then you'll have to round up all the towns and villages for twenty miles it's a pity you can't have ralph he would have rounded them for you in no time on his motor-bike i am quite capable of rounding them all up myself thank you well dear said fanny placably it'll keep you busy for the next six months and that'll be nice you won't miss the war then so much will you miss the war yes you do miss it darling he was a special constable barbara and he sat on tribunals and he drove his motor-car like mad on government service he had no end of a time it's no use your saying you didn't enjoy it horatio for you did i was glad to be of service to my country as much as any soldier but to say that i enjoyed the war if there hadn't been a war there wouldn't have been any service to be glad about my dear fanny it's a perfectly horrible suggestion do you mean to say that i would have brought about that 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 infamous tragedy that i would have sent thousands and thousands of our lads to their deaths to get a job for myself if i thought for one moment that you were serious well you don't like me to be anything else dear i certainly don't like you to joke about such subjects oh come said fanny we all enjoyed our war jobs except poor ralph who got gassed first thing and then concussed with a shell burst oh did he said barbara he did and don't you think horatio considering the rotten time he's had and that he lost a lucrative job through the war and that you've done him out of his secretaryship don't you think you might forgive him of course said horatio i forgive him he had got up to go and had reached the door when fanny called him back and i can write and ask him to come and dine to-morrow night can i i want to be quite sure that he does dine i have never said or implied said horatio that he was not to come and dine with that he left them the beautiful thing about horatio said fanny is that he never bears a grudge against people no matter what he's done to them i've no doubt that ralph was excessively provoking and put him in the wrong and yet though he was in the wrong and knows he was in it he doesn't resent it he doesn't resent it the least little bit part two barbara wondered how and where she would be expected to spend her evenings now that fanny's husband had come home being secretary to mr waddington and companion to fanny wouldn't mean being companion to both of them at once so when horatio appeared in the drawing-room after coffee she asked if she might sit in the morning-room and write letters do you want to sit in the morning-room said fanny well i ought to write those letters 
there's a fire in the library you can write there can't she horatio mr waddington looked up with the benign expression he had had when he came on barbara alone in the drawing-room before dinner a look so directed to her neck and shoulders that it told her how well her low-cut evening frock became her she shall sit anywhere she likes the library is hers whenever she wants to see it barbara thought she would rather like the library as she went on she couldn't help seeing a look on fanny's face that pleaded that would have kept her with her she thought she doesn't want to be alone with him she judged it better to ignore that look she had been about an hour in the library she had written her letters and chosen a book and curled herself up in the big leather chair and was reading when mr waddington came in he took no notice of her at first but established himself at the writing-table with his back to her he would of course want her to go she uncurled herself and went quietly to the door mr waddington looked up you needn't go he said something in his face made her wonder whether she ought to stay she remembered that she was mrs waddington's companion mrs waddington may want me mrs waddington has gone to bed don't go unless you're tired i'm getting my thoughts on paper and i may want you she remembered that she was mr waddington's secretary she went back to her chair it was only his face that had made her wonder his great back bent to his task was like another person there absorbed and unmoved it chaperoned them from time to time she heard brief scratches of his pen as he got a thought down it was ten o'clock when the half-hour struck mr waddington gave a thick ha of irritation and got up it's no use he said i'm not in form to-night i suppose it's the journey he came to the fireplace and sat down heavily in the opposite chair barbara was aware of his eyes considering appraising her my wife tells me she has had a delightful time with you i've had a delightful time with her i'm glad my wife is a very delightful woman but you know you mustn't take everything she says too seriously i won't i'm not a very serious person myself don't say that don't say that very well i think if you don't want me i'll say good night seriously seriously he had risen as she rose and went to open the door for her he escorted her through the smoke-room and stood there at the further door holding out his hand benignant and superbly solemn good night then he said she told herself that she was wrong quite wrong about his poor old face there was nothing in it nothing but that grave and unadventurous benignity his mood had been she judged purely paternal paternal and childlike too pathetic if you came to think of it in his clinging to her presence her companionship it must have been my little evil mind she thought part three as she went along the corridor she remembered she had left her knitting in the drawing-room she turned to fetch it and found fanny still there wide awake with her feet on the fender and reading tono bungay oh mrs waddington i thought you'd gone to bed so did i dear but i changed my mind when i found myself alone with wells he's too heavenly for words barbara saw it in a flash then she knew what she the companion and secretary was there for she was there to keep him off her so that fanny might have more time to find herself alone in she saw it all tono bungay she said was that what you sent me out with mr bevan for it was how clever of you barbara End of chapter 3. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 4, Sections 1 and 2 of Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 4, Section 1 mr waddington closed the door on miss madden slowly and gently so that the action should not strike her as dismissive he then turned on the lights by the chimney-piece and stood there looking at himself in the glass he wanted to know exactly how his face had presented itself to miss madden it would not be altogether as it appeared to himself for the glass unlike the young girl's clear eyes was an exaggerating and distorting medium he had noticed that his wife's face in the smoke-room glass looked a good ten years older than the face he knew he calculated therefore that this faint greenish tint this slightly lopsided elderly grimace 
were not truthful renderings of his complexion and his smile and as in spite of these defects which you could put down to the account of the glass the face mr waddington saw was still the face of a handsome man he formed a very favourable opinion of the face miss madden had seen handsome and if not in his first youth then still in his second experience is itself a fascination and if a man has any charm at all his second youth should be more charming more irresistibly fascinating than his first and the child had been conscious of him she had betrayed uneasiness a sense of danger when she had found herself alone with him he recalled her first tentative flight her hesitation he would have liked to have kept her there with him a little longer to have talked to her about his league to have tested by a few shrewd questions her ability better not better not the child was wise and right her wisdom and rectitude were delicious to mr waddington still more so was the thought that she had felt him to be dangerous he went back into his library and sat again in his chair and meditated this experiment of fanny's now he wondered how it would turn out especially if fanny really wanted to adopt the girl frank madden's daughter that impudent social comedian had been so offensive to mr waddington in his lifetime that there was something alluring in the idea of keeping his daughter now that he was dead seeing the exquisite little thing dependent on him for everything for food and frocks and pocket money but no doubt they had been wise in giving her the secretaryship before committing themselves to the irrecoverable step thus testing her in a relation that could be easily terminated if by any chance it proved embarrassing but the relation in itself was as mr waddington put it to himself a little difficult and delicate it involved an intimacy a closer intimacy than adoption having her there in his library at all hours to work with him and always that little uneasy consciousness of hers well well he had set the tone to-night for all their future intercourse he had in the most delicate way possible let her see it seemed to him looking back on it that he had exercised a perfect tact parting from her with that air of gaiety and light badinage which his own instinct of self-preservation so happily suggested yet he smiled when he recalled her look as she went from him backing backing to the door it made him feel very tender and chivalrous virtuous too as if somehow he had overcome some unforeseen and ruinous impulse and all the time he hadn't had any impulse beyond the craving to talk to an intelligent and attractive stranger to talk about his league mr waddington went to bed thinking about it he even woke his wife up out of her sleep with the request that she would remind him to call at underwood's first thing in the morning section two as soon as he was awake he thought of underwood's underwood's was important he had to round up the county and he couldn't do that without first consulting sir john corbett of underwood's as a matter of form a mere matter of form of course he would have to consult him but the more he thought about it the less he liked the idea of consulting anybody he was desperately afraid that if he once began letting people into it his scheme his league would be taken away from him and that the proper thing the graceful thing the thing to which he would be impelled by all his instincts and traditions would be to stand modestly back and see it go probably into sir john corbett's hands and he couldn't he couldn't yet it was clear that the league just because it was a league must have members even if he had been prepared to contribute all the funds himself and carry on the whole business of it single-handed it couldn't consist solely of mr waddington of wick his problem was a subtle and difficult one how to identify himself with the league himself alone in a unique and indissoluble manner and yet draw to it the necessary supporters how to control every detail of its intricate working there would be endless wheels within wheels and at the same time give proper powers to the inevitable committee if he did not put it quite so crudely as fanny in her disagreeable irony his problem resolved itself into this how to divide the work and yet rake in all the credit he was saved from its immediate pressure by the sight of the envelope that waited for him on the breakfast table addressed in a familiar hand mrs levitt his emotion betrayed itself to barbara in a peculiar furtive yet triumphant smile again said fanny there was no end to the woman in her letters 
mrs levitt requested mr waddington to call on her that morning at eleven there was a matter on which she desired to consult him the brevity of the note revealed her trust in his compliance trust that implied again a certain intimacy mr waddington read it out loud to show how harmless and open was his communion with mrs levitt is there any matter on which she has not consulted you there seems to have been one and as you see she is repairing the omission a light air a light air to carry off mrs levitt the light air that had carried off barbara that had made barbara carry herself off the night before it had done good this morning the young girl was all ease and innocent unconsciousness again and i suppose you're going fanny said i suppose i shall have to go then i shall have barbara to myself all morning you will have barbara to yourself all day he tried thus jocosely to convey for barbara's good his indifference to having her all the same it gave him pleasure to say her name like that barbara he was not sure that he wanted to go and see mrs levitt with all this business of the league on hand it meant putting off sir john you couldn't do sir john and mrs levitt in one morning besides he thought he knew what mrs levitt wanted and he said to himself that this time he would be obliged for once to refuse her but it was not in him to refuse to go and see her so he went as he walked up the park drive to the town he recalled with distinctly pleasurable emotion the first time he had encountered mrs levitt the vision of the smart little lady who had stood there by the inner gate the gate that led from the park into the grounds waiting for his approach with happy confidence he remembered her smile an affair of milk-white teeth and an ivory white face and her frank attack forgive me if i'm trespassing they told me there was a right of way he remembered her charming diffidence the naive reverence for his grounds which had compelled him to escort her personally through them her attitudes of admiration as the manor burst on her from its bay in the beech trees the interest she had shown in its date and architecture and how spinning out the agreeable interview he had gone with her all the way to the farther gate that led into lower wick village and how she had challenged him there with her you must be mr waddington of wick and capped his admission with i'm mrs levitt to which he had replied that he was delighted and the time after that partridge had discreetly shown her into the library when she had called to implore him to obtain exemption for her son toby her black eyes bright and large behind tears and her cry i'm a war widow mr waddington and he's my only child the flattery of her belief that he mr waddington of wick had the chief power on the tribunal and indeed it would have been folly to pretend that he had not power that he could not work it if he chose and the third time after he had worked it and she had come to thank him tears again the pressure of a plump ivory white hand a tingling delicious memory after that his untiring efforts to get a war job for toby there had been difficulties entailing many visits to mrs levitt in the little house in the market square of wick on the hill but in the end he had had the same intoxicating experience of his power all obstructions going down before mr waddington of wick and this year when toby was finally demobilized it was only natural that she should draw on mr waddington's influence again to get him a permanent peace job he had got it and that meant more visits and more gratitude till here he was attached to mrs levitt by the unbreakable tie of his benefactions he was even attached to her son toby whose continued existence to say nothing of his activity in mr bostock's bank at wick was a perpetual tribute to his power mr waddington had nothing like the same complacence in thinking of his own son horace but then horace's existence and his activity were not a tribute but a menace a standing danger not only to his power but to his fascination his sense of himself as a still young still brilliant and effective personality horace inherited his mother's deplorable lack of seriousness and it was in mrs levitt's society that mr waddington was most conscious of his youth his brilliance and effect with an agreeable sense of anticipation he climbed up the slopes of sheep street and park street and so into the square the house muffled in ivy hid discreetly in the far corner behind the two tall elms on the green mrs trinder the landlady had a sidelong bend of the head and a smile 
that acknowledged him as mr waddington of wick and mrs levitt's benefactor and as he waited in the low mullion darkened room he reminded himself that he had come to refuse her request if as he suspected it was the ballingers cottage that she wanted to be sure the ballingers had notice to quit in june but he couldn't very well turn the ballingers out if they wanted to stay when there wasn't a decent house in the place to turn them into he would have to make this very clear to mrs levitt not that he approved of ballinger this fellow one of his best farmhands had behaved infamously first of all demanding preposterous wages and then just because mr waddington had refused to be browbeaten leaving his service for colonel granger's colonel granger had behaved infamously buying foss bank with the money he had made in high explosives and then letting fly his confounded socialism all over the county knowing nothing mind you about local conditions and actually raising the rate of wages without consulting anybody and upsetting the farm labourers for miles round at a time when the prosperity of the entire country depended on the farmers still mr waddington was not the man to take a petty revenge on his inferiors he didn't blame ballinger he blamed colonel granger he would like to see granger boycotted by the whole county the door opened he strode forward and found himself holding out a sudden fervid hand to a lady who was not mrs levitt he drew up turning his gesture into a bow rather unnecessarily ceremonious but he could not annihilate instantaneously all that fervour i am mrs levitt's sister mrs rickards mr waddington is it not i'll tell elise you're here i know she'll be glad to see you she has been very much upset she remained standing before him long enough for him to be aware of a projecting bust of white serge of smartness of purplish copper hair a raking panama's white brim of eyebrows a rouge smile and a smell of orris root before he could grasp his connection with mrs levitt this amazing figure had disappeared and given place to a tapping of heels and a furtive scuffling laugh on the stairs outside a shriller laugh that must be mrs rickards a long shh then the bang of the front door covering the lady's retreat and mrs levitt came in stifling merriment under a minute pocket handkerchief he took it in then they were sisters mrs rickards and elise levitt elise if you cared to be critical had the same defects short legs loose hips the same exaggerations the toppling breasts underpinned by the shafts of her stays not mr waddington's taste and yet and yet elise had contrived a charming and handsome effect out of black eyes and the milk-white teeth and the ivory-white face the play of the black eyebrows distracted you from the equine bend of the nose that sprang between them the movements of her mouth the white flash of its smile made you forget its thinness and hardness and the slight heaviness of its jaw something foreign about her something french piquant and then her clothes mrs levitt wore a coat and skirt her sister's white serge with a distinction a greyish stripe or something clean straightness that stiffened and fined down her exuberance one jewel one bit of gold and she might have been vulgar but no he thought she knows what becomes her immaculate purity of white gloves white shoes white panama and the black points of the ribbon of her eyebrows her eyes and hair after all the sort of woman mr waddington liked to be seen out walking with she made him feel slender my dear mr waddington how good of you my dear mrs levitt always delighted when it's possible to do anything as she covered him with her brilliant eyes he tightened his shoulders and stood firm while his spirit braced itself against persuasion if it was the ballinger's cottage i really am ashamed of myself i never seem to send for you unless i'm in trouble isn't that the time his voice thickened so long as you do send he thought it isn't the ballinger's cottage then it's your own fault you've always been so good so kind to my poor toby nothing to do with toby i hope the trouble oh no no and yet in a way it has i'm afraid mr waddington i may have to leave to leave leave wick leave dear wick not seriously he wasn't prepared for that the idea hit him hard in a place that he hadn't thought was tender quite seriously dear me this is very distressing very distressing indeed 
but you would not take such a step without consulting your friends i am consulting you yes yes but have you thought it well over thinking isn't any use i shall have to unless something can be done he thought financial difficulties debts an expensive lady unless something could be done he didn't know that he was exactly prepared to do it but his tongue answered in spite of him something must be done we can't let you go like this my dear lady that's it i don't see how i can go with dear toby here nor yet how i'm to stay won't you tell me what the trouble is the trouble is that mrs trinder's son's just been demobilized and she wants our rooms for his wife and family come surely we can find other rooms all the best ones are taken there's nothing left that i'd care to live in besides it isn't rooms i want mr waddington it's a house it was of course the ballinger's cottage but she couldn't have it she couldn't have it i wouldn't mind how small it was if only i had a little home of my own you don't know mr waddington what it is to be without a home of your own i haven't had a home for years five years not since the war i'm afraid said mr waddington at present there isn't a house for you in wick he brooded earnestly as though he were trying to conjure up to create out of nothing a house for her and a home no but i understand that the ballingers will be leaving in june you said that at any time if you had a house i should have it i said a house mrs levitt not a cottage it's all the same to me the ballingers cottage could be made into an adorable little house it could with a few hundred pounds spent on it well you'd be improving your property wouldn't you and you'd get it back in the higher rent i'm not thinking about getting anything back and nothing would please me better only you see i can't very well turn ballinger out as long as he behaves himself i wouldn't have him turned out for the world but do you consider that ballinger has behaved himself well he played me a dirty trick perhaps when he went to granger but if granger can afford to pay for him i've no right to object to his being bought it isn't a reason for turning the man out i don't see how he can expect you to refuse a good tenant for him i must if i haven't a good house to put him into he doesn't expect it mr waddington didn't you give him notice in december a mere matter of form he knows he can stay on if there's nowhere else for him to go to then why said mrs levitt does he go about saying that he dares you to let the cottage over his head does he does he say that he says he'll pay you out he'll summons you he was most abusive mr waddington's face positively swelled with a choleric flush that swamped his genial fatuity it seems somebody told him you were going to do up the cottage and let it for more rent i don't know who could have spread that story i assure you mr waddington it wasn't me my dear mrs levitt of course i won't say i wasn't thinking of it and that i wouldn't have done it if i could have got rid of ballinger he meditated i don't see why i shouldn't get rid of him if he dares me the scoundrel he's simply asking for it and he shall have it oh but i wouldn't for worlds have him turned into the street with his wife and babies my dear lady i shan't turn them into the street i shouldn't be allowed to there's a cottage at lower wick they can go into the one he had when he first came to me he wondered why he hadn't thought of it before it wasn't as it stood a decent cottage but if he was prepared to spend fifty pounds or so on it it could be made habitable and by george he was prepared if it was only to teach ballinger a lesson for it meant that ballinger would have to walk an extra mile uphill to his work every day serve him right the impudent rascal poor thing he won't said mrs levitt have his nice garden he won't ballinger must learn said mr waddington with magisterial severity that he can't have everything he certainly can't have it both ways abuse and threaten me and expect favours he may go to colonel granger if it really must happen said mrs levitt do you mean that i may have the house i shall be only too delighted to have such a charming tenant well i shan't threaten and abuse you and call you every nasty name under the sun and you won't you won't turn me out when my lease is up he bowed over the hand she held out to him you shall never be turned out as long as you want to stay by twelve o'clock they had arranged the details mr waddington was to put in a bathroom to throw the two rooms on the ground floor into one to build out a new sitting-room with a bedroom over it and to paint and distemper the place in cream white throughout 
and it was to be called the white house by the time they had finished with it ballinger's cottage had become the house mrs levitt had dreamed of all her life and not unlike the house mr waddington had dreamed of that minute while he planned the bathroom the little bijou house where an adorable but not too rigorously moral lady he stopped with a mental jerk ashamed he had no reason to suppose that elise was or would become such a lady and the poor innocent woman was saying just one thing mr waddington the rent no earthly reason we can talk about that another time i shan't be hard on you no he wouldn't be hard on her but in that other case there wouldn't have been any rent at all as he left the house he could see mrs rickards hurrying towards it across the square she waddles like a duck he thought the movement suggested a plebeian excitement and curiosity that displeased him he recalled her face her extraordinary face quite enough he thought to put all that into my head poor elise he liked to think of her it made him feel what he had felt last night over barbara madden virtuous as though he had struggled and got the better of an impetuous passion he was so touched by his own beautiful renunciation that when he found fanny working in the garden he felt a sudden tenderness for her as the cause of it she looked up at him from her pansy bed and laughed what are you looking so sentimental for old thing end of chapter four section two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter four sections three and four of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter four section three mrs levitt's affair settled he can now give his whole time to the serious business of the day he was exceedingly anxious to get it over nothing could be more disturbing than fanny's suggestion that the name of sir john corbett might carry more weight with his committee than his own the waddingtons of wick had ancestry waddingtons had held lower wick manor for ten generations whereas sir john corbett's father had bought underwoods and rebuilt it somewhere in the seventies on the other hand sir john was the largest and richest landowner in the place he could buy up wick on the hill to-morrow and thrive on the transaction he therefore represented the larger vested interests and as the whole object of the league was the safeguarding of vested interests in other words of liberty that british liberty which is bound up with law and order with private property in general and land ownership in particular as the principle of its very being was the preservation of precisely such an institution as sir john himself the committee of the wick branch of the league could hardly avoid inviting him to be its president there was no blinking the fact and fanny hadn't blinked it that sir john was the proper person most of fanny's suggestions had a strong but unpleasant element of common sense but the more interest he took in the league the more passionately he flung himself into the business of its creation the more abhorrent to mr waddington was the thought that the chief place in it the presidency would pass over his head to sir john his only hope was in sir john's well-known indolence and irresponsibility sir john was the exhausted reaction from the efforts of a self-made grandfather and of a father spendthrift in energy he had had everything done for him ever since he was a baby and consequently was now unable or unwilling to do anything for himself or other people you couldn't see him taking an active part in the management of the league and mr waddington couldn't see himself doing all the work and handing over all the glory to sir john still between mr waddington and the glory there was only this supine figure of sir john and sir john once out of the running he could count without immodesty on the unanimous vote of any committee he formed in wick it was possible that even a sir john corbett would not really carry it over a waddington of wick but mr waddington wasn't taking any risks what he had to do was to suggest the presidency to sir john in such a way that he would be certain to refuse it he had the good luck to find sir john alone in his library at tea-time eating hot buttered toast there was hope for mr waddington in sir john's attitude lying back and nursing his little round stomach 
hope in the hot buttery gleam of his cheeks in his wide mouth lazy under the jutting grey moustache and in the scrabbling of his little legs as he exerted himself to stand upright well waddington glad to see you he was in his chair again with another prodigious effort he leaned forward and rang for more tea and more toast did you walk said sir john his little round eyes expressed horror at the possibility no i just ran over in my car drove yourself no too much effort of attention i find it interferes with my thinking interferes with everything said sir john expect you drove enough during the war to last you for the rest of your life ah government service very different thing that reminds me i've come to-day to consult you on a matter of public business business he noted sir john's uneasy pout better have some tea first sir john took another piece of buttered toast if only sir john would go on eating nothing like buttered toast for sustaining that mood of voluptuous inertia when mr waddington judged the moment propitious he began while i was up in london i had the pleasure of lunching with sir maurice gedge he wants me to start a branch of the national league of liberty here liberty shouldn't have thought that was much in your line didn't expect to see you waving the red flag what why didn't you put him on to our friend granger my dear corbett what are you thinking of the object of the league is to put down all that sort of thing socialism bolshevism to rouse the whole country and get it to stand solid for order and good government hm is it queer sort of title for a thing of that sort league of liberty what mr waddington raised a clenched fist already in spirit he was on his platform exactly the title that's needed the people want liberty always have wanted it we'll let em have it true liberty british liberty i tell you corbett we're out against the tyranny of labour minorities you and i and every man that's got any standing and any influence we've got to see to it that we don't have a revolution in communism and a soviet government here come you don't think the bolshies are as strong as all that do you mr waddington brought his fist down on the arm of his chair i know they are he said and look here if they get the upper hand it's the great capitalists the great property holders the great landowners like you and me corbett who'll be the first to suffer why we're suffering as it is here in wick with just the little that fellow granger can do the time will come mark my words when we shan't be able to get a single labourer to work for us for a fair wage they'll bleed us white corbett before they've done with us if we don't make a stand and make it now that's what the league's for to set up a standard something we can point to and say these are the principles we stand for something you can rally the whole country round we shall want your support i shall be very glad anything i can do mr waddington was a little disturbed by this ready acquiescence well mind you it isn't going to end here in wick i shall start it in wick first then i shall take it straight to the big towns gloucester cheltenham sirenster nailsworth stroud we'll set em going till we've got a branch in every town and every village in the country he thought that ought to settle him he had created a vision of intolerable activity bless me said sir john you've got your work cut out for you of course i shall have to get a local committee first i can't take a step like that without consulting you sir john muttered something that sounded like very good of you i'm sure no more than my duty to the league now the point is sir maurice was anxious that i should be president of this local branch it needs somebody with energy and determination the president's work certainly will be cut out for him and i feel very strongly and i think that my committee will feel that you corbett are the proper person hmm. i didn't think i should be justified in going further without first obtaining your consent well mr waddington's anxiety was almost unbearable the programme had evidently appealed to sir john supposing after all he accepted i wouldn't ask you to undertake anything so so arduous but that it'll strengthen my hands with my committee in fact i may get a much stronger and more influential committee if i can come to them and tell them beforehand that you have consented to be president i don't mind being president said sir john if i haven't got to do anything oh, i'm afraid i'm afraid we couldn't allow you to be a mere figurehead but presidents always are figureheads aren't they 
there was a bantering gleam in sir john's eyes that irritated mr waddington that was the worst of corbett you couldn't get him to take a serious thing seriously at any rate sir john went on there's always some secretary johnny who runs round and does the work so that was corbett's idea to sit in his armchair and bag all the prestige while he waddington of wick ran round and did the work not in this case in these small local affairs you can't delegate business everything depends on the personal activity of the president the deuce it does how do you mean i mean this if sir john corbett asks for a subscription he gets it we've got to round up the whole county and all the townspeople and villagers it's no use shooting pamphlets at em from a motor-car they like being personally interviewed if sir john corbett comes and talks to them and tells them they must join ten to one they will join and there isn't any time to be lost if we want to get in first before other places take it up it'll mean pretty sharp work day in and day out rounding them all up oh lord waddington don't i'm tired already with the bare idea of it oh come we can't have you tired corbett why it won't be worse it won't be half as bad as a season's hunting you're just the man for it fit as fit well not half as fit as i look waddington there's another thing the meetings if the posters say sir john corbett will address the meeting people will come if sir john corbett speaks they'll listen my dear fellow that settles it i can't speak for nuts you know i can't i can introduce a speaker and move a vote of thanks and that's about all i can do it's your show not mine you ought to be president waddington you'll enjoy it and i shan't i don't know at all about enjoying it it'll be infernally hard work precisely you don't mean corbett that you won't come in with us that you won't come on the committee well i'll come on all right if i haven't got to speak and if i haven't got to do anything i shan't be much good but i could at least propose you as president you couldn't very well propose yourself it's very good of you mr waddington made his voice sound casual and indifferent so that he might appear to be entertaining the suggestion provisionally and under protest there'll have to be one big meeting before the committee's formed or anything if i let you off the presidency he said playfully will you take the chair for that one evening that one evening only you'll do all the talking i shall have to all right my dear fellow i dare say i can get my wife to come on your committee too that'll help you to rope in the townspeople and now supposing we drop it and have a quiet smoke he roused himself to one more effort of course we'll send you a subscription both of us mr waddington drove off from underwoods in a state of pleasurable elation he had got what he wanted without appearing without appearing at all to be playing for it corbett had never spotted him there he was wrong at that very moment sir john was relating the incident to lady corbett and you could see all the time the fellow wanted it himself he said i put him in an awful funk pretending i was going to take it all the same he admitted very handsomely that the idea of the league was topping and that waddington was the man for it and the subscription that he and lady corbett sent was very handsome too unfortunately it obliged mr waddington to contribute a slightly larger sum by way of maintaining his ascendancy section four on his way home he called at the old dower house in the square to see his mother he had arranged to meet fanny and barbara madden there and drive them home the old lady was sitting in her chair handsome with dark eyes still brilliant in her white roman face a small imperious face yet soft soft in its network of fine grooves and pittings an exquisite old lady in a black satin gown and white embroidered shawl with a white chantilly scarf binding rolled masses of white hair she had been a miss postlethwaite of medlicott my dear boy so you've got back she turned to her son with a soft moan of joy lifting up her hands to hold his face as he stooped to kiss her how well you look she said is that london or coming back to fanny it's coming back to you ah she hasn't spoilt you you know how to say nice things to your old mother she looked up at him at his solemn face that simmered with excited egoism barbara could see that he was playing playing in his ponderous fatuous way at being her young her not more than twenty-five years old son 
he turned with a sudden sportive caracoling movement to find a chair for himself he was sitting on it now close beside his mother and she was holding one of his big fleshy hands in her fragile bird claws and patting it from her study of the ancestral portraits in the manor dining-room barbara gathered that he owed to his mother the handsome roman structure that held up his face after all so proudly through its layers of waddington flesh he had the postlethwaite nose the old lady looked at her gratified by the grave attention of her eyes miss madden can't believe that a little woman like me could have such a great big son she said but you see he isn't big to me he'll never be any older than thirteen you could see it if he wasn't really thirteen to her he wasn't a day older than twenty-five he was her young grown-up son whose caresses flattered her she spoils me miss madden you could see that it pleased him to sit close to her knees to have his hand patted and be spoilt nonsense now tell me what happened at underwood's is it to be john corbett or you corbett says it's to be me well, i'm glad he's had that much sense well and now tell me all about this league of yours he told her all about it and she sat very quietly listening nodding her proud old head in approval he talked about it till it was time to go then the old lady became agitated my dear boy you mustn't let kimber drive you too fast down that hill fanny will you tell kimber to be careful her face trembled with anxiety as she held it to him to be kissed at that moment he was her child escaping from her going out rashly into the dangerous world i like going to see granny said fanny as kimber tucked them up together in the car she makes me feel young you may very well feel it said mr waddington it's only my mother's white hair miss madden that makes her look old i thought said barbara she looked ever so much younger she was going to say than she is than most people's mothers you will have noticed fanny said that my husband is younger than most people barbara noticed that he had drawn himself up with an offended air unnaturally straight he didn't like it this discussion about ages they were running out of the square when fanny remembered and cried out oh stop him horatio we must go back and see if ralph's coming to dinner but at the white hart they were told that mr bevan had gone to oxford on his motor-bike and was not expected to return before ten o'clock sorry barbara i don't see why you should apologize to miss madden my dear i've no doubt she can get on very well without him she may want something rather more exciting than you and me sometimes i'm quite happy barbara said of course you're happy it isn't everybody who enjoys ralph bevan's society i dare say you're like me you find him a great hindrance to serious conversation that's why i enjoy him fanny said we'll ask him for tomorrow night barbara tucked her chin into the collar of her coat the car was running down sheep street into lower wick she stared out abstractedly at the eastern valley the delicate green cornfields and pink fallows the muffling of dim trees all washed in the pale eastern blue rolling out and up to the blue ridge it made her happy to look at it it made her happy to think of ralph bevan coming to-morrow if it had been to-night it would have been all over in three hours and something she was not sure what but felt that it might be mr waddington something would have cut in to spoil the happiness of it but now she had it to think about and her thoughts were safe what are you thinking about barbara the view said barbara i want to sketch it end of chapter four recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter five part one mr waddington was in his library drawing up his prospectus while fanny and barbara madden looked on at fanny's suggestion he owned magnanimously that it was a good one he had decided to sail in as she called it with a prospectus first not only before he formed his committee but before he held his big meeting they had fixed the date of it for that day month saturday june the twenty first you come before them from the beginning she said with something fixed and definite that they can't go back on and by signing the prospectus horatio bish waddington he identified it beyond all contention with himself 
it was at this point that barbara had blundered why she had said should we go to all that bother and expense why can't we send out the original prospectus my dear barbara the original prospectus isn't any good why isn't it because it isn't horatio's prospectus barbara looked down and away from the dangerous light in fanny's eyes but it expresses his views doesn't it that's no good when he wants to express them himself and so far from being any good the original prospectus was a positive hindrance to mr waddington it took all the wind out of his sails it took as he justly complained the very words out of his mouth and the ideas out of his head it got in his way and upset him at every turn somehow or other he had got to stamp his personality upon this thing it's no good he said if they can't recognize it as a personal appeal from me and here it was stamped all over and indelibly with the personalities of sir maurice gedge and his london committee and he couldn't depart radically from the lines they had laid down there were just so many things to be said and sir maurice and his committee had contrived to say them all but though the matter was given him mr waddington before he actually tackled his prospectus had conceived himself as supplying his own fresh and inimitable manner the happy touch the sudden arresting turn but somehow it wasn't working out that way try as he would he couldn't get away from the turns and touches supplied by sir maurice gedge it would have been easy enough he said to draw up the original prospectus i'd a thousand times rather do that than write one on the top of it fanny agreed it's got to look different she said without being different couldn't we said barbara turn it upside down upside down he stared at her with great owl's eyes offended suspecting her this time of an outrageous levity yes really upside down you see the heads go in this order defence of private property defence of capital defence of liberty defence of government defence of the empire danger of revolution communism and bolshevism every man's duty why not reverse them every man's duty danger of bolshevism communism and revolution defence of the empire defence of government defence of liberty defence of capital defence of private property that's an idea said fanny not at all a bad idea said mr waddington you might take down the heads in that order barbara took them down and it was agreed that they presented a very original appearance thus reversed and as barbara pointed out the one order was every bit as logical as the other and though mr waddington objected that he would have preferred to close on the note of government and empire he was open to the suggestion that while this might appeal more to the county with the farmers and townspeople capital and private property would strike further home and by the time he had changed combat the forces of disorder to take a stand against anarchy and disruption and spirit of freedom in this country to british genius for liberty and darkest hour in england's history to blackest period in the history of england he was persuaded that the prospectus was now entirely and absolutely his own but i think we must sound the note of hope to end up with my own message how about we must remember that the darkest hour comes before dawn my dear horatio if you inflate yourself so over your prospectus you'll have no wind left when you come to speak be as wildly original as you please but don't be wasteful and extravagant all right fanny i will reserve the dawn please make a note of that miss madden speech blackest or did i say darkest hour before dawn you'd better reserve all you can said fanny when barbara had typed the prospectus mr waddington insisted on taking it to pycraft himself he wanted to ensure its being printed without delay and to arrange for the posters and handbills he also wanted to see the impression it would make on pycraft and on the young lady in pycraft's shop he liked to think of the stir in the composing room when it was handed in and of the importance he was conferring on pycraft you haven't said what you think of the prospectus said fanny as they watched him go i haven't said what i think of the league of liberty what do you think of it i think it looks as if somebody was in an awful funk and i don't see that there's going to be much liberty about it that said fanny is how it struck me but it'll keep horatio quiet for the next six months quiet and afterwards oh afterwards there'll be his book 
i'd forgotten his book that'll keep him quieter than anything else if you can get him to settle down to it part two that evening barbara witnessed the reconciliation of mr waddington and ralph bevan mr waddington made a spectacle of it standing majestic and immovable by his hearth and holding out his hand long before ralph had got near enough to take it good evening ralph glad to see you here again good of you to ask me sir barbara thought he winced a little at the sir he had a distaste for those forms of deference which implied his seniority you could see he didn't like ralph his voice was genial but there was no light in his bulging stare the heavy lines of his face never lifted she wondered was it ralph's brilliant youth that had offended him reminding him even when he refused to recognize his fascination for you could see that he did refuse that he regarded ralph bevan as an inferior insignificant personality barbara had to revise her theory he wasn't jealous of him it would never occur to him that fanny or barbara for that matter could find ralph interesting nothing could disturb for a moment his immense satisfaction with himself he conducted dinner with a superb detachment confining his attention to fanny and barbara as if he were pretending that ralph wasn't there until suddenly he heard fanny asking him if he knew anything about the national league of liberty and what he thought of it mr waddington doesn't want to know what i think of it no but we want to my dear fanny any opinion any honest opinion oh ralph's opinion will be honest enough honest i dare say said mr waddington well if you really want to know i think it's a pathological symptom a what said mr waddington startled into a show of interest pathological symptom it's all funk blue funk true blue funk that's what barbara says the young man looked at barbara as much as to say i knew i could trust you to take the only intelligent view it's run he said by a few imbeciles like sir maurice gedge they're scared out of their lives of bolshevism do you mean to say that bolshevism isn't dangerous not in this country perhaps then you'd like to see a soviet government in this country i didn't say so but i understand that you uphold bolshevism i don't uphold funk but said ralph there's rather more in it than that it's being engineered it's a deliberate dishonest and malicious attempt to discredit labour absurd said mr waddington you show that you are ignorant of the very principles of the league if he recognized ralph's youth it was only to despise it as crude and uninformed it is the national league of liberty well that's about all the liberty there is in it liberty to suppress liberty you may not know that i'm starting a branch of the league in wick i'm sorry sir i did not know fanny why did you lay that trap for me because i wanted your real opinion before you set up an opinion you had better come to my meeting on the twenty first then perhaps you'll learn something about it fanny changed the subject to sir john corbett's laziness a man said mr waddington without any seriousness any sense of responsibility after coffee mr waddington removed fanny to the library to consult with him about the formation of his committee leaving barbara and ralph bevan alone fanny waved her hand to them from the doorway signalling her blessing on their unrestrained communion it's deplorable said ralph to see a woman of fanny's intelligence mixing herself up with a rotten scheme like that poor darling she only does it to keep him quiet oh yes i admit there's every excuse for her they looked at each other and smiled a smile of delicious and secret understanding isn't he wonderful she said i thought you'd like him i say you know i must come to his meeting he'll be more wonderful than ever there can't you see him i can it's almost too much to think that i should be allowed to know him to live in the same house with him to have him turning himself on by the hour together what have i done to deserve it i see he said you have got it got what the taste for him the genuine passion i had it when i was here i couldn't have stood it if i hadn't i know you must have had it you've got it now and i don't suppose i've seen him anything like at his best you'll get more out of him than i did oh do you think i shall yes he may rise to greater heights you mean he may go to greater lengths perhaps i don't know 
you'd have of course to stop his lengths which would be a pity i think of him mostly in heights there's no reason why you shouldn't let him soar but i mustn't discuss him i've just eaten his dinner no we mustn't barbara agreed that's the worst of dinners i say though can't we meet somewhere where we can yes where we can let ourselves rip couldn't we go for more walks together well, i'm afraid there won't be time there'll be loads of time when he's off in his car rounding up the county when he's off i'm on as mrs waddington's companion fanny won't mind she'll let you do anything you like at any rate she'll let me do anything i like will you ask her of course i shall so they settled it part three when barbara said to herself that mr waddington would spoil her evening with ralph bevan she had judged by the change that had come over the house since the return of its master you felt it first in the depressed faces of the servants of partridge and annie trinder a thoughtful gloom had settled even on kimber worse than all fanny waddington had left off humming barbara missed that spontaneous expression of her happiness she thought what is it he does to them and yet it was clear that he didn't do anything they were simply crushed by the sheer mass and weight of his egoism he imposed on them somehow his incredible consciousness of himself he left an atmosphere of uneasiness he felt it when he wasn't there even when fanny had settled down in the drawing-room with tono bungay you felt her fear that at any moment the door would open and horatio would come in but barbara wasn't depressed she enjoyed the perpetual spectacle he made she enjoyed his very indifference to ralph his refusal to see that he could command attention his conviction of his own superior fascination she knew now what ralph meant when he said it would be unkind to spoil him for her he was to burst on her without preparation or description she was to discover him first of all herself first of all but she could see the time coming when her chief joy would be their making him out bit by bit together she even discerned a merry devil in fanny that amused itself at horatio's expense that was aware of barbara's amusement and condoned it there were ultimate decencies that prevented any open communion with fanny but beyond that refusal to smile at horatio after eating his dinner she could see no decencies restraining ralph she could count on him when her private delight became intolerable and must be shared but there were obstacles to their intercourse mr waddington couldn't very well start on what he called his campaign until he was armed with his prospectus and pyecraft took more than a week to print it and while she sat idle thinking of her salary the fiend of conscience prompted barbara to ask him for work wasn't there his book my book my cotswold book he pretended he had forgotten all about it he waved it away the book is only a recreation an amusement plenty of time for that when i've got my league going still i shall be glad when i can settle down to it again he was considering it now with reminiscent affection if it would amuse you to look at it he began a fussy search in his bureau ah here we are he unearthed two piles of manuscript one typed the other written both scored with erasures with almost illegible corrections and insertions it's in a terrible mess he said she saw what her work would be to cut away through the jungle to make clearings if i were to type it all over again you'd have a clean copy to work on when you were ready oh if you would be so good it's that young rascal ralph he'd no business to leave it in that state her scruple came again to barbara mr waddington you'd take him on again for your secretary if he'd come back oh he'd come back all right trust him and you'd take him my dear young lady why should i i don't want him i want you and i don't want to stand in his way oh you needn't worry about that i can't help worrying about it you'd take him back if i wasn't here you are here but if i weren't come come you mustn't talk to me like that she went away and talked to fanny i can't bear doing him out of his job if he'll come back my dear you don't know ralph he'd die rather than come back they made it impossible between them mr waddington says he'd take him back if i wasn't here he wouldn't he only thinks he would because it makes him feel magnanimous he offered ralph half a year's salary if he'd go at once and ralph went at once and wouldn't touch the salary that made him come out top dog and horatio didn't like it 
not that he supposed he could score off ralph with money he isn't vulgar no he wasn't vulgar but she wondered how he would camouflage it to himself that insult to his pride and there was ralph's pride that was so fiery and so clean yet yet mr bevan comes and dines she said yes he comes and dines he'll always be my cousin though he won't be horatio's secretary he's got a very sweet nature and he keeps the issues clear but what will he do he can't live on his sweet nature oh he's got enough to live on though not enough to to do what he wants on but he'll get a job all right you needn't bother your dear little head about ralph fanny said to herself i'll tell him then he'll adore her more than ever if only he adores her enough he'll buck up and get something to do end of chapter five recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter six part one mr waddington did not approve of mrs levitt's intimacy with her sister bertha rickards he would have approved of it still less if he had heard the conversation which mrs trinder heard and reported to miss gregg the governess at the rectory who told the rector's wife who told the rector who told colonel granger who told ralph bevan who kept it to himself what did you say to the old boy elise don't ask me what i said well have you got the cottage of course i've got it silly cuckoo i can get anything out of him i like he wasn't going to turn those ballingers out but i made him did he say when mrs waddington was going to call bertha couldn't resist the temptation of pinching where she knew the flesh was tender i didn't ask him she can't very well be off it now he's your landlord that was what mrs levitt thought and if mrs waddington called lady corbett couldn't very well be off it either they were the only ones in wick who had not called but it would be futile to pretend that they didn't matter that they were not the ones who mattered more than anybody the net she had drawn round mr waddington was tightening though he was as yet unaware of his entanglement first of all the lower wick cottage was put into thorough repair and if the plaster was not quite dry when the ballingers moved into it that was not mr waddington's concern he had provided them with a house which was all that the law could reasonably require him to do clearly it was hitchin the builder who should be held responsible for the plaster not he as for the rheumatism mrs ballinger got supposing it could be put down to the damp plaster and not to some inherent defect in mrs ballinger's constitution clearly that was not mr waddington's concern either if anybody was responsible for mrs ballinger's rheumatism it was hitchin mr waddington did not approve of hitchin hitchin was a socialist who followed colonel granger's lead in overpaying his workmen with disastrous consequences to other people for over and above the general upsetting caused by this gratuitous interference with the prevailing economic system mr hitchin was in the habit of recouping himself by monstrous overcharges and mr hitchin's was not only the best builder in the neighbourhood but the only builder and stonemason in wick on the hill so that he had you practically at his mercy and operations at the sheep street cottage were suspended while mr waddington disputed mr hitchin's estimate bit by bit from the total cost of building the new rooms down to the last pot of enamel paint and his charge per foot for lead piping june was slipping away while they contended and there seemed little chance of mrs levitt's getting to her house before michaelmas if then so that on the morning of the nineteenth two days before the meeting mr waddington found another letter waiting for him on the breakfast-table fanny was looking at him and he sought protection in an affectation of annoyance now what can mrs levitt find to write to me about i wouldn't set any limits to her invention fanny said and what do you know about mrs levitt nothing i only gathered from what you say yourself that she is fertile in resource resource well in creating opportunities opportunities now for what for you to exercise your christian charity my dear when are you going to let me call on her i am not going to let you call on her at all is that christian charity it's anything you please he was absorbed in his letter 
mrs levitt had been obliged to move from mrs trinder's in the square to inferior rooms in sheep street and she was sorry for herself but surely when you're always calling on her yourself i am not always calling on her and if i were there are some things which are perfectly proper for me to do which would not be proper for you it sounds as if mrs levitt wasn't he looked up as sharply as his facial curves permitted nothing of the sort she's simply not the sort of person you do call on and i don't mean you to begin why not because you're my wife and you have a certain position in the county that's why rather a snobby reason isn't it you said i might call on anybody i liked so you may in reason provided you don't begin with mrs levitt i may have to end with her said fanny mr waddington had many reasons for not wishing fanny to call on mrs levitt he wanted to keep his wife because she was his wife in a place apart from mrs levitt and above her to mark the distance and distinction that there was between them he wanted to keep himself as fanny's husband apart and distant by way of enhancing his male attraction and he wanted to keep mrs levitt apart to keep her to himself as the hidden woman of passionate adventure hitherto their intercourse had had the charm the unique irreplaceable charm of things unacknowledged and clandestine mrs levitt was unique irreplaceable he couldn't think of any other woman who would be a suitable substitute there was little barbara madden she had been afraid of him but his passions were still too young to be stirred by the crudity of a girl's fright if it came to that he preferred the reassuring ease of mrs levitt and he didn't mean it to come to that but though mr waddington did not actually look forward to a time when he would be mrs levitt's lover he had visions of the pure fancy in which he saw himself standing on mrs levitt's doorstep after dark say once a fortnight on her servant's night out he would sound a muffled signal on the knocker and the door would be half opened by elise elise he would slip through in a slender and mysterious manner he would go on tiptoe up and down her stairs recapturing a youthful thrill out of the very risks they ran yet managing the affair with a consummate delicacy and discretion at this point mr waddington's fancy heard another door open down the street somebody came out and saw him in the light of the passage somebody went by with a lantern somebody timed his comings and goings he felt the palpitation the cold nausea of detection no you couldn't do these things in a little place like wick on the hill where everybody knew everybody else's business and there was toby too sometimes perhaps on a sunday afternoon when toby and the servant would be out yes sunday afternoon between tea-time and church time or he could meet her in oxford or cheltenham or in london wiser weekends more satisfactory risk of being seen there too but you must take some risks surprising how these things were kept secret birmingham now birmingham would be safer because more unlikely he didn't know anybody in birmingham but the very thought of mrs levitt calling at the manor on the same commonplace footing say as mrs granger was destruction to all this romantic secrecy also he was afraid that if mrs levitt were really that sort of woman fanny's admirable instinct would find her out and scent the imminent affair or if fanny remained unsuspicious and showed plainly her sense of security elise might become possessive and from sheer jealousy give herself away mr waddington said to himself that he knew women and that if he were a wise man and he was a wise man he would arrange matters so that the two should never meet fanny was docile and if he said flatly that she was not to call on mrs levitt she wouldn't part two there was another thing that mr waddington dreaded even more than that dangerous encounter fanny's knowing that he had turned the ballingers out as he would have been very unwilling to admit that mrs levitt had forced his hand there he took the whole of the responsibility for that action but inevitable and justifiable as it was he couldn't hope to carry it off triumphantly with fanny it was just but it was not magnanimous therefore without making any positively untruthful statement he had let her think that ballinger had given notice of his own accord the chances he thought were all against fanny ever hearing the truth of the matter if only the rascal hadn't had a wife and children and if only his wife but unfortunately for mr waddington his wife was susan trinder mrs trinder's husband's niece and susan trinder had been horace's nurse 
and though they all considered that she had done for herself when she married that pig-headed ballinger fanny and horace still called her susan nana and susan nana's niece annie trinder was parlour-maid at the manor so mr waddington had a nasty qualm when annie clearing away breakfast asked if she might have a day off to look after her aunt mrs ballinger who was in bed with the rheumatism to his horror he heard fanny saying she wouldn't have had the rheumatics if they'd stayed in sheep street no ma'am annie's eyes were clear and mendacious he never ought to have left it said fanny no ma'am no more he oughtn't isn't she very sorry about it why couldn't annie leave it alone yes'm she's frettin something awful you see tisn't so much the house though tis a better one than the one they're in tis the garden all that fruit and vegetable what uncle he put in himself and them lavender bushes oh she's so fond of a bit of lavender i dunno i'm sure how she'll get along annie knew he could tell by her eyes that she knew there was nothing but annie's loyalty between him and that exposure that he dreaded he heard fanny say that she would go and see susan to-morrow there would be nothing but susan's loyalty and ballinger's magnanimity it would amount to that if they spared him for fanny's sake he had been absolutely right and ballinger had brought the whole trouble on himself but you could never make fanny see that and ballinger contrived to put him still further in the wrong the next day when fanny called at the cottage she found it empty ballinger had removed himself and his wife and family to susan's father's farm at medlicott a good two and a half miles from his work on colonel granger's land thus providing himself with a genuine grievance and fanny would keep on talking about it at dinner those poor ballingers it's an awful pity he gave up the sheep street cottage didn't you tell him he was a fool horatio mercifully annie trinder had left the room but there was partridge by the sideboard listening i'm not responsible for ballinger's folly if he finds himself inconvenienced by it that's no concern of mine well ballinger's folly has been very convenient for mrs levitt mr waddington tried to look as if mrs levitt's convenience were no concern of his either End of chapter 6 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 7, Part 1 of Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 7, Part 1 the handbills and posters had been out for the last week their headlines were very delightful to the eye with their enormous capitals staring at you in pycraft's royal blue print national league of liberty a meeting in aid of the above league will be held in the town hall wick on the hill saturday june twenty first eight p m chairman sir john corbett of underwoods wick on the hill speaker horatio bish waddington esq of the manor house lower wick you are earnestly requested to attend god save the king only one thing threatened mr waddington's intense enjoyment of his meeting his son horace would be there young horace had insisted on coming over from cheltenham college for the night expressly to attend the meeting and though mr waddington had pointed out that the meeting could very well take place without him fanny appeared to be backing young horace up in his impudent opinion that it couldn't this he found excessively annoying for though for worlds he wouldn't have owned it mr waddington was afraid of his son he was never the same man when he was about the presence of young horace tall for sixteen and developing rapidly was fatal to the illusion of his youth and horace had a way of commenting disadvantageously on everything his father said or did he had a perfect genius for humorous depreciation at any rate he and his mother behaved as if they thought it was humorous and many of his remarks seemed to strike other people sir john and lady corbett for example and ralph bevan in the same light over and over again young horace would keep the whole table listening to him with unreasoning and unreasonable delight while his father's efforts to converse received only a polite and perfunctory attention and the prospect of having young horace's humour let loose on his meeting and on his speech at the meeting was distinctly disagreeable fanny oughtn't to have allowed it to happen he oughtn't to have allowed it himself but short of writing to his headmaster to forbid it they couldn't stop young horace coming 
he had only to get on his motor bicycle and come barbara came on him in the drawing-room before dinner sitting in an easy chair and giggling over the prospectus he jumped up and stood by the hearth smiling at her i say did my governor really write this himself more or less did you really come over for the meeting rather his smile was wilful and engaging you are enthusiastic about the league enthusiastic well i can't say i know much about it of course i know the sort of putrid tosh he'll sling at them but what i want is to see him doing it he had got it too that passion of interest and amusement hers and ralph's only it wasn't decent of him to show it she mustn't let him see she had it she answered soberly yes he's awfully keen is he i've never seen him really excited worked up except once or twice during the war as he stood there looking down smiling pensively he seemed to brood over it to anticipate the joy of the spectacle he had an impudent happy face turned and coloured like his mother's he had fanny's blue eyes and brown hair all that the waddingtons and postlethwaites had done to him was to raise the bridge of his nose and to thicken his lips slightly without altering their wide vivacious twirl he considered barbara you're going to help him write his book aren't you i hope so said barbara you've got a nerve he pretty well did for ralph bevan he's worse than shell-shock when he once gets going i expect i can stand him he can't be worse than the war office oh isn't he you wait at that moment his father came in late and betraying the first symptoms of excitement barbara saw that the boy's eyes took them in as they sat down to dinner mr waddington pretended to ignore horace but horace wouldn't be ignored he drew attention instantly to himself don't you think it's jolly decent of me pater to come over for your meeting i shouldn't have thought said mr waddington that politics were much in your line not worth spoiling a half holiday for i don't suppose i shall care two fags about your old league what i've come for is to see you pater getting up on your hind legs and giving at them i wouldn't miss that for a million half holidays well, if that's all you've come for you might have saved yourself the trouble trouble my dear father i'd have taken any trouble you could see he was laughing at him and he was talking at barbara attracting her attention the whole time with every phrase he shot a look at her across the table evidently he was afraid she might think he didn't know how funny his father was and he had to show her it wasn't decent of him barbara didn't approve of young horace yet she couldn't resist him his eyes and mouth were full like ralph's of such intelligent yet irresponsible joy he wanted her to share it he was an egoist like his father but he had something of his mother's charm something of ralph bevan's nothing he was saying nothing would have kept me away you're very good sir horace could appreciate that biting sarcasm not at all i say i wish you'd let me come on the platform what for you don't propose yourself as a speaker do you rather not i simply want to be somewhere where i can see your face and old grangers at the same time and hitchens's when you're going for their socialism you shall certainly not come on the platform and wherever you sit i must request you to behave yourself if you can you may not realize it but this is going to be a serious meeting i know that it's just the the seriousness that gets me he giggled mr waddington shrugged his shoulders of course if you've no sense of responsibility if you choose to go on like an ill-bred schoolboy but don't be surprised if you're reprimanded from the chair what old corbett i should like to see him don't you worry pater i'll behave a jolly sight better than anybody else will you see if i don't how did you suppose he'd behave horatio said fanny when he's come all that way and given up a picnic to hear you pater will be a picnic if you like said horace mr waddington waved him away with a gesture as if he flicked a teasing fly and went out to collect his papers fanny turned to her son horry dear you mustn't rag your father like that you mustn't laugh at him he doesn't like it i can't help it horry said he's so furiously funny he makes me giggle well whatever you do don't giggle at the meeting or you'll give him away i won't mater honour bright i won't i'll hold myself in like like anything only you mustn't mind if i burst end of chapter seven part one 
Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Seven, Part Two of Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Seven, Part Two mr waddington had spoken for half an hour expounding with some necessary repetitions the principles and objects of the league he was supported on the platform by his chairman sir john corbett and by the other members of his projected committee by lady corbett by fanny by the rector by mr thurston of the elms wick on the hill by mr bostock of parsons bank mr jackson and messrs jackson cleaver and company solicitors major markham of wick wold mr temple of norton in mark and mr hawtrey of medlicott and by his secretary miss barbara madden the body of the hall was packed beneath him in the front row he had the wives and daughters of his committee men in its centre right under his nose he was painfully aware of the presence of young horace and ralph bevan colonel granger sat behind them conspicuous and mr waddington fancied a little truculent with his great square face and square clipped red moustache and on either side of colonel granger and behind him were the neighbouring gentry and the townspeople of wick the two grocers the two butchers the drapers and hotel keeper and behind them again the servants of the manor and a crowd of shop assistants and further and further back farm labourers and artisans among these he recognised ballinger with several of colonel granger's and hitchin's men a pretty compact group they made and mr waddington was gratified by their appearance there and well in the centre of the hall above the women's hats he could see mr hitchin's bush of hair his shrewd round clean-shaven and rosy face his grey checked shoulders and red tie mr hitchin had the air of being supported by the entire body of his workmen mr waddington was gratified by mr hitchin's appearance too and he thought he would insert some expression of that feeling in his peroration he was also profoundly aware of mrs levitt sitting all by herself in an empty space about the middle of the third row from time to time ralph bevan and young horace fixed on fanny waddington and barbara delighted eyes and faces of a supernatural gravity young horace was looking odd and unlike himself with his jaws clamped together in his prodigious effort not to giggle whenever barbara's eyes met his and ralph's a faint smile quivered on her face and flickered and went out once horace whispered to ralph bevan isn't he going it and ralph whispered back he's immense he was he felt immense he felt that he was carrying his audience with him the sound of his own voice excited him and whipped him on it was a sort of intoxication he was soaring now up and up into his peroration it is a gratification to me to see so many working men and women here to-night they are specially welcome we want to have them with us do not distrust the working man the working man is sound at heart sound at head too when he is let alone and not carried away by the treacherous arguments of ignorant agitators we myself and the founders of this league have not that bad opinion of the working man which his leaders his misleaders i may call them appear to have we believe in him we know that if he were only let alone there is no section of the community that would stand more solid for order and good government than he hear hear from colonel granger ralph whispered camouflage to horace who nodded there is nothing in the aims of this league contrary to the interests of labour on the contrary he heard as if somebody else had perpetrated it the horrible repetition i mean to say his brain fought for another phrase madly and in vain on the contrary it exists in order to safeguard the true interests the best interests of every working man and woman in the country hear hear from sir john corbett mr waddington smiled president wilson he became agitated and drank water president wilson talked about making the world safe for democracy well if we you and i all of us don't take care the world won't be safe for anything else 
it certainly won't be safe for the middle classes for the great business and professional classes for the class to which i for one belong the class of english gentlemen it won't be safe for us not that i propose to make a class question of it to make a class question of it would be more than wrong it would be foolish it would be a challenge to revolution the first step towards letting loose unchaining against us those forces of disorder and destruction which we are seeking to keep down i am not here to insist on class differences to foment class hatred those differences exist they always will exist but they are immaterial to our big purpose this is a question of principle the great principle of british liberty are we going to submit to the tyranny of one class over all other classes of one interest over all other interests in the country are we going to knock under i say to a minority whether it is a labour minority or any other are we going to tolerate bolshevism and a soviet government here if there are any persons present who think that that is our attitude and our intention i tell them now plainly it is not in their own language in our good old county proverb as sure as gods in gloucester it is not and never will be the sooner they understand that the better i do not say that there are any persons present who would be guilty of so gross an error i do not believe there are i do not believe that there is any intelligent person in this room who will not agree with me when i say that though it is just and right that labour should have a voice in the government it is not just and it is not right that it should be the only voice it has been the only voice heard in russia for two years and what is the consequence bloodshed anarchy and bloodshed i don't say that we should have anarchy and bloodshed here england thank god is not russia but i do not say that we shall not have them and i do say that it rests with us with you and me ladies and gentlemen to decide whether we shall or shall not have them it depends on the action we take to-night with regard to this national law of liberty on the action taken on on other nights at similar meetings all over this england of ours it depends in two words on our united action whether we shall have anarchy or stable government whether this england of ours shall or shall not continue to be a free country remember two things the league is national and it is a league of liberty it would not be one if it were not the other you will say perhaps many of you are saying this league is all very well but what can i do perhaps you will even say what can wick do after all wick is a small place it isn't the capital of the county well i can tell you what wick can do it can be it is the first town in gloucestershire the first provincial town in england to start a national league of liberty they've got a league in london the parent league they may have another branch league anywhere any day but i hope that thanks to the very noble efforts of those ladies and gentlemen who have kindly consented to serve on my committee i hope that before long we shall have started leagues in gloucester cheltenham sirenster nailsworth and stroud in every town village and hamlet in the county i hope thanks to your decision to-night ladies and gentlemen to be able to say that wick little wick has got in first all around us for fifteen twenty miles round there are hamlets villages and towns that haven't got a league that know nothing about the league wick on the hill will be the centre of the league for this part of the cotswolds it is impossible to exaggerate the importance of the principle at stake impossible therefore to exaggerate the importance of this league therefore impossible to exaggerate the importance of this meeting of every man and woman who has come here to-night and when you rise from your seats and step up to this platform to enroll your names as members of the national league of liberty i want you to feel every one of you that you will be doing an important thing a thing necessary to the nation a thing in its way every bit as necessary and important as the thing the soldier does when he rises up out of his trench and goes over the top it was then and then only that young horace giggled but he covered his collapse with a shout of hear hear that caused fanny and barbara to blow their noses simultaneously as for ralph he hid his face in his hands like him said mr waddington you will be helping to save england and what can any of us do more he sat down suddenly in a perfect uproar of applause and drank water in spite of the applause he was haunted by a sense of incompleteness there was something he had left out of his speech something he had particularly wanted to say 
it seemed to him more vital more important than anything he had said a solitary pair of hands mrs levitt's hands conspicuously lifted were still clapping when mr hitchin's face rose like a red moon behind and a little to the left of her followed by the grey checked shoulders and red tie he threw back his head stuck a thumb in each armhole of his waistcoat and spoke ladies and gentlemen the speaker has quoted president wilson about the world being made safe for democracy he seems to be concerned about the future to be if i may say so in a bit of a funk about the future but has he paid any attention to the past has he considered the position of the working man in the past has he even considered the condition of many working men at the present time for instance of the farm labourer now in this country if he had if he knew the facts if he cared about the facts he might admit that whether he's going to like it or not it's the working man's turn just about his turn i needn't ask mr waddington if he knows the parable of the rich man and lazarus but i should like to say to him what abraham said to the rich man remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise lazarus evil things but now he is comforted and thou art tormented i don't want mr waddington to be tormented to be tormented too much not more than is reasonable a little torment say his finger scorched for the fraction of a second in that hot unpleasant place would be good for him if it made him think i say i don't want to torment him but i'll just ask him one question does he think that a world where it's possible for a working man just because he is a working man and not an english gentleman a world where it's still possible for him and his wife and his children to be turned out of house and home to suit the whim of an english gentleman does he think that a world where things like that can happen is a safe place for anybody i can tell him it isn't safe it isn't safe for you and me and if it isn't safe for you and me it isn't safe for the people who make these things happen and it isn't any safer for the people who stand by and let them happen and if the socialist if the bolshevist is the man who's going to see to it that they don't happen if a soviet government is the only government that'll see to that then the socialist or the bolshevist is the man for my money and a soviet government is the government for my vote i don't say mind you that it is the only government i say if it were mr waddington doesn't like bolshevism none of us like it he doesn't like socialism i think he's got some wrong ideas about that but he's dead right when he tells you if you're afraid of bolshevism and a soviet government that the remedy lies in your own hands if there ever is a day of reckoning what mr waddington would call a revolution in this country you we i every one of us sitting here will be done with according as we do he sat down and mr waddington rose again on his platform solemn and a little pale he looked round the hall to show that there was no person there whom he was afraid to face it might have been the look of some bold and successful statesman turning on a turbulent house confident in his power to hold it unless i have misheard him what mr hitchin has just said ladies and gentlemen sounded very like a threat if that is so we may congratulate mr hitchin on providing an unanswerable proof of the need for a national league of liberty there were cries of hear hear from sir john corbett and from mr hawtrey of medlicott then a horrible thing happened slight and rustling at first then gathering volume there came a hissing from the back rows packed with colonel granger's and mr hitchin's men then a booing then a booing and hissing together sir john scrabbled on to his little legs and cried order there order mr waddington maintained an indomitably supercilious air while sir john brought his fist down on the table probably the most energetic thing he had ever done in his life with a loud shout of order colonel granger and mr hitchin were seen to turn round in their places and made a sign to their men and the demonstration ceased mr waddington then rose as if nothing at all had happened and said any ladies and gentlemen wishing to join the league will please come up to the platform and give their names to miss madden any persons wishing to subscribe at once may pay their subscriptions to miss madden i will now call your attention to the last item on the programme and ask you all to join with me very heartily in singing god save the king 
everybody except colonel grainger and mr hitchin rose and everybody except the extremists of the opposition sang one voice it was mrs levitt's voice was lifted arrogantly high and clear above the rest and him victorious happy and glorious long to reign over us god save the king mr waddington waited beside barbara madden at the table he waited in a superb confidence after all the demonstration engineered by colonel grainger had had no effect the front and middle rows had risen to their feet and a very considerable procession was beginning to file towards the platform mr waddington was so intent on this procession barbara was so busy taking down names and entering subscriptions and making out receipts sir john and lady corbett and the rest of the proposed committee were talking to each other so loud and fast ralph and horace were so absorbed in looking at barbara that none of them saw what was happening in the body of the hall only fanny caught the signals that passed between colonel grainger and mr hitchin and between mr hitchin and his men then colonel grainger stood up and shouted i protest mr hitchin stood up and shouted i protest they shouted together we protest sir john corbett rushed back to his chair and shouted order and the back rows the ranks of hitchin's men stood up and shouted we won't sign we won't sign we won't sign and then young horace did an unsuspected thing a thing that surprised himself he leaped on to the front bench and faced the insurgent back rows his face was red with excitement and with the shame and anger and resentment inspired by his father's eloquence but he was shouting in his hoarse breaking adolescent voice look here you blackguards there at the back if you don't stop that row this minute i'll jolly well chuck you all out only one voice the voice of mr hitchin's biggest and brawniest quarryman replied come on sir young horace vaulted lightly over the bench followed by ralph and the two were steeplechasing down the hall when mr hitchin made another of his mysterious signals and the men filed out obediently one by one ralph and horace found themselves in the middle of the empty benches laughing into each other's faces colonel grainger and mr hitchin stood beside them smiling with intolerable benevolence mr hitchin was saying the men are all right mr bevan they don't mean any harm they just got a bit out of hand horace saw that they were being magnanimous and the thought maddened him i don't blame the men he said and i don't blame you hitchin you don't know any better but colonel grainger ought to be damned well ashamed of himself and i hope he is colonel grainger laughed so did mr hitchin throwing himself back and swaying from side to side as his mirth shook him look here mr hitchin that'll do horry said ralph he led him gently down a side aisle and through a swing door into the concealed corridor beside the platform there they waited don't imagine for one moment said young horry that i agree with all that tosh he talk but after all he's got a perfect right to make a fool of himself if he chooses and he's my father i know from first to last horry you behave beautifully but what would you do if your father made an unholy ass of himself in public my father doesn't no but if he did i'd do what you did sit tight and try and look as if he didn't then said horace you look as big a fool yourself not quite you don't say anything besides your father isn't as big a fool as those london leaguers who started the silly show sir maurice gedge and all that crowd he didn't invent the beastly thing no said horace mournfully he hasn't even the merit of originality he meditated still mournful look here ralph what did that blackguard hitchin mean he isn't a blackguard he's a ripping good sort i can tell you if every employer in this confounded commercial country was as honest as old hitchin there wouldn't be any labor question worth talking about oh damn his honesty what did he mean was it true what he said was what true why that my father turned the ballingers out yes i'm afraid it was why well, say how disgusting of him you know i always thought he was a bit of a fool my father but i didn't know he was that beastly kind of fool he isn't said ralph he's just a fool i know did you ever hear such putrid rot as he talked i don't know for the kind of silly thing it was his speech wasn't half bad what about going over the top oh lord and after turning the ballingers out too ralph was silent what's happened to him he didn't used to be like that he must be mad or something 
ralph thought of mrs levitt he's getting old and he doesn't like it that's what's the matter with him but hang it all ralph that's no excuse it really isn't i believe ballinger gave him some provocation well, i don't care what he gave him he'd no earthly business to take advantage of it not with that sort of person besides it wouldn't matter about ballinger so much but there's old susan and the kiddies he doesn't see how perfectly sickening it is for me it isn't very nice for your mother no it's jolly hard on the poor mater well i can't stick it much longer i'm just about fed up with horatio bish i shall clear out first thing in the morning before he's down i don't care if i never see him or speak to him again oh i say i say what about the midsummer holidays oh damn the midsummer holidays isn't it rather rotten to take a line you can't possibly keep up that's all right whatever i may do in the future said young horace magnificently i've got to give him his punishment now ralph laughed young horace was as big an egoist as his father but with these differences his blood was hot instead of cold he had his mother's humour and he was not a fool ralph wondered how he would have felt if he had realised mrs levitt's part in the ballinger affair End of chapter 7, part 2, recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 7, parts 3 and 4 of Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 7, part 3 mr waddington remained standing on his platform they were coming round him now grasping him by the hand congratulating him sir john corbett the rector major markham of wick wold and mr hawtrey of medlicott capital speech waddington capital best speech made in the town hall since they built it splendid you landed them one every time no wonder you drew them down on to you that was a disgraceful business said sir john disgraceful nothing of the sort ever happened in wick before said the rector nobody ever made a speech like waddington's before said major markham of wickwold oh you always get a row if you drag in politics mr hawtrey said i don't know said sir john that was a put-up job between hitchin and granger struck me it had every appearance of a spontaneous outburst major markham said oh i've no doubt the rowdy element was brought in from the outside said the rector hardly one of hitchin's workpeople is a wick man otherwise i should have to apologize to waddington for my parishioners you needn't there was nothing personal to me in it nothing personal at all even hitchin wouldn't have had the impudence to oppose me on my own platform it was the league they were going for bit too big for em if you come out with a large important thing like that there's sure to be some opposition just at first till it gets hold of em glad you can see it that way said sir john my dear fellow that's the way to see it it's the right way the big impersonal way you've taken it in the proper spirit waddington said the rector none of those fellows meant any real harm all good fellows by the way is it true that the ballingers have moved to lower wick i believe so dear me what on earth possessed them some fad of ballingers i fancy well that reminds me i must go and see mrs ballinger you won't find them there sir they've moved again to her father's at medlicott you don't say so i wonder now what they've done that for they complained of the house being damp for one thing if it was that was hitchin's fault not mine was everybody in a plot to badger him about those wretched ballingers he was getting sick of it and he wanted to speak a word to mrs levitt mrs levitt had come up in the tail of the procession she had given in her name and her subscription to barbara madden but she lingered waiting no doubt for a word with him if only corbett and the rest of them would go of course of course it was hitchin's fault said the rector with imperishable geniality well good night waddington and thank you for a most a most stimulating evening they had gone now all but sir john and lady corbett he could hear her talking to fanny at the back of the platform mrs levitt was gathering her scarf round her in another minute she would be gone and corbett wouldn't go i say waddington that's a splendid young cub of yours see him go over the top he'd have taken them all on licked them too i shouldn't wonder mr waddington resented this diversion of the stream of admiration 
and he was acutely aware of mrs levitt standing there detached but waiting was i really all right corbett he wasn't satisfied with his speech if only he could remember what he had left out of it absolutely my dear chap absolutely top hole you ought to make that boy a soldier he wished that young horace could be a soldier at that moment stationed in a remote part of the empire without any likelihood of leave for the next five years he wanted intolerably to speak to mrs levitt to spread himself voluptuously in her rejuvenating smile sir john retreated before his manifest indifference he could hear him at the back of the platform congratulating fanny mrs levitt advanced towards him at last she said i may add my congratulations that speech was magnificent oh nothing my dear lady nothing but a little necessary plain speaking oh but you were wonderful you carried us off our feet i hope he said we've enrolled you as a member he knew they had of course i'm enrolled and i paid in my poor little guinea to that delightful miss madden ah that is too good of you it was the amount of the subscription was purely a matter of individual fancy it's the least i could do in such a splendid cause well dear mrs levitt we're delighted to have you with us delighted there was a pause he was looking down at her from the height of his six feet the faint sweet scent of orris root rose up from her warm skin she was very attractive dressed in a low-necked gown of that dull satiny stuff women were wearing now a thin band of white net was stretched across the top of her breast through it he could see just the shadowy arrow-headed groove between her pendant pearl bister and paste pointed pointed down to it he was wrong about elise and jewellery that was a throat for pearls and for diamonds emeralds she would be all black and white and sparkling green a necklace he thought wouldn't hang on her it would be laid out exposed on that white breast as on a cushion you could never tell what a woman was really like till you'd seen her in a low-necked gown it made mrs levitt ten times more alluring he smiled at her a tender brooding rather fatuous smile mrs levitt saw that her moment had come it would be now or never she must risk it i wish she said you'd introduce me to your wife it was a shock a horrid blow it showed plainly that elise had interests beyond him that she was not like him for all the secret solitary adventure yet perhaps perhaps she had planned it she thought it would be safer for them more discreet she looked up at him with the old irrefutable smile will you she pleaded well i'm not sure that i know where my wife is she was here a minute ago talking to lady corbett he looked round a wide screen guarded the door on to the platform he could see lady corbett and fanny disappearing behind it i'll i'll go and look for her he said he meditated treachery treachery to poor elise he followed them through the door and down the steps into the concealed corridor he found ralph bevan there horace had gone i say ralph i wish you'd take fanny home she's tired get her out of this i shall be here quite half an hour longer settling up accounts you might tell kimber to come back for me and miss madden now to get to the entrance you had to pass through the swing door into the hall and down the side aisle to the bottom so that mrs levitt witnessed mrs waddington's exit with ralph bevan mr waddington waited till the hall doors had closed on them before he returned i can't find my wife anywhere he said she wasn't in the cloak-room so i think she must have gone back with horace mrs levitt would think that fanny had disappeared while he was looking for her honourably in the cloak-room i saw her go out said mrs levitt coldly with mr bevan i suppose he's taking her home he said vaguely his best policy was vagueness and now my dear lady i wish i could take you home but i shall be detained here some little time still if you don't mind waiting a minute or two till kimber comes back with a car he shall drive you thank you mr waddington i'm afraid i've waited quite long enough it isn't worth while troubling kimber to drive me a hundred yards it gave her pleasure to inflict that snub on mr waddington in return for his manoeuvre as the meeting had now broken up and there wouldn't be anybody to witness her departure in the waddington's car mrs levitt calculated that she could afford that little gratification of her feelings they were intensified by mr waddington's very evident distress he would have walked home with her the hundred yards to sheep street but she wouldn't hear of it 
she was perfectly capable of seeing herself home miss madden was waiting for him good night part four eleven o'clock in the library where mr waddington was drinking his whisky and water fanny had been crying horry had stalked off to his bedroom without saying good night to anybody barbara had retired discreetly ralph bevan had gone and when fanny thought of the lavender bag susan nana sent every year at christmas she had cried how could you do it horatio how could you there was nothing else to be done you can't expect me to take your sentimental view of ballinger it isn't ballinger it's poor susan nana and the babies and the lavender bags mr waddington swayed placably up and down on the tips of his toes it serves poor susan nana right for marrying ballinger oh i suppose it serves me right too though she clenched her hands tight tight she couldn't keep back that little spurt of anger he was smiling his peculiar voluptuous smile serves you right for spoiling everybody in the village it does indeed you don't in the least see what i mean said fanny but after all she was glad he hadn't seen it he hadn't seen anything he hadn't seen that she had been crying it had never dawned on him that she might care about susan nana or that the ballingers might love their home their garden and their lavender bushes he was like that he didn't see things and he didn't care he was back in his triumph of the evening going over the compliments and congratulations again and again best speech ever made in the town hall but there was something something he had left out did it never dawn on you said fanny ah now he had it there he said i knew i'd forgotten something i never put in that bit about the darkest hour before dawn fanny's mind had wandered from what she had been going to say did you see what horry did she said instead everybody could see it it was most unnecessary i don't care think horatio think of his sticking up for you like that he was going to fight them the dear thing all those great rough men to fight them for you he said he'd behave better than anybody else and he did yes yes he behaved very well now that she put it to him that way he was touched by horace's behaviour he could always be touched by the thought of anything you did for him but ralph bevan could have told fanny she was mistaken young horace didn't do it altogether for his father he did it for himself for an ideal of conduct an ideal of honour that he had to let off steam to make a sensation in the town hall to feel himself magnificent and brave because he too was an egoist though a delightful one mr waddington returned to his speech i can't think what made me leave out that bit about the dawn oh bother your old dawn said fanny i'm going to bed she went consoled dear horry she thought i'm glad he did that end of chapter seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eight part one the ballinger affair did not end with a demonstration in the town hall it had unforeseen and far-reaching consequences the first of these appeared in a letter which mr waddington received from mr hitchin dear sir regarding my estimate for decoration and additional building to mrs levitt's house i beg to inform you that recent circumstances have rendered it impossible for me to take up the contract i must therefore request you to transfer your esteemed order to some other firm faithfully yours thomas hitchin mr hitchin expressed his attitude even more clearly to the foreman of his works i'm not going to build bathrooms and boudoirs and bedrooms for that blank the word he chose completed the alliteration so that mr waddington was compelled to employ a cheltenham builder whose estimate exceeded mr hitchin's estimate by thirty pounds and mr hitchin's refusal was felt even by people who resented his estimates to be a moral protest that did him credit it impressed the popular imagination in the popular imagination mrs levitt was now inextricably mixed up with the ballinger affair 
public sympathy was all with ballinger turned out of his house and forced to take refuge with his wife's father at medlicott forced to trudge two and a half miles every day to his work and back again the rector and major markham of wick wold meditating on the ballinger affair as they walked back that night from the town hall pronounced it a mystery it wasn't likely major markham said that ballinger of his own initiative would leave a comfortable house in sheep street for a damp cottage in lower wick was it likely the rector said that waddington would turn him out he couldn't believe that old waddington would do anything of the sort unless major markham suggested he's been got at mrs levitt may have got at him he was a good sort old waddy but he would be very weak in the hands of a clever unscrupulous woman the rector said he thought there was no harm in mrs levitt and major markham replied that he didn't like the look of her a vague scandal rose in wick on the hill it went from mouth to mouth in bar parlours and back shops major markham transported it in his motor-car from wick wold to the halls and manors of winchway and chipping kingdon and norton in mark it got an even firmer footing in the county than in wick with the consequence that one old lady withdrew her subscription to the league and that when mr waddington started on his campaign of rounding up the county the county refused to be rounded up and the big towns gloucester cheltenham and sirenster was singularly apathetic it was intimated to mr waddington that if the local authorities saw fit to take the matter up no doubt something would be done but the big towns were not anxious for a national league of liberty imposed on them from wick on the hill the league did not die of mrs levitt all at once very soon after the inaugural meeting the committee sat at lower wick manor and appointed mr waddington president it arranged a series of monthly meetings in the town hall at which mr waddington would speak that said fanny will give you something to look forward to every month thus on saturday the nineteenth of july he would speak on the truth about bolshevism it was also decided that the league could be made very useful during by-elections in the county if there ever were any and mr waddington prepared in fancy a great speech which he could use for electioneering purposes on july the nineteenth seventeen people counting fanny and barbara came to the meeting sir john corbett lady corbett was unfortunately unable to attend the rector without his wife major markham of wick wold mr bostock of parsons bank kimber and partridge and annie trinder from the manor the landlady of the white hart the butcher the grocer and the fishmonger with whom mr waddington dealt three farmers who approved of his determination to keep down wages and mrs levitt when he sat down and drank water there was a feeble clapping led by mrs levitt sir john and the rector on august the sixteenth the audience had shrunk to mrs levitt kimber and partridge the butcher one of the three farmers and a visitor staying at the white hart mr waddington spoke on what the league can do owing to a sudden unforeseen shortage in his ideas he was obliged to fall back on his electioneering speech and show how useful the league would be if at any time there were a by-election in the county the pop pop popping of mrs levitt's hands burst into a silent space nobody not even kimber or partridge was going to follow mrs levitt's lead you'll have to give it up fanny said next time there won't be anybody but mrs levitt and with the vision before him of all those foolish empty benches and mrs levitt pop pop popping dear brave woman all by herself mr waddington admitted that he would have to give it up not that he owned himself beaten not that he gave up his opinion of the league it's a bit too big for em he said they can't grasp it sleepy minds you can't rouse em if they won't be roused he emerged from his defeat with an unbroken sense of intellectual superiority part two thus the league languished and died out and mr waddington in the absence of this field for personal activity languished too in spite of his intellectual superiority perhaps because of it he languished till barbara pointed out to him that the situation had its advantages at last he could go on with his book if you can only start him on it and keep him at it fanny said i'll bless you forever but it was not easy either to start him or to keep him at it 
to begin with as ralph had warned her the work itself ramblings through the cotswolds was in an appalling mess and mr waddington seemed to have exhausted his original impetus in getting it into that mess he had set out on his ramblings without any settled plan a rambler he said shouldn't have a settled plan so that you would find mr waddington starting from wick on the hill and arriving at lechford in the thames valley turning up in the valley of the windlode or the speed you would find him on page twenty seven drinking ale at the Ligon arms in chipping kingdon and on page twenty eight looking down on the evesham plain from the heights south of cheltenham he would turn from this prospect and without traversing any intermediate ground be back again where you least expected him in his manner under wick on the hill for though he had no fixed plan he had a fixed idea and however far he rambled he returned invariably to wick to mr waddington wick on the hill was the one stable the one certain spot on the earth's surface and this led to his treating the map of gloucestershire entirely with reference to wick on the hill so that all his ramblings were complicated by the necessity laid on him of starting from and getting back to it so much barbara made out after she had copied the first forty pages making the first clearing in mr waddington's jungle the clearings she explained to ralph broke your heart it wasn't till you'd got the thing all clean and tidy that you realized the deep spiritual confusion that lay behind it after that fortieth page the ramblings piled and mixed themselves in three interpenetrating layers first there was the original layer of waddington then a layer of ralph superimposed on waddington and striking down into him then a top layer of waddington striking down into ralph first the primeval chaos of waddington then ralph's spirit moving over it and bringing in light and order then waddington again invading it and beating it all back to darkness and confusion from the moment ralph came into it the progress of the book was a struggle between these two principles and waddington could never let ralph be so determined was he to stamp the book with his own personality after all ralph said it is his book if he could only get away from wick so that you could see where the other places are she moaned he can't get away from it because he can't get away from himself his mind is egocentric and his ego lives in wick barbara had had to ask ralph to help her they were in the library together now working on the ramblings during one of mr waddington's periodical flights to london he thinks he's rambling round the country but he's really rambling round and round himself all the time he's thinking about nothing but his blessed self oh come he thought a lot about his old league no the league was only an extension of his ego that must have been what fanny meant we were looking at his portrait and i said i wondered what he was thinking about and she said she used to wonder and now she knew of course it's himself that's what makes him look so absurdly solemn yes but think of it think that man hasn't ever cared about anything or anybody but himself oh he cares about fanny no no he doesn't he cares about his wife a very different thing well he cares about his old mother he really cares yes and you know why it's only because she makes him feel young he hates hoary because he can't feel young when he's there why oh why did that angel fanny marry him because she isn't an angel she's a mortal woman and she wanted a husband and children wasn't there anybody else i believe not available the man she ought to have married was married already did my mother marry him yes and my mother married the next best one it was as plain and simple as all that and you see the plainer and simpler it was the more she realized why she was marrying horatio the more she idealized him it wanted camouflage i see then you must remember her people were badly off and he helped them he was always doing things for them he managed all fanny's affairs for her before he married her then he does kind things oh lots when he wants to get something he wanted to get fanny besides he does them to get power to get a hold on you it's really for himself all the time it gives him a certain simplicity and purity he isn't a snob 
he doesn't think about his money or his property or his ancestors he's got heaps quite good ones they don't matter nothing matters but himself how about his book doesn't that matter it does and yet again it doesn't he pretends he's only doing it to amuse himself but it's really a projection of his ego into the cotswolds on the other hand he'd hate it if you took him for a writing man when he's horatio bish waddington that's how he's got it into such a mess because he can't get away from himself and his manner proud of his manner anyhow oh yes not mind you because it's perfect tutor of the sixteenth century nor because the earl of warwick gave it to his great-grandfather's great-great-grandfather but because it's his manner horatio bish waddington's manner of course it's got to be what it is because any other sort of manner wouldn't be good enough for bish it's an extension of his ego too yes horatio's ego spreading itself in wings and bursting into ball top gables and overflowing into a lovely garden in a park there isn't a tree there isn't a flower that hasn't got bits of horatio in it if i thought that i should never want to see roses and larkspurs again it only happens in horatio's mind but it does happen so between them bit by bit they made him out and they made out the book here and there on separate slips were great outlying tracts of light contributed by ralph to be inserted and sketches of dark undeveloped stuff sprung from waddington to be inserted too neither ralph nor barbara could make them fit the only thing was to copy it out clear as it stood and arrange it afterwards and presently it appeared that two pages were missing one evening the evening of mr waddington's return looking for the lost pages barbara made her great discovery a sheaf of manuscript a hundred and twenty pages in ralph's handwriting hidden away at the back of the bureau crumpled as if an inimical hand had thrust it out of sight she took it up to bed and read it there a hundred and twenty pages of pure ralph without any taint of waddington it seemed to be part of mr waddington's book and yet no part of it for it was inconceivable that it should belong to anything but itself ralph didn't ramble he went straight for the things he had seen he saw the cotswolds round wick on the hill he made you see them as they were the high curves of the hills multiplied thrown off one after another the squares and oblongs and van dykes and spread fans of the fields and their many colours grass green of the pastures emerald green of the young wheat white green of the barley shining metallic green of the turnip the pink the brown the purple fallows the sharp canary yellow of the charlock and the trees the long processions of trees by the great grass-bordered roads trees furring the flanks and groins of the parted hills dark combs topping their edges ralph knew what he was doing he went about with the farmers and farmhands he followed the ploughing and sowing and reaping the feeding and milking of the cattle the care of the ewes and labour and of the young lambs he went at night to the upland folds with the shepherds he could tell you about shepherds he sat with the village women by their firesides and listened to their talk he could tell you about village women mr waddington did not tell you about anything that mattered she took the manuscript to ralph at the white hart with a note to say how she had found it he came running out to walk home with her did you know it was there she said no i thought i'd lost it you see what it is part of your book horatio's book but you wrote it yes that's what he fired me out for he got tired of the thing and asked me to go on with it he called it working up his material i went on with it like that and he wouldn't have it he said it was badly written jerky short sentences he'd have to rewrite it well i wouldn't let him do that and he wouldn't have it as it stood but it's beautiful alive and real what more does he want the stamp of his personality oh he'd stamp on it all right i'm glad you like it like it don't you ralph said he thought he'd liked it when he wrote it but now he didn't know you'll know when you've finished it i don't suppose i shall finish it he said but you must you can't not finish a thing like that i own i'd like to but i can't publish it why ever not oh it wouldn't be fair to poor old waddy after all i wrote it for him what on earth does that matter if he doesn't want it 
of course you'll finish it and of course you'll publish it well but it's all cotswold you see and he's cotswold if it is any good you know i shouldn't like to to well get in his way it's his game at least he began it it's a game two can play writing cotswold books no no it isn't and he got in first well then let him get in first you can bring your book out after and dish his no let it have a run first perhaps it won't have any run perhaps mine won't yours that heavenly book and his tosh don't you see that you can't get in his way if anybody reads him they won't be the same people who read you i hope not all the same it would be rather beastly to cut him out i mean to come in and do it better show how bad he is how frightful it would rub it in you know not with him you couldn't you don't know some brute might get up and hurt him with it oh you are tender to him well you see i did let him down when i left him besides it isn't altogether him there's fanny fanny she'd love you to write your book i know she'd think she would but she wouldn't like it if it made horatio look a fool but he's bound to look a fool in any case true i might give him a year or two years well then my work's cut out for me i shall have to make horatio go on and finish quick so as not to keep you waiting he'll get sick of it he'll make you go on with it me practically and quarrel with every word you write unless you can write so like horatio that he'll think he's done it himself and then you know he won't have a word of mine left in you'll have to take me out and we're so mixed up together that i don't believe even he could sort us you see in order to appease him i got into the way of giving my sentences a waddingtonian twist if only i could have kept it up well, i'll have to lick the thing into shape somehow there's only one thing you'll have to do you must make him steer a proper course this is to be the guide to the cotswolds you can't have him sending people back to lower wick manor all the time you'll have to know all the places and all the ways and i don't no but i do supposing i took you on my motor-bike would you awfully mind sitting on the carrier you think she said he'd let me go fanny will i could i think i work so hard in the mornings and evenings that they've given me all the afternoons we might go every afternoon while the weather holds out he said and then i say he does bring us together that was how barbara's happy life began part three he did bring them together in the terrible months that followed while she struggled for order and clarity against mr waddington who strove to reinstate himself in his obscure confusion barbara was sustained by the thought that in working for mr waddington she was working for ralph bevan the harder she worked for him the harder she worked for ralph with all her cunning and her little indomitable will she urged and drove him to get on and make way for ralph mr waddington interposed all sorts of irritating obstructions and delays he would sit for hours brooding solemnly equally unable to finish and to abandon any paragraph he had once begun he had left the high roads and was rambling now in byways of such intricacy that he was unable to give any clear account of himself when barbara had made a clean copy of it mr waddington's part didn't always make sense the only bits that could stand by themselves were ralph's bits and they were the bits that mr waddington wouldn't let stand the very clearness of the copy was a light flaring on the hopeless mess it was even mr waddington could see it do you think she said we've got it all down in the right order she pointed what's that she could see his hands twitching with annoyance his loose cheeks hung shaking as he brooded that's not as i wrote it he said at last that's ralph bevan he wasn't a bit of good to me there's there's no end to the harm he's done conceited fellow full of himself and his own ideas now i shall have to go over every line he's written and write it again i'd rather write a dozen books myself than patch up another fellow's bad work we've got to overhaul the whole thing and take out whatever he's done but you're so mixed up you can't always tell he looked at her you may be sure that if any passage is obscure or confused or badly written it isn't mine the one you've shown me for example 
then barbara had another of her ideas since they were so mixed up together that mr waddington couldn't tell which was which and since he wanted to give the impression that ralph was responsible for all the bad bits and insisted on the complete elimination of ralph she had only got to eliminate the bad bits and give such a waddingtonian turn to the good ones that he would be persuaded that he had written them himself the great thing was he said that the book should be written by himself and once fairly extricated from his own entanglements and set going on a clear path with barbara to pull him out of all the awkward places mr waddington rambled along through the cotswolds at a smooth easy pace barbara had contrived to break him of his wasteful and expensive habit of returning from everywhere to wick all through august he kept a steady course northeast north northwest by september he had turned due south he would be beating up east again by october november would find him in the valleys there was no reason why he shouldn't finish in december and come out in march mr waddington himself was surprised at the progress he had made it shows he said what we can do without ralph bevan and barbara seated on ralph's carrier explored the countryside and mapped out mr waddington's course for him she's worth a dozen ralph bevans he would say and he would go to the door with her and see her start you mustn't let yourself be victimized by ralph he said he glanced at the carrier do you think it's safe oh quite safe if it isn't it'll only be a bit more thrilling much better come in the car with me but barbara wouldn't go in the car with him when he talked about it she looked frightened and embarrassed her fright and her embarrassment were delicious to mr waddington he said to himself she doesn't think that's safe anyhow and as he watched her rushing away swaying exquisitely over a series of terrific explosions he gave a little skip and a half turn light and youthful in the porch of his manor End of chapter 8 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 9 of Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 9, Part 1 Sir John Corbett had called in the morning he had exerted himself to that extent out of friendship pure friendship for waddington and he had chosen an early hour for his visit to mark it as a serious and extraordinary occasion he sat now in the brown leather armchair which was twin to the one mr waddington had sat in when he had his portrait painted his jolly rosy face was subdued to something serious and extraordinary he had come to warn mr waddington that scandal was beginning to attach itself to his acquaintance he was going to say relations but remembered just in time that relations was a question begging word to his acquaintance with a certain lady to which mr waddington replied haughtily that he had a perfect right to choose his uh, acquaintance his acquaintance was preeminently his own affair quite so my dear fellow quite so but strictly between ourselves is it a good thing to choose acquaintances of the sort that give rise to scandal as a man of the world now between ourselves doesn't it strike you that the lady in question may be that sort it does not strike me said mr waddington and i see no reason why it should strike you i don't like the look of her said sir john quoting major markham if you're trying to suggest that she's not straight you're reading something into her look that isn't there oh come waddington you know as well as i do that when a man's knocked about the world like you and me he gets an instinct he can tell pretty well by looking at her whether a woman's that sort or not my dear corbett my instinct is at least as good as yours i've known mrs levitt for three years and i can assure you she's as straight as innocent as your wife or mine clever clever and a bit unscrupulous again sir john quoted major markham a woman like that can get round simple fellows like you and me waddington in no time if she gives her mind to it that's why i won't have anything to do with her she may be as straight and innocent as you please but somehow or other she's causing a great deal of unpleasant talk and if i were you i'd drop her drop her i shall do nothing of the sort my dear fellow that's all very well but when everybody knows your wife hasn't called on her 
there was no need for fanny to call on her my relations with mrs levitt were on a purely business footing well i'd leave them there and not too much footing either what can i do here she is a war widow with nobody but me to look after her interests she's got into the way of coming to me and i'm not going back on the poor woman corbett because of your absurd insinuations not my insinuations anybody's insinuations then nobody has a right to insinuate anything about me as for fanny she'll make a point of calling on her now we were talking about it not long ago a bit hard on mrs waddington to be let in for that you needn't worry fanny can afford to do pretty well what she likes he had him there sir john knew that this was true of fanny waddington as it was not true of lady corbett he could remember the time when nobody called on his father and mother and lady corbett could not yet afford to call on mrs levitt before anybody else did well he said so long as mrs levitt doesn't expect my wife to follow suit mrs levitt's experience can't have led her to expect much in the way of kindness here well don't be too kind you don't know how you may be landed you don't know said sir john fatally what ideas you may have put into the poor woman's head i should be very sorry said mr waddington if i thought for one moment i had roused any warmer feelings but he wasn't sorry he tried hard to make his face express a chivalrous regret and it wouldn't it was positively smiling so agreeable was the idea conveyed by sir john he turned it over and over drawing out its delicious flavour while sir john's little laughing eyes observed his enjoyment you don't know he said what you may have roused there was something very irritating in his fat chuckle you needn't disturb yourself these things will happen a woman may be carried away by her feelings but if a man has any tact and any delicacy he can always show her very well without breaking off all relations that would be clumsy of course if you want to keep up with her keep up with her only take care you don't get landed that's all you may be quite sure that for the lady's own sake i shall take care they rose mr waddington stood looking down at sir john in his little round stomach and his little round eyes with their obscene twinkle and for the life of him he couldn't feel the indignation he would like to have felt as his eyes encountered sir john's something secret and primitive in mr waddington responded to that obscene twinkle something reminiscent and anticipating something mischievous and subtle and delightful subversive of dignity it came up in his solemn face and simmered there here was corbett a thorough-paced man of the world and he took it for granted that mrs levitt's feelings had been roused he acknowledged handsomely as male to male the fascination that had aroused them he corbett knew what he was talking about he saw the whole possibility of romantic adventure with such flattering certitude that it was impossible to feel any resentment at the same time his interference was a piece of abominable impertinence and mr waddington resented that it made him more than ever determined to pursue his relations with mrs levitt just to show he wasn't going to be dictated to while the very fact that corbett saw him as a figure of romantic adventure intensified the excitement of the pursuit and though elise seen with certainty in the light of corbett's intimations was not quite so enthralling to the fancy as the elise of his doubt she made a more positive and formidable appeal to his desire he loved his desire because it made him feel young and loving it he thought he loved elise and what corbett was thinking markham and thurston and hawtrey and young hawtrey and granger would be thinking too they would all see him as the still young romantic adventurer the inspirer of passion and bevan but no he didn't want bevan to see him like that or rather he did and yet again he didn't he had scruples when it came to bevan because of fanny and because of fanny while he rioted in visions of the possible he dreaded more than anything an actual detection the raking eyes and furtive tongues of the townspeople if fanny called on mrs levitt it would stop all the talking that was how fanny came to know mrs levitt and how mrs levitt and toby came to be asked to the september garden party at lower wick manor part two mrs levitt of the white house wick on the hill gloucestershire she thought it sounded very well she had been out that is to say she had judged it more becoming to her dignity not to be at home when fanny called and fanny had been actually out when mrs levitt called 
so that they met for the first time at the garden party it's absurd our not knowing each other fanny said when my husband knows you so well i've always felt mrs waddington that i ought to know you if it's only to tell you how good he's been to me but of course you know it oh, i know it quite well he's always being good to people he likes it you must take off some of the credit for that she thought she has really very beautiful eyes a lot of credit would have to be taken off for her eyes too but isn't that said mrs levitt what being good is to like being it only i suppose that's just what lays him open she lowered the eyes whose brilliance had blazed a moment ago on fanny she toyed with her handbag smiling a little secret roguish smile that lays him open mrs levitt looked up smiling to the attacks of unscrupulous people like me it was risky but it showed a masterly boldness and presence of mind it was as if she and fanny waddington had had their eyes fixed on a live scorpion approaching them over the lawn and mrs levitt had stooped down and grasped it by its tail and tossed it into the lavender bushes as if mrs levitt had said my dear mrs waddington we both know that this horrible creature exists but we aren't going to let it sting us as if she knew why fanny had called on her and was grateful to her perhaps if mrs levitt had never appeared at that garden party or if having appeared she had never been introduced at their own request to major markham mr thurston mr hawtrey and young hawtrey and sir john corbett mr waddington might never have realized the full extent of her fascination she had made herself the centre of the party by her sheer power to seize attention and to hold it you couldn't help looking at her again and again where she sat in a clearing of the lawn playing the clever pointed play of her black and white black satin frock black satin cloak lined with white silk furred with ermine white stockings and long white gloves the close black satin hat clipping her head the vivid contrast and stress repeated in white skin black hair black eyes black eyes and fine mouth and white teeth making a charming and perpetual movement she had been talking to major markham for the last ten minutes displaying herself as the absurdly youthful mother of a grown-up son toby levitt a tall and slender likeness of his mother was playing tennis with distinction ignoring young horace his partner standing well up to the net and repeating the alternate smashing and sliding strokes that kept ralph and barbara bounding from one end of the court to the other mrs levitt was trying to reconcile the proficiency of toby's play with his immunity from conscription in the late war the war led straight to major markham's battery and major markham's battery to the battery once commanded by toby's father which led to Pune and the great discovery you don't mean frank levitt captain in the gunners i do was he by any chance stationed at Pune in nineteen ten eleven he was but bless my soul he was my brother-in-law dick dick benham's best friend the major's slightly ironical homage had given place to a serious excitement a respectful interest oh dicky benham is he rather i've heard him talk about frank levitt scores of times do you hear that waddington mrs levitt knows all my sister's people why on earth haven't we met before mr waddington writhed while between them they reeled off a long series of names people and places each a link joining up major markham and mrs levitt the major was so excited about it that he went round the garden telling thurston and hawtrey and corbett so that presently all these gentlemen formed round mrs levitt an interested and animated group mr waddington hovered miserably on the edge of it short of thrusting markham aside with his elbow markham for choice he couldn't have broken through he would give it up and go away and be drawn back again and again but though mrs levitt could see him plainly no summons from her beautiful eyes invited his approach his behaviour became noticeable it was observed chiefly by his son horry horry took barbara apart i say have you seen my governor no what where she could see by his face that he was drawing her into some iniquitous secret by-path of diversion there just behind you turn round this way but don't look as if you'd spotted him did you ever see anything like him he's like a newfoundland dog trying to look over a gate it wouldn't be half so funny if he wasn't so dignified all the time she didn't approve of horry he wasn't decent but the dignity it was wonderful horry went on 
what on earth did the mater ask that woman for she might have known he'd make a fool of himself oh horry you mustn't it's awful of you you really are a little beast i'm not fancy doing it at his own garden party he never thinks of us look at the dear little mater there pretending she doesn't see him that's what makes me mad barbara well you ought to pretend you don't see it too i've been pretending the whole blessed afternoon but it's no good pretending with you you jolly well see everything why don't go and draw other people's attention to it oh come how about ralph you know you wouldn't let him miss him ralph oh ralph's different i shouldn't point him out to lady corbett no more should i you're different too you and ralph and me are the only people capable of appreciating him though i wouldn't swear that the mater doesn't sometimes yes but you go too far horry you're cruel to him and we're not it's all very well for you he isn't your father oh lord he's craning his neck over markham's shoulder now what his face must look like from the other side if you found your father drunk under a lilac bush i believe you'd go and fetch me to look at him i would if he was as funny as he is now but i say you know i can't have him going on like that i've got to stop it somehow what would you do if you were me do i think i should ask him to go and take lady corbett in to tea good horry strode up to his father i say pater aren't you going to take lady corbett in to tea at the sheer sound of his son's voice mr waddington's dignity stood firm but he went off to find lady corbett all the same when it was all over the garden party was pronounced a great success and mr waddington was very agreeably rallied on his discovery taxed with trying to keep it to himself and warned that he wasn't going to have it all his own way it's our turn now said major markham to have a look in and their turn was constantly coming round again they were always looking in at the white house first major markham called then sir john corbett of underwoods mr thurston of the elms and mr hawtrey of medlicott called and brought their wives these ladies however didn't like mrs levitt and they were not at home when she returned their calls mrs levitt's visiting card had its place in three collections and there the matter ended but mr thurston and mr hawtrey continued to call with the delightful sense of doing something that their wives considered improper major markham as a bachelor his movements were more untrammelled declared it his ambition to cut waddy out he was everlastingly calling at the white house his fastidious correctness the correctness that hadn't liked the look of her excused this intensive culture of mrs levitt on the grounds that she was well connected she knew all his sister's people and mrs levitt took good care to let mr waddington know of these visits and of her little bridge parties in the evening just mr thurston and mr hawtrey and major markham and me he was teased and worried by his visions of elise perpetually surrounded by thurston and hawtrey and the major supposing only supposing that driven by despair of course she married that fellow markham for the first time in his life mr waddington experienced jealousy elise had ceased to be the subject of dreamy doubtful speculation and had become the object of an uneasy passion he could give her passion if it was passion that she wanted but because of fanny he could not give her a position in the county and it was just possible that elise might prefer a position and elise was happy happy in her communion with mr thurston and mr hawtrey and in the thought that their wives detested her happy in her increasing intimacy with major markham and in her consciousness of being well connected above all happy in mr waddington's uneasiness meanwhile fanny waddington kept on calling if i don't she said the poor woman will be done for she couldn't see any harm in mrs levitt part three barbara and ralph bevan had been for one of their long walks they were coming back down the park when they met first henry the gardener's boy carrying a basket of fat golden pears where are you going with those lovely pears henry mrs levitt's miss the boy grinned and twinkled you can almost have fancied that he knew farther on near the white gate they could see mr waddington and two ladies he had evidently gone out to open the gate and was walking on with them unable to tear himself away the ladies were mrs rickards and mrs levitt they stopped you could see the flutter of their hands and faces suggesting a final triangular exchange of playfulness 
then mr waddington executing a complicated movement of farewell a bow and a half turn a gambling skip the gesture of his ungovernable youth then as he went from them the abandonment of mrs rickards and mrs levitt to disgraceful laughter mrs levitt clutched her sister's arm and clung to it almost perceptibly reeling as if she said hold me up or i shall collapse it's too much too 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 much they came on with a peculiar rolling helpless walk rocked by the intolerable explosions of their mirth dabbing their mouths and eyes with their pocket handkerchiefs in a tortured struggle for control they recovered sufficiently to pass ralph and barbara with serious sidelong bows and then there was a sound a thin wheezing soaring yet stifled sound the cry of a conquered hysteria did you see that ralph i did i heard it he couldn't could he oh lord no they appreciate him too barbara that isn't the way she said we don't want him appreciated that way that rich gross way no it isn't nearly subtle enough any fool could see that his caracoling was funny they don't know him as we know him they don't know what he really is it was an outrage it's like taking a fine thing and vulgarizing it they'd no business and it was cruel too to laugh at him like that before his back was turned when they're going to eat his pears too the fact is barbara nobody does appreciate him as you and i do hoary no not hoary he goes too far hoary's indecent fanny perhaps sometimes fanny doesn't see one half of him she doesn't see his mrs levitt's side have you seen it barbara of course i have well you never told me it isn't fair to go discovering things on your own and not telling me we must make a compact to tell each other the very instant we see a thing we might keep count and give points to which of us sees most mrs levitt ought to have been a hundred to your score i'm afraid i can't score with mrs levitt you saw that too it'll be a game for the gods barbara but ralph there might be things we couldn't tell each other it mightn't be fair to him telling each other isn't like telling other people hang it all if we're making a study of him we're making a study science is science we've no right to suppress anything at any moment one of us might see something absolutely vital whatever we do we mustn't be unfair to him but he's ours isn't he we can't be unfair to him and we've got to be fair to each other think of the frightful advantage you might have over me you're bound to see more things than i do i might see more but you'll understand more well then you can't do it without me it's a compact isn't it that we don't keep things back as for mrs levitt's handling of their theme they resented it as an abominable profanation do you think he's in love with her barbara said what he would call being in love and we shouldn't do you think he's like that he's always been like that i think he was probably like that when he was young before he married fanny before he married fanny and after after i should imagine he went pretty straight it was only the way he had when he was young now he's middle-aged he's gone back to it just to prove to himself that he's young still i take it the poor old thing got scared when he found himself past fifty and he had to start a proof it's his egoism all over again i don't suppose he really cares a rap for mrs levitt you don't think his heart beats faster when he sees her coming i don't horatio's heart beats faster when he sees himself making love to her i see it's just middle age just middle age don't you think perhaps fanny does see it no not that not that at least i hope not end of chapter nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter ten part one of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter ten part one mr waddington's ramblings through the cotswolds were to be profusely illustrated the question was photographs or original drawings and he had decided after much consideration on photographs taken by pycraft's man for a book of such capital importance the work of an inferior or obscure illustrator was not to be thought of for an instant but there were grave disadvantages in employing a distinguished artist 
it would entail not only heavy expenses but a disastrous rivalry the illustrations so far from drawing attention to the text and fixing it firmly there would inevitably distract it and the artist's celebrated name would have to figure conspicuously in exact proportion to his celebrity on the title page and in all the reviews and advertisements where properly speaking horatio bysshe waddington should stand alone it was even possible as fanny very intelligently pointed out that a sufficiently distinguished illustrator might succeed in capturing the enthusiasm of the critics to the utter extinction of the author who might consider himself lucky if he was mentioned at all but fanny had shown rather less intelligence in using this argument to support her suggestion that barbara madden should illustrate the book she had more than once come upon the child sitting on a camp-stool above mrs levitt's house making a sketch of the steep street all cream white and pink and grey opening out on to the many-coloured fields and the blue eastern air and she had conceived a preposterous admiration for barbara madden's work it'll be an enchanting book if she illustrates it horatio if she illustrates it but when he tried to show fanny the absurdity of the idea horatio bysshe waddington illustrated by barbara madden she laughed in his face and told him he was a conceited old thing to which he replied with dignified self-restraint that he was writing a serious and important book it would be foolish to pretend that it was not serious and important he hoped he had no overweening opinion of its merits but one must preserve some sense of proportion and propriety some sanity oh, poor little barbara it isn't poor little barbara's book my dear no said fanny it isn't meanwhile if the book was to be ready for publication in the spring the photographs would have to be taken at once before the light and the leaves were gone so pyecraft and pyecraft's man came with their best camera and photographed and photographed as long as the fine weather lasted they photographed the market square wick on the hill they photographed the church they photographed lower wick village and the manor house the residence corrected to seat of mr horatio bysshe waddington the author they photographed the tudor porch showing the figures of the author and of mrs waddington his wife and miss barbara madden his secretary they photographed the author sitting in his garden they photographed him in his park mounted on his mare speedwell and they photographed him in his motor-car then they came in and looked at the library and photographed that with mr waddington sitting in it at his writing-table i suppose sir mr pyecraft said you'd wish it taken from one end to show the proportions certainly said mr waddington and when pyecraft came the next day with the proofs he said i think sir we've got the proportions very well mr waddington stared at the proofs holding them in a hand that trembled slightly with emotion with a just annoyance for though pyecraft had certainly got the proportions of the library mr waddington's head was reduced to a mere black spot in the far corner if that was what pyecraft meant by proportion i think he said the uh the figure is not quite satisfactory the oh i see sir i did not understand sir that you wished the figure well mr waddington didn't like to appear as having wished the figure so ardently as he did indeed wish it if i'm to be there at all quite so sir but if you wish the size of the library to be shown i am afraid the figure must be sacrificed we can't do you it both ways but how would you think sir of being photographed yourself somewhat larger seated at your writing-table we could do you that i hadn't thought of it pyecraft as a matter of fact he had thought of nothing else he had the title of the picture in his mind the author at work in the library lower wick manor pyecraft waited in deference to mr waddington's hesitation his man less delicate but more discerning was already preparing to adjust the camera mr waddington turned like a man torn between personal distaste and public duty to barbara what do you think miss madden well i think the book would hardly be complete without you very well you hear pyecraft miss madden says i am to be photographed very good sir he wheeled sportively now how am i to sit if you would set yourself so sir with your papers before you spread careless so and your pen in your hand so a little nearer 
bateman the figure is important this time now sir if you would be so good as to look up mr waddington looked up with a face of such extraordinary solemnity that mr pycraft smiled in spite of his deference a little brighter expression as if you had just got an idea mr waddington imagined himself getting an idea and tried to look like it perfect perfect mr pycraft almost danced with excitement keep that look on your face sir half a moment now bateman a click well that's over thank goodness said mr waddington reluctant victim of pycraft's and barbara's importunity after that mr pycraft and his man were driven about the country taking photographs in one of them mr waddington appeared standing outside the medieval market hall of chipping kingdon in another wearing fishing boots and holding a fishing rod in his hand he waded knee-deep in the trout stream between upper and lower speed and after that he said firmly i will not be photographed any more they've got enough of me part two in november when the photographing was done fanny went away to london for a fortnight leaving barbara as she said to take care of horatio and ralph bevan to take care of barbara it was then in consequence of letters he received from mrs levitt that mr waddington's visits in sheep street became noticeably frequent barbara sitting on her camp-stool above the white house noticed them she noticed too the singular abstraction of mr waddington's manner in these days there were even moments when he ceased to take any interest in his ramblings and left barbara to continue them as ralph had continued them alone reserving to himself the authority of supervision she had long stretches of time to herself when she had reason to suspect that mr waddington was driving mrs levitt to cheltenham or strafford on avon in his car while ralph bevan obeyed fanny's parting charge to look after barbara every time barbara did a piece of the rambling she showed it to ralph bevan they would ride off together into the open country and barbara would read aloud to ralph sitting by the roadside where they lunched or in some inn parlour where they had tea they had decided that though it would be dishonourable of barbara to show him the bits that mr waddington had written there could be no earthly harm in trusting him with the bits she had done herself not that you could tell the difference barbara had worked hard knowing that the sooner mr waddington's book was finished the sooner ralph's book would come out and under this agreeable stimulus she had developed into the perfect parodist of waddington she had wallowed in waddington's style till she was saturated with it and wrote automatically about bold escarpments and the rosy flush on the high forehead of cleave cloud about ivy-mantled houses resting in the shade of immemorial elms about the veil of the wind load awash with the golden light of even and grey villages nestling in the beech-clad hollows of the hills come with me said barbara into the little sheltered valley of the speed let us follow the brown trout stream that goes purling barbara it's priceless what made you think of purling he'd have thought of it purling through the lush green grass of the meadows or let us away along the great high road that runs across the uplands that divide the valleys of the windload and the thames let us rest a moment half-way and drink no quaff a mug of good gloucestershire ale with mine host of the merry mouth not that mr waddington had ever done such a thing in his life but all the other ramblers through the cotswolds did it or said they did it and he was saturated with their spirit as barbara was saturated with his he could see them robust and genial young men in tweed knickerbocker suits tramping their thirty miles a day and quaffing mugs of ale in every tavern and he desired to present himself like those young men as genial and robust he couldn't get away from them and their books any more than he had got away from sir maurice gedge and his prospectus and barbara had invented all sorts of robust and genial things for him to do she dressed him in pink and mounted him on his mare speedwell and sent him flying over the stone walls and five barred gates to the baying of ranter and ranger and bellman and true he fished and he tramped and he quaffed and he tramped again he did his thirty miles a day easily she set down long conversations between mr waddington and old billy the cotswold shepherd 
all about the good old cotswold days and the good old days when the good old squire mr waddington's father no his grandfather was alive i do call to mind sir what old squire did used to say to me billy he says your grandchildren won't be fed nor they won't have the cottages nor yet the clothes as you have in your children as sure as god's in gloucester he says they was rare old times sir and they be gone what made you think of it barbara i don't suppose he ever said two words to old billy in his life of course he didn't but it's the sort of thing he'd like to think he did has he passed it rather he's as pleased as punch he thinks he's forming my style part three mr waddington was rapidly acquiring the habit of going round to sheep street after dinner but in those evenings that he did not devote to mrs levitt he applied himself to his task of supervision on the whole he was delighted with his secretary there could be no doubt that the little thing was deeply attached to him you could tell that by the way she worked by her ardour and eagerness to please him there could be only one explanation of the ease with which she had received the stamp of his personality therefore he used tact he used tact i am giving you a great deal of work barbara he would say but you must look on it as part of your training you are learning to write good english there is nothing like clear easy flowing sentences you can't have literature without em i might have written those passages myself in fact i can hardly distinguish his face shook over it she noticed the tremor of imminent revision still i think i should prefer babbling streams here to purling streams shakespearean i had babbling first said barbara but i thought purling would be nearer to what you'd have written yourself i forgot about shakespeare and babbling isn't exactly purling is it true true babbling is not purling we want the exact word purling let it be and lush good girl you remembered that lush was one of my words i thought it would be good you see said mr waddington how you learn you're getting the sense the flair for style i shall always be glad to think i trained you barbara and you may be very grateful it is i and not ralph bevan of all the jerky eccentric incoherent end of chapter ten Recording by Expatria in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 11, Section 1 of Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 11, Section 1. It was Monday, the 24th day of November in the last week of fanny's fortnight in london barbara had been busy all morning with mr waddington's correspondence and accounts and now for the first time she found herself definitely on the track of mrs levitt in checking palmer and hoskins's the cheltenham builders bill for the white house she had come across two substantial items not included in their original estimate no less than fifteen by eight feet of trellis for the garden and a hot water pipe rail for the bathroom it turned out that mrs levitt desiring the comfort of hot towels and objecting to the view of the kitchen yard as seen from the lawn had incontinently ordered the hot water rail and the trellis there was that letter from messrs jackson and cleaver mr waddington's agents informing him that his tenant mrs levitt of the white house wick on the hill had not yet paid her rent due on the twenty fifth of september did mr waddington wish them to apply again and there were other letters of which barbara was requested to make copies from his dictation thus my dear mrs levitt only he had written my dear elise with reference to your investments i do not recommend the purchase at the present moment of government housing bonds i shall be very glad to loan you the fifty pounds you require to make up the five hundred for the purchase of parsons provincial and london bank shares but i am afraid i cannot definitely promise an advance of five hundred on the securities you name that promise was conditional and you must give me a little time to consider the matter meanwhile i will make inquiries but speaking off-hand i should say that owing to the present general depreciation of stock it would be highly unadvisable for you to sell out and my advice to you would be hold on to everything you've got i am very glad you are pleased with your little house 
we will let the matter of the rent stand over till your affairs are rather more in order than they are at present with kindest regards very sincerely yours horatio bish waddington p s i have settled with palmer and hoskins for the trellis and hot water rail to messrs lawson and rutherford solicitors nine bedford row london w c dear sirs will you kindly advise me as to the current value of the following shares namely fifty five pound five per cent new south american rubber syndicate fifty ten pound ten per cent b preference addison railway nicaragua one hundred one pound four per cent welbeck mutual assurance society would you recommend the holder to sell out at present prices and should i be justified in accepting these shares as security for an immediate loan of five hundred faithfully yours horatio bish waddington he was expecting elise for tea at four o'clock on wednesday and messrs lawson and rutherford's reply reached him very opportunely that afternoon dear sir re your inquiry in your letter of the twenty-fifth instant as to the current value of five per cent new south american rubber syndicate shares ten per cent b preference addison railway and four per cent welbeck mutual assurance society respectively we beg to inform you that these stocks are seriously depreciated and we doubt whether at the present moment the holder would find a purchaser we certainly cannot advise you to accept them as security for the sum you name we are faithfully lawson and rutherford it was clear that poor elise who could never have had any head for business was deceived as to the value of her securities it might even be that with regard to all three of them she might have to cut her losses and estimate her income minus the dividends accruing from this source but that only made it the more imperative that she should have at least a thousand pounds tucked snugly away in some safe investment nothing short of the addition of fifty pounds to her yearly income would enable at least to pay her way the dear woman's affairs ought to stand on a sound financial basis and mr waddington asked himself this question was he prepared to put them there all that elise could offer him failing her depreciated securities was the reversion of a legacy of five hundred pounds promised to her in her aunt's will she had spoken very hopefully of this legacy was he prepared to fork out a whole five hundred pounds on the off chance of elise's aunt dying within a reasonable time and making no alteration in her will in a certain contingency he was prepared he was prepared to do all that and more for elise but it was not possible it was not decent to state his conditions to elise beforehand and in any case mr waddington did not state them openly as conditions to himself he allowed his mind to be muzzy on this point he had no doubt whatever about his passion but he preferred to contemplate the possibility of its satisfaction through a decent veil of muzziness when he said to himself that he would like to know where he stood before committing himself it was as near as he could get to clarity and candor and when he wrote to elise that his promise was conditional he really did mean that the loan would depend on the value of the securities offered a condition that his integrity could face a condition that as things stood he had a perfect right to make while all the time deep inside him was the knowledge that if elise gave herself to him he would not ask for security he would not make any conditions at all he saw elise tender and yielding in his arms he saw himself tender and powerful stooping over her and he thought with a qualm of disgust i wouldn't touch her poor little legacy meanwhile he judged it well to let the correspondence pass like any other business correspondence through his secretary's hands it was well to let barbara see that his relations with mrs levitt were on a strictly business footing that he had nothing to hide it was well to have copies of the letters it was well mr waddington's instinct not his reason told him it was well to have a trustworthy witness to all these transactions a witness who understood the precise nature of his conditions in the event the highly unlikely event of trouble with elise later on it was almost as if secretly he had a premonition also when his conscience reproached him as it did with making conditions with asking the dear woman for security he was able to persuade himself that he didn't really mean it that all this was clever camouflage designed to turn barbara's suspicions if she ever had any off the scent 
and at the same time he was not sorry that barbara should see him in his role of generous benefactor and shrewd adviser i needn't tell you barbara that all this business is strictly private as my confidential secretary you have to know a great many things it wouldn't do to have talked about you understand perfectly she understood too that it was an end of the compact with ralph bevan she must have foreseen this affair when she said to him that there would be things she simply couldn't tell only she had supposed they would be things she would see reward of clear eyesight not things she would be regularly let in for knowing and her clear eyes saw through the camouflage she had a suspicion i don't see she said why you should have to go without your rent just because mrs levitt doesn't want to pay it she was sorry for waddy he might be ever so wise about mrs levitt's affairs but he was a perfect goose about his own no wonder fanny had asked her to take care of him i've no doubt he said she wants to pay it but she's a war widow barbara and she's hard up i can't rush her for the rent well she's no business to rush you for trellis work and water pipes you didn't order well well he couldn't be angry with the child she was so loyal so careful of his interests and he couldn't expect her to take kindly to elise there would be a natural jealousy that's palmer and hoskins mistake i can't haggle with the lady barbara noblesse oblige but he winced under her clear eyes she thought how about the fifty and the five hundred at this rate noblesse might oblige him to do anything she could see through mrs levitt mr waddington kept on looking at the clock it was now ten minutes to four and at any moment elise might be there his one idea was to get barbara madden out of the way those clear eyes were not the eyes he wanted to be looking at elise to be looking at him when their eyes met and he understood that that fellow bevan was going to call for her at four he didn't want him about where are you going for your walk he said oh anywhere why well if you happen to be in wick would you mind taking those photographs back to pyecraft and showing him the ones i've chosen just see that he doesn't make any stupid mistake the photographs were staring her in the face on the writing table so that there really was no excuse for her forgetting them as she did but mr waddington's experience was that if you wanted anything done you had to do it yourself End of chapter 11, section 1. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 11, part 2 of Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter 11, part 2 elise would be taken into the drawing-room he went to wait for her there and as he walked up and down restless listening for the sound of her feet on the gravel drive and the ringing of the bell at each turn of his steps he was arrested by his own portrait it stared at him from its place above fanny's writing-table handsome with its brilliant black and carmine it gave him an uneasy sense of rivalry as if he felt the disagreeable presence of a younger man in the room he stared back at it he stared at himself in the great looking-glass over the chimney-piece beside it he remembered fanny saying that she liked the iron grey of his moustache and hair it was more becoming than all that hard shiny black fanny was right it was more becoming and his skin the worn bloom of it like a delicate sprinkling of powder better more refined than that rich high red of the younger man in the gilt frame to be sure his eyes blurred onyx bulged out of creased pouches but his nose the postlethwaite nose a very handsome feature lifted itself firmly above the fleshy sagging of the face his lips pouted in pride he could still console himself with the thought that mirrors were unfaithful elise would see him as he really was not that discoloured and distorted image he pushed out his great chest and drew a deep robust breath at the thought of elise the pride the rich voluptuous youthful pride of life mounted and as he turned again he saw fanny looking at him the twenty-year-old fanny in her girl's white frock and blue sash her tilted gainsborough face mischievous and mocking smiled as if she were making fun of him his breath caught in his chest fanny fanny his wife why hadn't his wife the loyalty and intelligence of barbara 
the enthusiasm the seriousness of elise he needn't have any conscientious scruples on fanny's account she had driven him to elise with her frivolity her eternal smiling of course he knew that she cared for him that he had power over her that there had never been and never would be any other man for fanny but he couldn't go on with fanny's levity for ever he wanted something more something sound and solid something that elise gave him and no other woman any man would want it and yet fanny's image made him uneasy watching him there smiling as if she knew all about elise and smiled pretending not to care he didn't want fanny to watch him with elise he didn't want elise to see fanny when he looked at fanny's portrait he felt again his old repugnance to their meeting he didn't want elise to sit in the same room with fanny to sit in fanny's chair the drawing-room was fanny's room the red dahlia and powder blue parrot chintz was fanny's choice every table cabinet and chair was in the place that fanny had chosen for it the book the frivolous book she had been reading before she went away lay on her little table fanny was fanny and elise was elise he rang the bell and told partridge to show mrs levitt into the library and to bring tea there the library was his room he could do what he liked in it the girl fanny laughed at him out of the corners of her eyes as he went suddenly he felt tender and gentle to her because of elise when elise came she found him seated in his armchair absorbed in a book he rose in a dreamy attitude as if he were still dazed and abstracted with his reading thus at the very start he gave himself the advantage he showed himself superior to elise intellectually and morally superior you're deep in it i'm interrupting she said he came down from his height instantly he was all hers no i was only trying to pass the time till you came i'm late then ten minutes he smiled indulgent elise was looking handsomer than ever the light november chill had whipped a thin flush into her face he watched her as she took off her dark skunk furs and her coat how delightful to watch a woman taking off her things the pretty gestures of abandonment the form emerging slimmer that was one of the things you thought and couldn't say supposing he had said it to elise would she have minded what are you thinking of she said how did you know i was thinking of anything your face it tells tales only nice ones to you my dear lady ah but you didn't tell would you like me to not if it's naughty your face looks naughty he wheeled delighted now how does my face look when it's naughty oh that would be telling it's just as well you shouldn't know was it as naughty as all that then yes or as nice they kept it up lightly till partridge and annie trinder came tinkling and rattling with the tea-things outside the door as if mr waddington thought they meant to warn them partridge he called as the butler was going partridge if sir john corbett calls you can show him in here but i'm not at home to anybody else clever idea that he isn't coming is he the tiresome old thing no he isn't if i thought he was for one minute i wouldn't be at home then why why did i say i would be because i wanted to make it safe for you elise thus tactfully he let it dawn on her that he might be dangerous we don't want to be interrupted do we he said not by sir john corbett he drew up the big padded sofa square before the fire for elise all his movements were unconscious innocent of deliberation and design he seated himself top heavily behind the diminutive gate-legged tea-table the teapot and cups were like doll's things in his great hands she looked at him at his slow fingers fumbling with the sugar tongs would you like me to pour out tea for you she said he started visibly he wouldn't like it at all he wasn't going to allow elise to put herself into fanny's place pouring out tea for him as if she was his wife she wouldn't have suggested it if she had had any tact or any delicacy no he said the no sounded hard and ungracious you must really let me have the pleasure of waiting on you the sugar dropped from the tongs he fumbled again madly and elise smiled damn the tongs he thought damn the sugar take it in your fingers goose she said goose an endearment a caress it softened him his tenderness for elise came back my fingers are all thumbs he said 
your thumbs then you don't suppose i mind there was meaning in her voice and mr waddington conceived himself to be on the verge of the first exquisite intimacies of love he left off thinking about fanny he poured out tea and handed bread and butter in a happy dream he ate and drank without knowing what he ate and drank his whole consciousness was one muzzy heavy sense of the fullness and nearness of elise he could feel his ears go vroom vroom and his voice thicken as if he were slightly very slightly drunk he wondered how elise could go on eating bread and butter he heard himself sigh when at last he put her cup down he considered the position of the tea-table in relation to the sofa it hemmed in that part of it where he was going to sit very cramping he moved it well back and considered it again it now stood in his direct line of retreat from the sofa to the armchair an obstruction if anybody were to come in he moved it to one side that's better he said now we can get a clear view of the fire it isn't too much for you elise he had persuaded himself that he had really moved the tea-table because of the fire as yet he had no purpose and no plan he didn't know what on earth he was going to say to elise he sat down beside her and there was a sudden hushed pause elise had turned round in her seat and was looking at him her eyes were steady behind the light tremor of their lashes brilliant and profound he reflected that her one weak point the shortness of her legs was not noticeable when she was sitting down he also wondered how he could ever have thought her mouth hard it moved with a little tender sensitive twitch like the flutter of her eyelids and he conceived that she was drawn to him and held trembling by his fascination she spoke first mr waddington i don't know how to thank you for your kindness about the rent but you know it's safe don't you of course i know it don't talk about rent don't think about it oh, i can't help it i can't think of anything else until it's paid i'd rather you never paid any rent at all than that you should worry about it like this i didn't ask you to come here to talk business elise i'm afraid i must talk about it just a little not now he said firmly i won't listen it sounded exactly as if he said he wouldn't listen to any more talk about rent but he thought i don't know what i shall do if she begins about that five hundred but she hardly can after that anyhow i shall decline to discuss it tell me what you've been doing with yourself oh you can't do much with yourself in wick i trot about my house my dear little house that you've made so nice for me i do my marketing and i go out to tea with the parson's wife or the doctor's wife or mrs bostock or mrs granger i didn't know you went to the grangers he thought that was not very loyal of elise you must go somewhere well and in the evenings we play bridge who plays bridge mr hawtrey or mr thurston or young hawtrey and toby and major markham and me always major markham well he comes a good deal he likes coming does he do you mind i should mind very much if i thought it would make any difference any difference she frowned and blinked as though she were trying hard to see what he meant what he possibly could mean by that difference she said to what to you and me well, of course it doesn't not a scrap how could it no how could it i don't really believe it could but why should it she persisted why indeed ours is a wonderful relation a unique relation and i think you want as much as i do to to keep it intact of course i want to keep it intact i wouldn't for worlds let anything come between us certainly not bridge she meditated i suppose i do play rather a lot there's nothing else to do you see and you get carried away i hope my dear you don't play for money oh well it isn't much fun for the others if we don't you don't play high i hope what do you call high well breaking into pound notes pound notes penny points well ten shillings is a very high stake when we're reckless and going it besides i always play against markham and hawtrey because i know they won't be hard on me if i lose now that's what i don't like i'd a thousand times rather pay your gambling debts than have you putting yourself under an obligation to those men he couldn't bear it he couldn't bear to think that elise could bear it you should have come to me he said i have come to you haven't i she thought of the five hundred pounds he thought of them too ah that's different now about these debts to markham and hawtrey how much do they come to about oh a five-pound note would cover all of it 
but i shall only be in debt to you we'll say nothing about that if i pay it elise will you promise me you'll never play higher than penny points again oh it's too angelic of you really he smiled he liked paying her gambling debts he liked the power it gave him over her he liked to think that he could make her promise he liked to be told he was angelic it was all very cheap at five pounds and it would enable him to refuse the five hundred with a better grace come on your word of honour only penny points on my word of honour but oh i don't think i can take it she thought of the five hundred when you wanted five hundred it was pretty rotten to be put off with a fiver if you can take it from hawtrey and markham that's it i can't take it from markham i haven't done that i can't do it well hawtrey then hawtrey's different why is he different a faint suspicion relating to markham troubled him and not for the first time well you see he's a middle-aged married man he might be my uncle he thought and markham he might be but elise was not in love with the fellow no no he was sure of elise he knew the symptoms you couldn't mistake them but she might marry markham all the same out of boredom out of uncertainty out of desperation he was not going to let that happen he would make it impossible he would give elise the certainty she wanted now you said i was different playful reproach but she would understand so you are you're a married man too aren't you i thought we'd agreed to forget it forget it forget mrs waddington yes forget her you knew me long before you knew fanny what has she got to do with you and me just this that she's the only woman in the county who'll know me because you're my friend elise you needn't remind me i'm not likely to forget that any good thing that's come to me here has come through you i don't want anything but good to come to you through me he leaned forward you're not very happy in wick are you happy oh yes but it's not what you'd call wildly exciting and toby's worrying me he says he can't stand it and he wants to emigrate well why not mr waddington's heart gave a great thump of hope he saw it all clearly toby was the great obstruction elise might have held out forever as long as toby lived with her but if toby went she saw it too that was why she consented to his going it isn't much of a job for him bostock's bank no she assented no i've told him he can go if he can get anything he played stroking the long tails of her fur it lay between them like a soft supine animal would you like to live in cheltenham elise cheltenham if i took a little house for you he had calculated that he might just as well lose his rent in cheltenham as in wick better besides he needn't lose it he could let the white house it would partly pay for cheltenham one of those little houses in montpelier place oh it's too sweet of you to think of it she began playing too stroking the fur animal their hands played together over the sleek softness consciously shyly without touching but why cheltenham cheltenham isn't wick no but it's just as dull and stuffy stuffier beautiful little town elise what's the good of that when it's crammed full of school children and school teachers and decayed army people and old maids i don't know anybody in cheltenham can't you see that that would be the advantage no i can't see it there's only one place i want to live in and that is london and i can't why not after all london was not such a bad idea he had thought of it before now himself well i don't know whether i told you that i'm not on very good terms with my husband's people they haven't been at all nice to me since poor frank's death oh poor elise they live in london and they want to keep me out of it my father-in-law gives me a small allowance on condition i don't live there they hate me she said smiling as much as all that is it a large allowance no it's a very small one but they know i can't get on without it you ought not to be dependent on such people perhaps in a flat or one of those little houses in st john's wood it would be too heavenly but what's the good of talking about it you must know what i want to do for you elise i want to make you happy to put you safe above all these wretched worries to take care of you dear you will let me won't you oh my dear mr waddington my dear friend the dark eyes brightened 
she saw a clear prospect of the five hundred compared with what old waddy was proposing such a sum and a mere loan too represented moderation the moment had come very happily for reopening this question i can't let you do anything so so extensive really and truly all i want is just a temporary loan if you really could lend me that five hundred you said i didn't say i would and i didn't say i wouldn't i said it would depend why well, no but you never said on what if the securities i offered you aren't good enough there's the legacy he was silent he knew now that his condition had had nothing to do with the securities he must know he would know where he stood my aunt said elise gently is very old i wouldn't dream of touching your poor little legacy he said it with passion won't you drop all this sordid talk about business and trust me i do trust you the little white hand left off stroking the dark fur and reached out to him he took it and held it tight it struggled to withdraw itself you aren't afraid of me he said no but i'm afraid of partridge coming in and seeing us he might think it rather odd he won't come in it doesn't matter what partridge thinks oh doesn't it he won't come in he drew a little closer to her he will he will he'll come and clear away the things i hear him coming he got up and went to the door of the smoke-room to the further door and looked out there's no one there he said they don't come till six and it isn't five yet elise abstract your mind one moment from partridge if i get that little house in london will you live in it i can't let you you make me ashamed after all you've done for me it's too much it isn't if i take it will you let me come and see you oh yes but she shrank so far as elise could be said to shrink a little further back into her corner it's rather far from wick he said still i could run up once in he became pensive in three weeks or so for the day i should be delighted no not for the day he was irritated with this artificial obtuseness for the weekend for the week sometimes when i can manage it i shall say it's business she drew back and back as if from his advance her head tilted her eyes glinting at him under lowered lids taking it all in yet pretending a paralysis of ignorance she wanted to see to see how far he would go before she she wanted him to think she didn't understand him even now it was this half fascinated backward gesture that excited him he drew himself close close elise it's no use pretending you know what i mean you know i want you he stooped over her covering her with his great chest he put his arms round her in my arms you know you want me she felt his mouth pushed out to her mouth as it retreated trying to cover it to press down she gave a cry oh oh you and struggled beating him off with one hand while the other fumbled madly for a pocket-handkerchief his grip slackened he rose to his feet but he still stooped over her penning her in with his outstretched arms his weight propped by his hands laid on the back of the sofa you old imbecile she spurted she could afford it in one rapid flash of intelligence she had seen that whatever happened she could never get that five hundred pounds down and to surrender to old waddy without it to surrender to old waddy at all when she could marry freddie markham would be too preposterous even if there hadn't been any freddie markham it would have been preposterous at that moment as she said it while he still held her prisoned and they stared into each other's faces she spurting and he panting barbara came in he started jerked himself upright mrs levitt recovered herself you silly cuckoo she said you don't know how ridiculous you look she had found her pocket handkerchief and was dabbing her eyes and mouth with it rubbing off the uncleanness of his impact how ridiculous <laughs> she shook with laughter barbara pretended not to see them to have gone back at once closing the door on them would have been to admit that she had seen them instead she moved quickly yet abstractedly to the writing-table took up the photographs and went out again mr waddington had turned away and stood leaning against the chimney-piece hiding his head poor old ostrich in his hands his attitude expressed a dignified sorrow and a wronged integrity barbara stood for a collected instant at the door and spoke i'm sorry i forgot the photographs as if she said 
cheer up old thing i didn't really see you through the closed door she heard mrs levitt's laughter let loose malignant shrill hysterical a horrid sound i'm sorry elise but i thought you cared for me you'd no business to think and it wasn't likely i'd tell you oh, you didn't tell me my dear how could you but you made me believe you wanted me wanted do you suppose i wanted to be made ridiculous love isn't ridiculous said mr waddington it is it's the most ridiculous thing there is and when you're making it if you could have seen your face oh dear if you wouldn't laugh quite so loud the servants will hear you i mean them to hear me confound you elise that's right swear at me swear at me oh, i'm sorry i swore but hang it all it's every bit as bad for me as it is for you worse i fancy you needn't think miss madden didn't see you because she did it's a pity miss madden didn't come in a little sooner sooner i think she chose her moment very well if she had heard the whole of our conversation i think she'd have realized there was something to be said for me there isn't anything to be said for you and until you've apologized for insulting me you've heard me apologize as for insulting you no decent woman in the circumstance ever tells a man his love insults her even if she can't return it and even if he's another woman's husband even if he's another woman's husband if she's ever given him the right right do you think you bought the right to make love to me she rose confronting him no i thought you'd given it me i was mistaken he helped her to put on the coat that she wriggled into with clumsy irritated movements clumsy the woman was clumsy he wondered how he had never seen it and vulgar noisy and vulgar you never knew what a woman was like till you'd seen her angry he had answered her appropriately and with admirable tact he had scored every point he was scoring now with his cool imperturbable politeness he tried not to think about barbara your fur thank you he rang the bell partridge appeared tell kimber to bring the car round and drive mrs levitt home thank you mr waddington i'd rather walk partridge retired she held out her hand mr waddington bowed abruptly not taking it he strode behind her to the door through the smoke-room to the further door in the hall partridge hovered he left her to him and as she followed partridge across the wide lamp-lighted space he noticed for the first time that elise in her agitation waddled like a duck a greedy duck like that horrible sister of hers bertha rickards then he thought of barbara madden end of chapter eleven part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eleven parts three and four of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eleven part three when ralph called for barbara he told her first thing that he had heard from mcintyres the publishers about his book he had sent it them two-thirds finished and greville burton greville burton barbara had read it and reported very favourably mcintyres had agreed to publish it if the end was equal to the beginning and the middle it was this exciting news thrown at her before she could get her hat on that had caused barbara to forget all about mr waddington's photographs and mr waddington's book and mr waddington until she and ralph were halfway between wick on the hill and lower speed there was nothing for it then but to go on taking care to get back in time to take the photographs to pycraft before the shop closed there hadn't been very much time but barbara said she could just do it if she made a dash and it was the dash she made that precipitated her into the scene of mr waddington's affair ralph waited for her at the white gate we must sprint she said if we're to be in time they sprinted as they walked slowly back barbara became thoughtful as long as she lived she would remember waddington the stretched out arms the top heavy body bowed to the caress the inflamed and startled face staring at her like some strange fish over mrs levitt's shoulder the mouth dropping open as if it called out to her go back 
what depths of fatuity he must have sunk to before he could have come to that and the sad figure leaning on the chimney-piece whipped beaten by mrs levitt's laughter the high coarse malignant laughter that had made her run to the smoke-room door to shield him to shut it off what wouldn't ralph have given to have seen him it was all very well for ralph to talk about making a study of him he hadn't got further than the merest outside fringe of his great subject he didn't know the bare rudiments of waddington he had had brilliant flashes of his own but no sure sight of the reality and it had been given to her barbara to see it all at once she had penetrated at one bound into the thick of him they had wondered how far he would go and he had gone so far so incredibly far above and beyond himself that all their estimates were falsified and she saw that her seeing was the end the end of their game hers and ralph's the end of their compact the end of the tie that bound them she found herself shut in with waddington the secret that she shared with him shut ralph out it was intolerable that all this rich exciting material should be left on her hands lodged with her useless when she thought of what she and ralph could have made of it together if only she could have given it him but of course she couldn't she had always known there would be things she couldn't give him she would go on seeing more and more of them odd that she didn't feel any moral indignation it had been too funny like catching a child in some amusing naughtiness and as poor waddy's eyes and open mouth had intimated she had had no business to catch him to know anything about it no business to be there ralph she said you must let me off the compact he turned laughing why have you seen something it doesn't matter whether i have or haven't it was a sacred compact but if i can only keep it by being a perfect pig he looked down at her face her troubled unnaturally earnest face of course if you feel like that about it you'd feel like that if you were his confidential secretary and had all his correspondence yes yes i see barbara it won't work i'll let you off the compact we can go on with him just the same we can't what not make a study of him no we don't know what we're doing it isn't safe we may come on things any day like the thing you came on just now i didn't say i'd come on anything all right you didn't he shall be our unfinished book barbara he'll be your unfinished book i finished mine all right anything else would be simply appendix you think you've got him complete well fairly complete oh barbara don't tempt me ralph after all he said we were only playing with him well we mustn't do it again never any more never any more i know it's a game for gods but it's a cruel game we must give it up you mean we must give him up yes we've hunted and hounded him enough we must let him go that's the compact is it yes we shall break it barbara see if we don't we can't keep off him part four mr waddington judged that after all owing to his consummate tact he had scored in the disagreeable parting with mrs levitt but when he thought of barbara little barbara a flush mounted to his face his ears his forehead he could feel it wave after wave of hot unpleasant shame he went slowly back to the library and shut himself in with the tea-table and the sofa and the cushions crushed deeply hollowed with the large pressure of elise he wondered how much barbara had taken in at what precise moment she had appeared he tried to reconstruct the scene he had been leaning over elise he could see himself leaning over her enclosing her and elise's head stiffened drawing back from his kiss worse than the sting of her repugnance was the thought that barbara had seen it and his attitude his really very compromising attitude had she had she the door now it was at right angles to the sofa perhaps barbara hadn't caught him fair he went to the door and came in from it to make certain yes yes from that point it was no good pretending that he couldn't be seen but barbara had rushed in like a little whirlwind and she had gone straight to the writing-table turning her back she wouldn't have had time to take it in 
it was at the chimney-piece before she had turned again before she could have seen him he must have recovered himself when he heard her coming she couldn't charge in like that without being heard he must have been standing up well apart from elise not leaning over her by the time barbara came in he tried to remember what barbara had said when she went out she had said something he couldn't remember what it was but it had sounded reassuring now surely if barbara had seen anything she wouldn't have stopped at the door to say things she would have gone straight out without a word in fact she wouldn't have come in at all she would have drawn back the very instant that she saw she would simply never have penetrated as far as the writing-table he remembered how coolly she had taken up the photographs and gone out again as if nothing had happened probably then as far as barbara was concerned nothing had happened then he remembered the horrible laughing of elise barbara must have heard that she must have wondered she might just have caught him with the tail of her eye not enough to swear by but enough to wonder and afterwards she would have put that and that together and he would have to dine with her alone that evening to face her young clear candid eyes he didn't know how he was going to get through with it and yet he did get through to begin with barbara was very late for dinner she had thought of being late as a way of letting mr waddington down easily she would come in smiling and apologetic palpably in the wrong having kept him waiting and he would be gracious and forgive her and his graciousness and forgiveness would help to reinstate him he would need she reflected a lot of reinstating barbara considered that in the matter of punishment he had had enough mrs levitt with her you old imbecile had done to him all and more than all that justice could require there was a point of humiliation beyond which no human creature should be asked to suffer to be caught making love to mrs levitt and being called an old imbecile and then to be pelted with indecent laughter and in any case it was not her barbara's place to punish him or judge him she had had no business to catch him no business in the first instance to forget the photographs therefore she really wanted him not to know that she had caught him she went on behaving as if nothing had happened all through dinner she turned the conversation on to topics that would put him in a favourable or interesting light she avoided the subject of fanny she asked him all sorts of questions about his war work tell me she said some of the things you did when you were a special constable and he told her his great story to be sure she knew the best part of it already because ralph had told it it had been one of his scores over her but she wanted him to remember it she judged that it was precisely the sort of memory that would reinstate him faster than anything for really he had played a considerable part well you could see by his face that he was gratified one of the things we had to do was to drive about the villages and farms after dark to see that there weren't any lights showing it was nineteen yes nineteen sixteen in the winter must have been winter because i was wearing my british warm with a fur collar and there was a regular scare on air raids no tramps we'd been fairly terrorized by a nasty dangerous sort of tramp the police were looking for two of these fellows discharged soldiers we'd a warrant out for their arrest robbery and assault with violence well you may call it violence one of em had thrown a pint pot at the landlord of the king's head and hurt em and they'd bolted with two bottles of beer and a tin of player's navy cut they'd made off goodness knows where we couldn't find em i was driving to daunton on a very nasty pitch-black night you know how beastly dark it is between the woods at byford park well i just got there when i passed two fellows skulking along under the wall they stood back it was rather a near shave with no proper lights on and i flashed my electric torch full on them blessed if they weren't the very chaps we were looking for and i'd got to run em in somehow all by myself and two to one it wasn't any joke i can tell you goodness knows what nasty knives and things they might have had on em what did you do do i drove on fifty yards ahead and pulled up the car outside the porter's lodge at byford then i got out and came on and met em they were trying to bolt into the wood when i turned my torch on them again and shouted halt in a parade voice they halted hands up to the salute i thought the habit would be too much for them when they heard the word of command i said you've got to come along with me didn't know how on earth i was going to take them if they wouldn't go 
and they'd started dodging so i tried it on again halt regular parade stunt and they halted again all right then i harangued them i said shun you blighters i'm a special constable and i've got a warrant here for your arrest i hadn't i'd nothing but an inland revenue income tax form but i whipped it out of my breast pocket and trained my light on the royal arms at the top that was enough for em then i shouted again in my parade voice right about face quick march and i got them marching i marched them the two miles from byford through lower speed and up the hill to wick and into the police station and we ran em in for robbery and assault it was clever of you no nothing but presence of mind and bluff and showing that you weren't going to stand any nonsense but i don't suppose corbett or hawtrey or any of those chaps would have thought of it barbara wondered supposing i were to turn on him and say you old humbug you know i don't believe a word of it you know you didn't march him a hundred yards or i saw you this afternoon what would he look like it was inconceivable that she should say these things if she was to go on with her study of him alone she would have to go on in the spirit they had begun in she and ralph that spirit admitted nothing but boundless amusement boundless joy in him moral indignation would have been a false note it would have been downright irreverence towards the god who made him what if he did omit to mention that the nasty dangerous fellows turned out to be two feeble youths half imbecile with shell-shock and half drunk and that it was mr hawtrey arriving opportunely in his car who took them over the last mile to the police station as it happened mr waddington had frankly forgotten these details as inessential to his story he had marched them a mile after telling it he was so far re-established in his own esteem as to propose their working together on the ramblings after dinner he even ordered coffee to be served in the library as if nothing had happened there unfortunately by some culpable oversight of annie trinder's the cushions still bore the imprint of elise awful realization came to him when barbara with a glance at the sofa declined to sit on it he had turned just in time to catch the flick of what in a bantering mood he had once called her barbaric smile after all she might have seen something not mrs levitt's laughter but the thought of what barbara might have seen was his punishment that and being alone with her knowing that she knew end of chapter eleven part four recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eleven section five of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter eleven part five all this had happened on a wednesday and fanny wouldn't be back before saturday he had three whole days to be alone with barbara he had thought that no punishment could be worse than that but as the three days passed and barbara continued to behave as though nothing had happened he got used to it it was on a friday night as he lay awake reviewing for the hundredth time the situation that his conscience pointed out to him how he really stood there was a worse punishment than barbara's knowing if fanny knew there were all sorts of ways in which she might get to know barbara might tell her the two were as thick as thieves and if the child turned jealous and hysterical she had never liked elise or she might tell ralph bevan and he might tell fanny or he might tell somebody who would tell her there were always plenty of people about who considered it their duty to report these things of course if he threw himself on barbara's mercy and exacted a promise from her not to tell he knew she would keep it but supposing all the time she hadn't seen or suspected anything supposing her calm manner came from a mind innocent of all seeing and suspecting then he would have given himself away for nothing besides even if barbara never said anything there was elise no knowing what elise might do or say in her vulgar fury she might tell toby or markham and the two might make themselves damnably unpleasant the story would be all over the county in no time and there were the servants supposing one of the women took it into her head to give notice on account of goings-on he couldn't live in peace so long as all or any of these things were possible 
the only thing was to be beforehand with barbara and bevan and elise and toby and markham and the servants to tell fanny himself before any of them could get in first the more he thought about it the more he was persuaded that this was the only right the only straightforward and manly thing to do at the same time it occurred to him that by suppressing a few unimportant details he could really give a very satisfactory account of the whole affair it would not be necessary for instance to tell fanny what his intentions had been if indeed he had ever had any for as he went again and again over the whole stupid business his intentions those that related to the little house in cheltenham or st john's wood tended to sink back into the dream state from which they had arisen clearing his conscience more and more from any actual offence he had in fact nothing to account for but his attitude the rather compromising attitude in which barbara had found him and that could be very easily explained away fanny was not one of those exacting jealous women she would be ready to accept a reasonable explanation of anything and you could always appease her by a little attention so on friday afternoon mr waddington himself drove the car down to wick station and met fanny on the platform he made tea for her himself and waited on her moving assiduously and smiling an affectionate yet rather conscious smile he was impelled to these acts spontaneously because of that gentleness and tenderness towards fanny which the bare thought of elise was always enough to inspire him with thus by sticking close to fanny all the evening he contrived that barbara should have no opportunity of saying anything to her and in the last hour before bedtime when they were alone together in the drawing-room he began he closed the door carefully behind barbara and came back to his place scowling like one overpowered by anxious thought he exaggerated this expression on purpose so that fanny should notice it and give him his opening which she did well old thing what are you looking so glum about do i look glum dismal what is it he stood upright before the chimney-piece his conscience sustained by this posture of rectitude i'm not quite easy about barbara he said barbara what on earth has she been doing she's been doing nothing it's it's rather what she may do if you don't stop her i don't want to stop her said fanny if you're thinking of ralph bevan ralph bevan i certainly am not thinking of him neither is she well then what i was thinking of myself my dear you surely don't imagine that barbara's thinking of you not not in the way you imply the fact is i was let in for a, a rather unpleasant scene the other day with mrs levitt i always thought said fanny that woman would let you in for something well well i hardly know how to tell you about it my dear why was it as bad as all that perhaps i'd better not know i want you to know i'm trying to tell you because of barbara i can't see where barbara comes in she came into the library while it was happening fanny laughed and it disconcerted him while well, what was happening she said you'd better tell me straight out i don't suppose it was anything like as bad as you think it was i'm only afraid of what barbara might think oh you can trust barbara not to think things she never does dear fanny he would have found his job of explaining atrociously difficult with any other woman any other woman would have entangled him tighter and tighter but he could see that fanny was trying to get it straight to help him out with all his honour and self-respect and dignity intact every turn she gave to the conversation favoured him my dear i'm afraid she saw something that i must say was open to misinterpretation it wasn't my fault but no the better he remembered it the more clearly he saw it was elise's fault not his and he could see that fanny thought it was elise's fault this suggested the next step in the course that was only not perjury because it was so purely instinctive the subterfuge of terrified vanity it seemed to him that he had no plan that he followed fanny upon my word i'd tell you straight out fanny only i don't like to give the poor woman away mrs levitt said fanny you needn't mind you may be quite sure that she'll give you away if you don't she was giving him a clear lead when he began he had really had some thoughts of owning somewhere about this point that he had lost his head but when it came to the point 
he saw that this admission was unnecessarily quixotic and that he would be far safer if he suggested that elise had lost hers in fact it was fanny who had suggested it in the first place it might not be altogether a fair imputation but hang it all it was the only one that would really appease fanny and he had fanny to think of and not elise he owed it her for her sake he must give up the personal luxury of truth-telling the thing would go no further with fanny and it was only what fanny had believed herself in any case and always would believe elise would be no worse off as far as fanny was concerned so he fairly let himself go there's no knowing what she may do he said she was in a thoroughly hysterical state she'd come to me with her usual troubles not able to pay her rent and so on and in talking she became very much upset and uh, uh, lost her head and took me completely by surprise that he thought she certainly did you mean you lost yours too said fanny mildly i did nothing of the sort but i was rather alarmed before you could say knife she'd gone off into a violent fit of hysterics and i was just trying to bring her round when barbara came in his explanation was so much more plausible than the reality that he almost believed it himself i think he said pensively that she must have seen me bending over her and she didn't offer to help no she rushed in and she rushed out again she may not have seen anything but in case she did i wish my dear you'd explain i think i'd better not said fanny in case she didn't no but it worries me every time i think of it she came right into the room besides he said we've got to think of mrs levitt mrs levitt yes put yourself in her place she wouldn't like it supposed that i was making love to her she might consider the whole thing made her look as ridiculous as it made me i'd forgotten mrs levitt's point of view you rather gave me to understand that that was what she wanted i never said anything of the sort seeing that the explanation was going so well he could afford to be magnanimous i must have imagined it said fanny she recovered i suppose and you got rid of her yes i got rid of her all right well said fanny gathering herself up to go to bed i shouldn't worry any more about it i'll make it straight with barbara she went up to barbara's bedroom where barbara still dressed sat reading over the fire come in you darling barbara said she got up and crouched on the hearthrug leaving her chair for fanny fanny came in and sat down barbara she said what's all this about horatio and mrs levitt i don't know said barbara flatly with sudden presence of mind i said you didn't but the poor old thing goes on and on about it he thinks you saw something the other day something you didn't understand did you barbara said nothing she stared away from fanny did you of course i didn't of course you did he says you must have seen and it's worrying him no end i saw something but he needn't worry i understood all right what did you see nothing nothing that mattered it matters most awfully to me i don't think it needs said barbara but it does in a sense i don't mind what he does and in a sense i do i still care enough for that i don't think there was anything you need mind so awfully yes but there was something he said there was he was afraid you'd misunderstand it he said he was bending over her when you came in well he was bending a bit what was she doing she was laughing in hysterics she saw it all i suppose you might call it hysterics they weren't nice hysterics though she isn't a nice woman no but he was making love to her and she was laughing at him she was nice enough for that if that's nice why what else could the poor woman do if she's honest oh she's honest enough in that way said barbara and he couldn't see it he's so intent on his own beautiful postlethwaite nose he can't see anything that goes on under it still honest or not honest she's a beast barbara when they'd been such pals and he'd helped her to have gone and rounded on the poor thing like that she might just as well have pulled his postlethwaite nose it couldn't have hurt more oh i think he'll get over it i mean it couldn't have hurt me more she is a beast said barbara i bet you anything you like it's her fault she drove him to it no barbara it was my fault i drove him i'm always laughing at him and he can't bear being laughed at it makes him feel all stuffy and middle-aged he only goes in for passion because it makes him feel young 
it isn't really passion said barbara no you wise thing it isn't if it was i could forgive him i could forgive it if he felt really young it's this ghastly affectation i can't stand but it's my fault barbara my fault i should have kept him young they sat silent barbara at fanny's feet presently fanny drew the girl's head down on to her lap you'll never be old barbara she said and ralph won't what made you think of ralph fanny horatio of course End of chapter 11 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 12 of Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Chapter 12, Part 1 If any rumor circulated round Wick on the Hill, sooner or later it was bound to reach the old lady at the dower house the dower house was the redistributing centre for the news of the district thus mr waddington heard that mrs levitt was talking about letting the white house furnished that she was in debt to all the tradesmen in the place that her rent at mrs trinder's was still owing that her losses at bridge were never paid for he heard that if major markham had been thinking of mrs levitt he had changed his mind there was even a definite rumour about a broken engagement anyhow major markham was now paying unmistakable attentions to the youngest miss hawtrey of medlicott but as engagement or no engagement his attentions to mrs levitt had been unmistakable too their rupture required some explanation it was supposed that the letter which the major's mother old mrs markham of medlicott received from her daughter mrs dick benham of tunbridge wells did very thoroughly explain it there had been things in that letter which mrs markham had not been able to repeat but you gathered from her singular reticence that they had something to do with dick benham and mrs levitt and that they showed conclusively that elise was not what old mrs waddington called a nice woman they say she led frank levitt an awful life the benhams my dear won't have her in the house but all this was trivial compared with the correspondence that now passed between mr waddington and elise he admitted now that old corbett had known what he was talking about when he had warned him that he would be landed landed if he didn't take care to the tune of five hundred and fifty five pounds his letters to mrs levitt dictated to barbara madden revealed the care he had to take from motives which appeared to him chivalrous he had refrained from showing barbara mrs levitt's letters to him he left her to gather their crude substance from his admirable replies my dear mrs levitt i am afraid i must advise you to give up the scheme if it depends on my cooperation. i thought i had defined my position Define my position is good i think it sounds good said barbara that position remains what it was and as your exceptionally fine intelligence cannot fail to understand it no more need be said at least i hope it is so i should be sorry if our very pleasant relations terminated in disappointment for one instant she could see him smile feeling voluptuously the sharp bright edge of his word before it cut him he drew back scowling above a sudden sombre flush of memory disappointment said barbara giving him his cue disappointment is not quite the word i want something something more chivalrous his eyes turned away from her pretending to look for it ah now i have it very pleasant relations terminated on a note on a note of on an unexpected note with kind regards very sincerely yours horatio bish waddington you will see barbara that i am saying precisely the same thing but saying it inoffensively as a gentleman should forty-eight hours later he dictated dear mrs levitt no i have no suggestion to make except that you curtail your very considerable expenditure for the rest believe me it is as disagreeable for me to be obliged to refuse your request as i am sure it must be for you to make it hm rest request that won't do as disagreeable for me to have to refuse as it must be for you to ask simpler that never use an elaborate phrase where a simple one will do you are good enough to say i have done so much for you in the past i have done what i could but you will pardon me if i say there is a limit beyond which i cannot go 
sincerely yours horatio b waddington i've sent her a cheque for fifty-five pounds already that ought to have settled her settled her you don't mean to say you sent her a cheque i did you oughtn't to have sent her anything at all but i'd promised it barbara i don't care you ought to have waited i wanted to close the account and have done with her that isn't the way to close it sending cheques that cheque will have to go through parson's bank supposing toby sees it what if he does he might object he might even make a row about it what could i do i had to pay her you could have made the cheque payable to me it would have passed as my quarter's salary i could have cashed it and you could have given her notes and if toby remembered their numbers you could have changed them for ten shilling notes in cheltenham all those elaborate precautions you can't be too precautious when you're dealing with a woman like that is this all you've given her all yes did you ever give her anything any other time well possibly from time to time have you any idea of the total amount i can't say offhand and i can't see what it has to do with it it has everything to do with it can you find out certainly if i look up my old cheque-books you'd better do that now he turned gloomily to his writing-table the cheque-books for the current year and the year before it betrayed various small loans to mrs levitt amounting in all to a hundred and fifty pounds odd oh dear said barbara all that's down against you still it's all ante wednesday what a pity you didn't pay her that fifty-five before your interview how do you mean it's pretty certain she's misinterpreted your paying it now so soon after the interview do you really think she misunderstood me barbara i think she wants you to think she did you think she's trying trying to to sell you her silence yes i do good god i never thought of that blackmail i don't suppose for a minute she thinks she's blackmailing you she's just trying it on and she may raise her price too she won't rest till she's got that five hundred out of you mrs levitt's next communication would appear to have supported barbara's suspicion for mr waddington was compelled to answer it thus dear mrs levitt you say you were right then and that my promises were conditional you could tell where the inverted commas came by the biting clip of his tone i fail to appreciate the point of this allusion i cannot imagine what conditions you refer to i made none as for promises i am not responsible for the somewhat restricted interpretation you see fit to put on a friend's general expressions of good will yours truly horatio bish waddington his last letter a day later never got as far as its signature dear madam my decision will not be affected by the contingency you suggest you are at perfect liberty to say what you like nobody will believe you that i think is as far as i can go much too far said barbara and that's taking her too seriously much you mustn't send that letter why not because it gives you away gives me away it seems to me most guarded it isn't it implies that there are things she might say even if you don't mind her saying them you mustn't put it in writing ah oh there's something in that of course i could threaten her with a lawyer's letter but somehow the fact is barbara if you're a decent man you're handicapped in dealing with a lady delicacy there are things that could be said material things most material to the case but i can't say them no you can't say them but i can i think i could stop the whole thing in five minutes if i saw mrs levitt will you leave it to me oh come i don't know why not i assure you it'll be all right well perhaps it's a matter of business a pure matter of business it certainly is that there's no reason why you shouldn't hand it over to your secretary he hesitated he was still afraid of what elise might say to barbara you will understand that she is in a very unbalanced state excitable a woman in that state is apt to put interpretations on the most innocent um acts she won't be able to put on any after i've done with her if it comes to that i can put on interpretations too mr waddington then at barbara's dictation wrote a short note to mrs levitt inviting her to call and see him that afternoon at three o'clock part two
at three o'clock barbara was ready for her she had assumed for the occasion her war office manner that firm sweetness with which she used to stand between importunate interviewers and her chief it had made her the joy of her department mr waddington is extremely sorry he is not able to see you himself he is engaged with his agent at the moment mr waddington had indeed created that engagement engaged but i have an appointment yes he's very sorry he said if there was anything i could do for you thank you miss madden if it's all the same to you i'd much rather see mr waddington himself i can wait i wouldn't advise you to i'm afraid he may be a long time he has some very important business on hand just now my business said mrs levitt is very important oh if it's only business barbara said i think we can settle it at once i've had most of the correspondence in my hands and i think i know all the circumstances you have had the correspondence in your hands well you see i'm mr waddington's secretary that's what i'm here for i didn't know he trusted his private business to his secretary he's obliged to he has so much of it you surely don't expect him to copy out his own letters i don't expect him to hand over my letters to other people to read i haven't read your letters mrs levitt i've merely taken down his answers to copy out and file for reference then my dear miss madden you don't know all the circumstances at any rate i can tell you what mr waddington intends to do and what he doesn't you want to see him i suppose about the loan for the investment mrs levitt was too profoundly disconcerted to reply barbara went on in her firm sweetness i know he's very sorry not to be able to do more but as you know he did not advise the investment and he can't possibly advance anything for it beyond the fifty pounds he has already paid you since you know so much about it said mrs levitt with a certain calm subdued truculence you may as well know everything you are quite mistaken in supposing that mr waddington did not advise the investment on the contrary it was on his representations that i decided to invest and it was on the strength of the security he offered that my solicitors advanced me the money he is responsible for the whole business he has made me enter into engagements that i cannot meet without him and when i ask him to fulfil his pledges he lets me down i don't think mr waddington knows that your solicitors advanced the money there is no reference to them in the correspondence i think if you'll look through your files or if mr waddington will look through his you'll find you are mistaken i can tell mr waddington what you've told me and let you know what he says if you don't mind waiting a minute i can let you know now she sought out mr waddington in his office luckily it was situated in the kitchen wing the one farthest from the library she found him alone in it the agent had gone sitting in a hard windsor chair he knew that elise couldn't pursue him into his office it was even doubtful whether she knew where it was he had retreated into it as into some impregnable position not that he looked safe his face sagged more than ever as though the postlethwaite nose had withdrawn its support from that pale flesh of funk if it had any clear meaning at all it expressed a terrified expectation of blackmail his very moustache and hair drooped lamentably are you disengaged she said yes but for god's sake don't tell her that it's all right she knows she isn't going to see you well she felt the queer pathetic clinging of his mind to her as if it realized that she held his honour and fanny's happiness in her hands she's not going to give up that five hundred without a struggle the deuce she isn't on what grounds does she claim it she says you advised her to make a certain investment and that you promised to lend her half the sum she wanted i made no promise i said perhaps that sum might be forthcoming i made it very clear that it would depend on circumstances on circumstances that she understood knew about uh on circumstances that no she didn't know about them still you made conditions no i made a uh, mental reservation she seems to be aware of the circumstances that influenced you she thinks you've gone back on your word i've gone back on nothing my word's sacred the woman lies she sticks to it that the promise was made that on the strength of it she invested a certain sum of money through her solicitors that they advanced the money on that security and you advised the investment 
i did not advise it i advised her to give it up i wrote to her you took down the letter oh no you didn't i copied that one myself have you got it i'd better show it her yes it's it's confound it it's in my private drawer can't i find it he hesitated he didn't like the idea of anybody even little barbara rummaging in his private drawer but he had to choose the lesser of two evils and that letter would put the matter beyond a doubt here's the key he said and gave it her it's dated october the thirtieth or thirty first but it's all humbug i've reason to believe that money was never invested at all it's all debts she hasn't a leg to stand on not a leg not a stump said barbara leave her to me she went back to the library mrs levitt's face lifted itself in excited questioning one moment mrs levitt after a slightly prolonged search in mr waddington's private drawer she found the letter of october the thirty first and returned with it to the office it was very short and clear my dear elise i cannot promise anything it depends on circumstances but if you send me the name and address of your solicitors it might help take it he said and show it her part three barbara went back again to the library in her final battle with elise this time she had armed herself with the cheque-books mrs levitt began well mr waddington says he is very sorry if there's been any misunderstanding i don't know whether you remember getting this letter from him mrs levitt blinked hard as she read the letter of course i remember you see that he could hardly have stated his position more clearly but this letter is dated october the thirty first the promise i refer to was made long after that it doesn't appear so from his letters all that i've taken down if you can show me anything in writing writing mr waddington is a gentleman and he was my friend i never dreamed of pinning him down to promises in writing i thought his word was enough i never dreamed of his going back on it and after compromising me the way he's done barbara's eyebrows lifted delicately innocently has he compromised you he has how never mind how quite enough to start all sorts of unpleasant stories you shouldn't listen to them people will tell stories without anything to start them that doesn't make them any less unpleasant i should have thought the very least mr waddington could do would be to pay you compensation there can be no compensation in a case of this sort miss madden i'm not talking about compensation mr waddington must realize that he cannot compromise me without compromising himself well, i should think he would realize it you know well then he ought to realize that he is not exactly in a position to repudiate his engagements do you consider that you are in a position exactly to hold him to engagements he never entered into i've told you already that he has let me in for engagements that i cannot meet if he goes back on his word i see and you want to make it unpleasant for him as unpleasant as you possibly can i can make it even more unpleasant for him miss madden than it is for me what after all the compromising i think so if for instance i chose to tell somebody what happened the other day what you saw yourself did i see anything you can't deny that you saw something you were not meant to see you mean wednesday afternoon well if mr waddington chose to say that i saw you in a bad fit of hysterics i shouldn't deny that i see you're well posted miss madden i am rather but supposing you told everybody in the place he was caught making love to you what good would it do you excuse me we're not talking about the good it would do me but the harm it would do him same thing said barbara supposing you told everybody and nobody believed you everybody will believe me you forget that those stories have been going about long before wednesday all the better for mr waddington and all the worse for you you were compromised before wednesday then why if you didn't like being compromised did you consent to come to tea alone with him when his wife was away i came on business as you know you came to borrow money from a man who had compromised you if you're so careful of your reputation i should have thought that would have been the last thing you'd have done you're forgetting my friendship with mr waddington you said business just now friendship or business or business and friendship i don't think you're making out a very good case for yourself mrs levitt but 
supposing you did make it out and supposing mr waddington did lose his head and was making love to you on wednesday do you imagine people here are going to take your part against him he's not so popular in wick as all that he mayn't be but his cast is immensely popular with the county which i suppose is all you care about you must remember mrs levitt that he's mr waddington of wick you're not fighting one mr waddington but three hundred years of waddingtons you're up against all his ancestors i don't care that for his ancestors said mrs levitt with a gesture of the thumb you may not i certainly don't but other people do major markham the hawtreys the thurstons even the corbett's do you suppose they're all going to turn against him because he lost his head for a minute on a wednesday ten to one they'll all think and say you made him do it i made him preposterous not so preposterous as you imagine you must make allowances for people's prejudices if you wanted to stand clear you shouldn't have taken all that money from him all that money indeed a loan a mere temporary loan for an investment he recommended not only that loan but barbara produced the cheque-books with their damning counterfoils look here twenty-five pounds on the thirty-first of january and here october last year and july and january before that more than a hundred and fifty altogether how are you going to account for that and who's going to believe that mr waddington paid all that for nothing if some particularly nasty person gets up and says he didn't you see what a horrible position you'd be in don't you mrs levitt didn't answer her face thickened slightly with a dreadful flush her nerve was going barbara watched it go she followed up her advantage and supposing i were to tell everybody his friend major markham say that you were pressing him for that five hundred immediately after the affair of wednesday on threats of exposure wouldn't that look very like blackmail blackmail really miss madden i don't suppose you mean it for blackmail i'm only pointing out what it'll look like it won't look well much better face the facts you can't do mr waddington any real harm short of forcing his wife to get a separation there was a black gleam in mrs levitt's eyes precisely and supposing since we are supposing i told mrs waddington of his behaviour too late mr waddington has told her himself his own version certainly his own version and supposing i gave mine do whatever you say it'll be your word against ours and she won't believe you if she did she'd think it was all your fault and remember i have the evidence for your attempts at blackmail i don't think said barbara going to the door and opening it there's anything more to be said mrs levitt walked out with her agitated waddle barbara followed her amicably to the front door there elise made her last stand good afternoon miss madden i congratulate mr waddington on the partnership barbara rushed to the relief of the besieged in his office redoubt it's all over she shouted at him joyously mr waddington did not answer all at once he was still sitting in his uneasy windsor chair absorbed in meditation he had brought out a little note from his inmost pocket and as he looked at it he smiled it began thus and its date was the saturday following that dreadful wednesday my dear mr waddington after the way you have stood by me and helped me in the past i cannot believe that it is all over and that i can come to you my generous friend and be repulsed he looked up how did she behave barbara oh she wanted to bite to bite badly but i drew all her teeth very gently one by one teeth elise's teeth drawn by barbara he tore the note into little bits and as he watched them flutter into the waste-paper basket he sighed he rose heavily let's go and tell fanny all about it said barbara end of chapter twelve recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirteen of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter thirteen part one i hope you realize horatio that it was barbara who got you out of that mess barbara showed a great deal of intelligence 
but you must give me credit for some tact and discretion of my own mr waddington said as he left the drawing-room was he tactful and discreet his first letters said barbara were masterpieces of tact and discretion before he saw the danger afterwards i think his nerve may have gone a bit whose wouldn't it was clever of you barbara all the same it must have been rather awful going for her like that yes now that it was all over barbara saw that it had been awful rather like a dog-fight she had been going round and round rolling with mrs levitt in the mud so much mud that for purposes of sheer cleanliness it hardly seemed to matter which of them was top dog at the finish all she could see was that it had to be done and there wasn't anybody else to do it you see fanny went on she had a sort of case he was making love to her and she didn't like it it doesn't seem quite fair to turn on her after that she did all the turning i wouldn't have said a thing if she hadn't tried to put the screw on somebody had got to stop it yes fanny said yes still i wish we could have let her go in peace there wasn't any peace for her to go in and she wouldn't have gone she'd have been here now with his poor thumb in her screw after all fanny i only pointed out how beastly it would be for her if she didn't go and i only did that because he was your husband and it was your thumb really yes darling yes i know what you did it for oh i wish she wasn't so horribly badly off well so do i then it wouldn't have happened but how can you be such an angel to her fanny i'm not i'm only decent i hate using our position to break her poor back telling her we're waddingtons of wick and she's only mrs levitt it was the handiest weapon and you didn't use it i'm not a waddington of wick besides it's true she can't blackmail him in his own county you don't seem to realize how horrid she was and how jolly dangerous no fanny said i don't realize people's horridness as for danger i don't want to disparage your performance barbara but she seems to me to have been an easy prey you are disparaging me said barbara i'm not i only don't like to think of you enjoying that nasty scrap i only enjoyed it on your account and i oughtn't to grudge you your enjoyment when we reap the benefit i don't know what horatio would have done without you i shuddered to think of the mess he'd have made of it himself he was making rather a mess of it barbara said when i took it on well said fanny i dare say i'm a goose perhaps i ought to be grateful to mrs levitt if he was on the lookout for adventures it's just as well he hit on one that'll keep him off it for the future she'd have been far more deadly if she'd been a nice woman if he must make love only then he couldn't very well have done it barbara said oh couldn't he you never can tell what a man'll do once he's begun said fanny part two meanwhile mrs levitt stayed on having failed to let her house for the winter she seemed to be acting on barbara's advice and refraining from any malignant activity for no report of the waddington affair had as yet penetrated into the tea-parties and little dinners at wick on the hill punctually every friday evening mr thurston of the elms and either mr hawtrey or young hawtrey of medlicott turned up at the white house for their bridge if mrs dick benham chose to write venomous letters about elise levitt to old mrs markham that was no reason why they should throw over an agreeable woman whose hospitality had made wick on the hill a place to live in so long as she behaved decently in the place they kept it up till past midnight now that mrs levitt had had the happy idea of serving a delicious supper at eleven she had paid her debts of honour with mr waddington's five pounds the fifty she reserved in fancy for the cost of the chickens and the trifles in the sauterne in mr thurston and the hawtreys the bridge habit and the supper habit and what billy hawtrey called the levity habit was so strong that it overrode their sense of loyalty to major markham the impression created by mrs dick benham only heightened their enjoyment in doing every friday what mrs thurston and mrs hawtrey persisted in regarding as a risky thing there was no harm in elise levitt they said so every friday after midnight respectable householders sleeping on either side of the white house were wakened by the sudden opening of her door by shrill good nights called out from the threshold and answered by bass voices up the street by the shutting of the door and the shriek of the bolt as it slid to 
and the rector went about saying in his genial way that he liked mrs levitt that she was well connected and that there was no harm in her so long as any parishioner was a frequent attendant at church and a regular subscriber to the coal and blanket club and a reliable source of soup and puddings for the poor it was hard to persuade him that there was any harm in them fanny waddington said of him that if beelzebub subscribed to his coal and blanket club he'd ask him to tea he had a stiff face for uncharitable people elise was received almost ostentatiously at the rectory as a protest against scandal-mongering and he made a point of stopping to talk to her when he met her in the street this might have meant the complete rehabilitation of elise but that the rector's geniality was too indiscriminate too perfunctory too christian as fanny put it to afford any sound social protection and ultimately the approval of the rectory was disastrous to elise letting her in as she afterwards complained bitterly for miss gregg meanwhile it helped her with people like mrs bostock and mrs cleaver and mrs jackson who wanted to be charitable and to stand well with the rector then in the december following the waddington affair wick was astonished by the friendship that sprang up suddenly between mrs levitt and miss gregg the governess at the rectory there was a reason for it there always is a reason for these things and mrs bostock named it when she named young billy hawtrey friendship with mrs levitt provided miss gregg with unlimited facilities for meeting billy who was always running over from medlicott to the white house miss gregg's passion for young billy hung by so slender so nervous and so insecure a thread that it required the continual support of conversation with an experienced and sympathetic friend miss gregg had never known anybody so sympathetic and so experienced as mrs levitt the first time they were alone together she had seen by elise's face that she had some secret like her own miss gregg meant major markham and that she would understand and one strict confidence leading to another before very long miss gregg had captured that part of elise's secret that related to mr waddington it was through miss gregg's subsequent activities that it first became known in wick that mrs levitt had referred to mr waddington as that horrible old man this might have been very damaging to mr waddington but that annie trinder at the manor had told her aunt mrs trinder that mr waddington spoke of mrs levitt as that horrible woman and had given orders that she was not to be admitted if she called it was then felt that there might possibly be more than one side to the question then bit by bit through the repeated indiscretions of miss gregg the whole affair of mrs levitt and mr waddington came out it travelled direct from miss gregg to the younger miss hawtrey of medlicott and finally reached sir john corbett by way of old hawtrey who had it from his wife who didn't believe a word of it sir john didn't believe a word of it either at any rate that was what he said to lady corbett to himself he wondered whether there wasn't something in it he would give a good deal to know and he made up his mind that the next time he saw waddington he'd get it out of him he saw him the very next day ever since that dreadful wednesday an uneasy mind had kept mr waddington forever calling on his neighbours he wanted to find out from their behaviour and their faces whether they knew anything and how much they knew he lived in perpetual fear of what that horrible woman might say or do the memory of what he had said and done that wednesday no longer disturbed his complete satisfaction with himself he couldn't think of elise as horrible without at the same time thinking of himself as the pure and chivalrous spirit that had resisted her automatically he thought of himself as pure and chivalrous and in the rare but beastly moments when he did remember what he had done and said to elise and what elise had done and said to him when he felt again her hand beating him off and heard her voice crying out you old imbecile automatically he thought of her as cold some women were like that cold deficient in natural feeling only an abnormal coldness could have made her repulse him as she did she had told him to his face in her indecent way that love was the most ridiculous thing he couldn't for the life of him understand how a thing that was so delightful to other women could be ridiculous to elise but there it was absolutely abnormal that 
his vanity received immense consolation in thinking of elise as abnormal his mind passed without a jolt or a jar from one consideration to its opposite elise was cold and he was normally and nobly passionate elise was horrible and he was chivalrously pure whichever way he had it he was consoled but you couldn't tell in what awful light the thing might present itself to other people it was this doubt that drove him to underwoods one afternoon early in january ostensibly to deliver his greetings for the new year after tea sir john lured him into his library for a smoke the peculiar smile and twinkle at play on his fat face should have warned mr waddington of what was imminent they puffed in an amicable silence for about two minutes before he began ever see anything of mrs levitt now mr waddington raised his eyebrows as if surprised at this impertinence he seemed to be debating with himself whether he would condescend to answer it or not no he said presently i don't taken my advice and dropped it have you i should say rather it dropped itself i'm glad to hear that waddington i'm very glad to hear it i always said you know you'd get landed if you didn't look out my dear corbett i did look out you don't imagine i was going to be let in more than i could help why is after the event what mr waddington thought he's trying to pump me he was determined not to be pumped corbett should not get anything out of him after what event fanny's called several times but she doesn't care to keep it up neither to tell the honest truth do i why sir john was twinkling at him in his exasperating way why because my dear fellow the woman's going about everywhere seeing she's given you up i don't care said mr waddington what she says quite immaterial to me you mayn't care but your friends do waddington it's very good of them but they can save themselves the trouble he thought he isn't going to get anything out of me oh come you don't suppose we believe a word of it they looked at each other sir john thought i'll get it out of him and mr waddington thought i'll get it out of him you might as well tell me what you're talking about he said my dear chap it's what mrs levitt's talking about that's the point mrs levitt yes she's a dangerous woman waddington i told you you were doing a risky thing taking up with her like that and there's hawtrey doing the same thing the very same thing but he's a middle-aged man so i suppose he thinks he's safe but if he was ten years younger hang it all waddington if i was a younger man i shouldn't feel safe i shouldn't really i can't think what there is about her there's something yes said mr waddington there's something something he wasn't going to let corbett think him so middle-aged that he was impervious to its charm what is it said sir john she isn't handsome yet she gets all the young fellows running after her there was markham and thurston and there's young hawtrey it's only sober old chaps like me who don't get landed upon my word waddington i shouldn't blame you if you had lost your head mr waddington felt shaken in his determination not to let corbett get it out of him it was also clear that if he did admit to having for one wild moment lost his head corbett would think none the worse of him he would then be classed with markham and young billy whereas if he denied it he would only rank himself with old fossils like corbett and he couldn't bear it there was such a thing as doing yourself an unnecessary justice sir john watched him hovering round the trap he had laid for him absolutely between ourselves he said did you under mr waddington's iron-grey moustache you could see the rabelaisian smile answering the rabelaisian twinkle for the life of him he couldn't resist it well between ourselves corbett absolutely to be perfectly honest i did there is something about her just for a second you know it didn't come to anything didn't it she says you made violent love to her i won't swear what i wouldn't have done if i hadn't pulled myself up in time at this point it occurred to him that if elise had betrayed the secret of his love-making she would also have told her own tale of its repulse that had to be accounted for i can tell you one queer thing about that woman corbett she's cold cold oh come waddington you wouldn't think it i don't said sir john with a loud guffaw but i assure you my dear corbett she simply wouldn't talk of making love you might as well make love to 
to a chair or a cabinet i can tell you markham's had a lucky escape i don't imagine that's what put him off said sir john he knew something what do you suppose he knew something the benhams told them i fancy they'd some queer story rather think she ran after dicky and mrs benham didn't like it don't know what she wanted with him couldn't have been in love with him i will say that for her well she seems to have preferred their bungalow to her own anyhow they couldn't get her out of it i don't believe that story we must be fair to the woman corbett he thought he had really done it very well not only had he accounted honourably for his repulse but he had cleared a lease and he had cleared himself from the ghastly imputation of middle age repulse or no repulse he was proud of his spurt of youthful passion and in another minute he had persuaded himself that his main motive had been the desire to be fair to elise hm i don't know about being fair said sir john anyhow i congratulate you on your lucky escape mr waddington rose to go of course about what i told you you won't let it go any further sir john laughed out loud of course i won't only wanted to know how far you went might have gone farther and fared worse what he rose too laughing if anybody tries to pump me i shall say you behave very well so you did my dear fellow so you did considering the provocation he could afford to laugh he had got it out of poor old waddington as he said he would but to the eternal honour of sir john corbett it did not go any further when people tried to get it out of him he simply said that there was nothing in it and that to his certain knowledge waddington had behaved very well as barbara had prophesied nobody believed that he had behaved otherwise it was not for nothing that he was mr waddington of wick and in consequence of the revelations she had made to her friend miss gregg very early in the new year elise found other doors closed to her besides the markhams and the waddingtons and behind the doors on each side of the white house respectable householders could sleep in their beds on friday nights without fear of being wakened by the opening and shutting of mrs levitt's door and by the shrill good nights called out from its threshold and answered up the street the merry bridge parties and the little suppers were no more even the rector's geniality grew more and more christian and perfunctory till he too left off stopping to talk to mrs levitt when he met her in the street part three mr waddington's confession to sir john was about the only statement relating to the waddington affair which did not go any further thus a very curious and interesting report of it reached ralph bevan through colonel granger when he heard for the first time of the part barbara had played in it in the story elise had told in strict confidence to miss gregg mr waddington had been deadly afraid of her and had beaten a cowardly retreat behind barbara's big guns not that either elise or miss gregg would have admitted for one moment that her guns were big colonel granger had merely inferred the deadliness of her fire from the demoralization of the enemy your little lady bevan he said seems to have come off best in that encounter we needn't worry any more about the compact barbara now i know about it ralph said as they walked together snow had fallen the cotswolds were all white netted with the purplish-brown filigree work of the trees their feet went crunching through the furry crystals of the snow no that's one good thing she's done was it very funny your scrap it seemed funnier at the time than it did afterwards it was really rather beastly fanny didn't like it well you could hardly expect her to there's a limit to fanny's sense of humour there's a limit to mine fanny was right i had to fight her with the filthiest weapons i had to tell her she couldn't do anything because he was waddington of wick and she was up against all his ancestors i had to drag in his ancestors oh that was bad i know it was it's what fanny hated and no wonder she made me feel such a miserable little snob ralph fanny did yes she couldn't have done it she'd have let her do her damnedest that's because fanny's an incurable little aristocrat she's got more waddington of wickedness in her little finger than horatio has in all his ego and she despises mrs levitt she wouldn't have condescended to scrap with her the horrible thing is it's true he can do what he likes and nothing happens to him he can turn the ballingers out of their house and nothing happens he can make love to a woman who doesn't want to be made love to and nothing happens 
because he's waddington of wick he's waddington of wick but he isn't such a bad old thing really people laugh at him but they like him because he's so funny and they've taken mrs levitt's measure pretty accurately you don't think then that i was too big a beast to her ralph laughed somebody had to save him ralph after all he's fanny's husband yes after all he's fanny's husband so you don't do you of course i don't what's he doing now oh just pottering about with his book it's nearly finished you've kept it up rather there isn't a sentence he mightn't have written himself i think i'm going to let him go back to lower wick on the last page and end there in his manner i thought of putting something in about holly decked halls and yule logs on the christmas hearth he was photographed the other day in the snow gorgeous i wonder if he'll really settle down now or if he'll do it all over again some day with somebody else he can't tell you can't possibly tell he may do anything that's what we feel about him barbara said endless possibilities yet you'd think he couldn't go one better than mrs levitt for the next half mile they disputed whether in the scene with mrs levitt he was or was not really funny ralph was inclined to think that he might have been purely disgusting you didn't see him ralph you've no right to say he wasn't funny no no i didn't see him you needn't rub it in barbara we've got to wait and see what he does next it may be your turn any day we can't expect him to do very much for a little while he must be a bit exhausted with this last stunt yes and the funny thing is he has moments when you don't laugh at him moments of calm beautiful peace you come on him walking in his garden looking for snowdrops in the snow or he's sitting in his library reading buchan's history of the great war happy not thinking about himself at all then you're sorry you ever laughed at him i'm not ralph said he owes it to us he does nothing else to justify his existence yes but he exists he exists and somehow it's pretty mysterious when you think of it you wonder whether you mayn't have seen him all wrong whether all the time he isn't just a simple old thing when you get that feeling of his mysteriousness ralph somehow you're done i haven't had it yet oh it's there you'll get it some day you see barbara how right i was we can't keep off him End of chapter thirteen Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter fourteen of Mr. Waddington of Wick by May Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter fourteen, part one. It was Sunday, the last week of Horry's holidays all through supper he had been talking about cycling to sirenster if the frost held to skate on the canal the frost did hold and in the morning he strapped a cushion on the carrier of his bicycle and called up the stairs to barbara come along barbara let's go to sirenster barbara appeared ready carrying her skates mr waddington had let her off the ramblings yet all of a sudden she looked depressed oh horry she said i was going with ralph you are not said horry you're always going with ralph you're jolly well coming with me this time but i promised him you'd no business to promise him when it's the last week of my holidays tisn't fair fanny came out into the hall horry she said don't worry barbara can't you see she wants to go with ralph that's exactly he said what i complain of she shook her head at him you're your father all over again she said i'll swear i'm not said horry if you were half as polite as your father it wouldn't be a bad thing there was a sound of explosions in the drive there's ralph come to settle it himself said fanny and at that point mr waddington came out on them suddenly from the cloak-room what's all this he said he looked with disgust at the skates dangling from barbara's hand he went out into the porch and looked with disgust at ralph and at the motor bicycles he thought with bitterness of the sirenster canal he couldn't skate even when he was horry's age he hadn't skated he couldn't ride a motor bicycle when he looked at the beastly things and thought of their complicated machinery and their evil fascination for barbara he hated them he hated horry and ralph standing up before barbara handsome vibrating with youth and health and energy i won't have barbara riding on that thing it isn't safe 
if he skids on the snow he'll break her neck much more likely to break his own neck said horry in his savage interior mr waddington wished he would and horry too he won't skid said barbara if he does i'll hop off we'll come back said ralph if we don't get on all right they started in a duet of explosions the motor bicycles hissing and crunching through the light snow barbara swinging on ralph's carrier waved her hand light-heartedly to mr waddington he hated barbara but far more than barbara he hated horry and far more than horry he hated ralph he'd no business to take her he said she'd no business to go you can't stop them my dear said fanny they're too young well if they come back with their necks broken they'll have only themselves to thank he took a ferocious pleasure in thinking of horry and ralph and barbara with their necks broken fanny stared at him i wonder what's made him so cross she thought he looks as if he'd got a chill on the liver horatio have you got a chill on the liver now what on earth put that into your head your face you look just a little off colour darling at that moment mr waddington began to sneeze there i knew you'd caught cold you oughtn't to go standing about in draughts i haven't caught cold said mr waddington but he shut himself up in his library and stayed there huddled in his armchair from time to time he leaned forward and stooped over the hearth holding his chest and stomach as near as possible to the fire shivers like thin icicles kept on slipping down his spine at lunch-time he complained that there was nothing he could eat and before the meal was over he went back to his library and his fire fanny sat with him there i wish you wouldn't go standing out in the cold she said she knew that on saturday he had stood for more than ten minutes in the fallen snow of the park to be photographed and he wouldn't wear his overcoat because he thought he looked younger without it and slenderer no wonder you've got a chill she said i didn't get it then i got it yesterday in the garden she remembered he had been wandering about the garden after church looking for snowdrops in the snow barbara had worn the snowdrops in the breast of her gown last night he nourished his resentment on that memory and on the thought that he had got his chill picking snowdrops for barbara at tea-time he drank a little tea but he couldn't eat anything he felt sick and his head ached at dinner-time on fanny's advice he went to bed and fanny took his temperature a hundred and one he turned the thermometer in his hand gazing earnestly at the slender silver thread he was gratified to know that his temperature was a hundred and one and that fanny was frightened and had sent for the doctor he had a queer satisfied exalted feeling now that he was in for it when barbara came back she would know what he was in for and be frightened too he would have been still more gratified if he had known that without him dinner was a miserable affair fanny showed that she was frightened and her fear flattened down the high spirits of ralph and barbara and horry returned from their skating you see barbara said ralph when they had left fanny and horry with the doctor we can't live without him they listened at the smoke-room door for the sound of dr ransome's departure and ralph waited while barbara went back and brought him the verdict it's flu and a touch of congestion of the lungs they looked at each other sorrowfully so sorrowfully that they smiled yet we can smile he said you know said barbara he got it standing in the snow while pyecraft photographed him it's the way ralph said he would get it and barbara laughed but all the same she felt a distinct pang at her heart every time she went into her bedroom and saw in its glass on her dressing-table the bunch of snowdrops that mr waddington had picked for her in the snow they made a pattern on her mind white cones hanging down sharp green blades piercing green stalks held in the crystal of the water part two nobody but a fool said horry would have stood out in the snow to be photographed at his age don't horry barbara was in the morning-room stirring some black sticky stuff in a saucepan over the fire the black sticky stuff was to go on mr waddington's chest horry looked on standing beside her in an attitude of impatience a pair of boots with skates clipped on hung from his shoulders by their laces he felt that his irritation was justifiable for barbara had refused to go out skating with him why don't said horry it's obvious very but he's ill there can't be much the matter with him or the mater wouldn't look so chirpy she likes nursing him well horry said you can't nurse him no but i can stir this stuff said barbara 
i suppose horry said you'd think me an awful brute if i went i wish you would go you're a much more awful brute standing there saying things about him and getting in my way all right i'll get out of it that's jolly easy and he went but he felt sick and sore he had tried to persuade himself that his father wasn't ill because he couldn't bear to think how ill he was it interfered with his enjoyment of his skating if he said to himself if he'd only put it off till the ice gave but it was just like him to choose a hard frost his anger gave him relief from the sickening anxiety he felt when he thought of his father and his father's temperature it had gone down but not to normal mr waddington lay in his bed in fanny's room barbara standing at the open door with her saucepan caught a sight of him he was propped up by his pillows on his shoulders over one of those striped pajama suits that barbara had once ordered from the stores he wore like a shawl a woolly fawn-coloured motor scarf of fanny's his arms were laid before him on the counterpane in a gesture of complete surrender to his illness fanny was always tucking them away under the blankets but if anybody came in he would have them so he was sitting up waiting in an adorable patience for something to be done for him his face had the calm happy look of expectation utterly appeased and resigned it was that look that frightened barbara it made her think that mr waddington was going to die supposing his congestion turned to pneumonia there was so much of him to be ill and those big men always did die when they got pneumonia mr waddington could hear barbara's quiet voice saying something to fanny he could see her unhappy anxious face he enjoyed barbara's anxiety he enjoyed the cause of it his illness so long as he was actually alive he even enjoyed the thought that if his congestion turned to pneumonia he might actually die there was a dignity a prestige about being dead that appealed to him even his high temperature and his headache and his shooting pains and his difficulty in breathing could not altogether spoil his pleasure in the delicious concern of everybody about him and in his exquisite certainty that at any minute a moan would bring fanny to his side he was the one person in the house that counted he had always known it but he had never felt it with the same intensity as now the mind of every person in the house was concentrated on him now as it had not been concentrated before he was holding them all in a tension of worry and anxiety he would apologize very sweetly for the trouble he was giving everybody declaring that it made him very uncomfortable but even fanny could see that he was gratified and as he got worse before he became too ill to think about it at all he had a muzzy yet pleasurable sense that everybody in wick on the hill and in the county for miles round was thinking of him he knew that corbett and lady corbett and markham and thurston and the hawtreys and the rector and the rector's wife and colonel granger had called repeatedly to inquire for him he was particularly gratified by granger's calling he knew that hitchin had stopped horry in the street to ask after him and he was particularly gratified by that old susan nana had come up from medlicott to see him and ralph bevan called every day that gratified him too the only person who was not allowed to know anything about his illness was his mother for mr waddington was certain it would kill her every evening at medicine time he would ask the same questions my mother doesn't know yet and anybody cold to-day and fanny would give him the messages and he would receive them with a gentle solemn sweetness he wouldn't have believed barbara said to herself that complacency could take so heart-rending a form and under it all a deeper bliss and bliss was the thought that barbara was thinking about him worrying about him and being probably ten times more unhappy about him than fanny after working so long by his side her separation from him would be intolerable to barbara intolerable very likely the thought that it was fanny's turn now to be by his side every day she brought him a bunch of snowdrops and every day as the door closed on her little anxious face he was sorry for barbara shut out from his room poor little barbara sometimes when he was feeling well enough he would call to her come in barbara and she would come in and look at him and put her flowers into his hand and say she hoped he was better and he would answer not much better barbara i'm very ill he even allowed ralph to come and look at him he would hold his hand in a clasp that he made as limp as possible on purpose and would say in a voice artificially weakened i'm very ill ralph 
dr ransome said he wasn't but mr waddington knew better it was true that from time to time he rallied sufficiently to comb his own hair before barbara was let in with her snowdrops and that he could give orders to partridge in a loud firm tone but he was too ill to do more than whisper huskily to barbara and fanny then when he felt a little better the trained nurse came and with the sheer excitement of her coming mr waddington's temperature leapt up again and the doctor owned that he didn't like that and barbara found fanny in the library crying she had been tidying up his writing-table going over all his papers with a feather brush and she had come on the manuscript of the ramblings unfinished fanny barbara i know i'm an idiot but i simply cannot bear it it was all very well as long as i could nurse him but now that woman's come there's nothing i can do for him i've i've never done anything all my life for him he's always done everything for me and i've been a brute always laughing at him think barbara think for eighteen years never to have taken him seriously never since i married him i believe he's going to die just to punish me he isn't said barbara indignantly as if she had never believed it herself the doctor says he isn't really very ill the congestion isn't spreading it was better yesterday it'll be worse to-night you may depend on it the doctor doesn't like his temperature flying up and down like that it'll go down again said barbara you don't know what it'll do said fanny darkly did you ever see such a lamb such a lamb as he is when he's ill no said barbara he's an angel that's just said fanny what makes me feel he's going to die i wish i were you barbara me yes you've really helped him he could never have written his book without you his poor book she sat stroking it and suddenly a horrible memory overcame her and she cried out oh my god and i've laughed at that too barbara put her arm round her you didn't darling well if you did it is a little funny you know i'm afraid i've laughed a bit oh you that doesn't matter you helped to write it then barbara broke out oh don't fanny don't don't talk about his poor book i can't bear it we're both idiots said fanny imbeciles she paused drying her eyes he liked the snowdrops you brought him she said barbara thought and the snowdrops he brought me he had caught cold that day picking them they had withered in the glass in her bedroom she left fanny only to come upon horry in his agony horry stood in the window of the dining-room staring out and scowling at the snow damn the snow he said it's killed him it hasn't horry she said he'll get better he won't get better if this beastly frost holds he hasn't got a chance horry dear the doctor says he's better he doesn't he says his temperature's got no business to go up all the same supposing he does think him better supposing he doesn't know supposing he's a bleeding idiot i expect the dear old pater knows how he is a jolly sight better than anybody can tell him and you know you're worrying about him yourself so's the mater she's been crying he's jealous of the nurse that's what's the matter with her jealous tosh that nurse is an idiot she sent his temperature up first thing poor old thing you must buck up you mustn't let your nerve go like this nerve your nerve would go if you were me i tell you barbara i wouldn't care a hang about his being ill i mean i shouldn't care so infernally if i'd been decent to him but you were right i was a cad a swine laughing at him so was i horry i laughed at him i'd give anything not to have you didn't matter he was silent a moment then he swung round full to her his face burned his eyes flashed tears he held his head up to stop them falling barbara if he dies i'll kill myself that evening mr waddington's temperature went up another point ralph calling about nine o'clock found barbara alone in the library huddled in a corner of the sofa with her pocket handkerchief beside her rolled in a tight damp ball she started as he came in oh she said i thought you were the doctor do you want him yes fanny does she's frightened shall i go and get him no no they've sent kimber oh ralph i'm frightened too but he's getting on all right he is really ransom says so i know i've told them that but they won't believe it and i don't now he'll die you'll see he'll die just because we've been such pigs to him nonsense that wouldn't make him 
i'm not so sure it's awful to see him lying there like a lamb so good when you think how we've hunted and hounded him he didn't know barbara we never let him know you don't know what he knew he must have seen it he never sees anything i tell you you don't know what he sees i'd give anything anything not to have done it so would i it's a lesson to me she said as long as i live never to laugh at anybody again never to say cruel things we didn't say cruel things unkind things not very unkind we did i did i said all the really beastly ones no no you didn't not half as beastly as i and horry did that's what horry's thinking now he's nearly off his head about it look here barbara you're simply sentimentalizing because he's ill and you're sorry for him you needn't be i tell you he's enjoying his illness i don't suppose said ralph thoughtfully he's enjoyed anything so much since the war doesn't that show what brutes we've been that he has to be ill in order to enjoy himself oh no he enjoys himself himself barbara all the time he can't help enjoying his illness he likes to have everybody fussing round him and thinking about him that's what i mean we never did think of him not seriously we've done nothing nothing but laugh why you're laughing now it's horrible of you ralph when he may be dying it would serve us all jolly well right if he did die to her surprise and indignation barbara began to cry the hard damp lump of pocket handkerchief was not a bit of good and before she could reach out for it ralph's arms were round her and he was kissing the tears off one by one darling i didn't think you really minded what did you think then she sobbed i thought you were playing a sort of variation of the game i told you it was a cruel game never mind it's all over we'll never play it again and he'll be well in another week look here barbara can't you leave off thinking about him for a minute you know i love you most awfully don't you yes i know now all right and i know how do you know because old thing you never cease to hang on to my collar since i grabbed you you can't go back on that i don't want to go back on it i say we always said he brought us together and he has this time when later that night ralph told fanny of their engagement the first thing she said was you mustn't tell him not till he's well again in fact i'd rather you didn't tell him till just before you're married why ever not it might upset him you see she said he's very fond of barbara the next day mr waddington's temperature went down to normal and the next when ralph called barbara fairly rushed at him with the news he's sitting up she shouted eating a piece of sole hooray now we can be happy the sound of fanny's humming came through the drawing-room door end of chapter fourteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifteen sections one and two of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifteen section one mr waddington was sitting up in his armchair before the bedroom fire by turning his head a little to the right he could command a perfect view of himself in the long glass by the window to get up and look at himself in that glass had been the first act of his convalescence he had hardly dared to think what alterations his illness might have made in him he remembered the horrible sight that corbett had presented after his influenza last year looking earnestly at himself in the glass he had found that his appearance was if anything improved outlines that he had missed for the last ten years were showing up again the postlethwaite nose was cleaner cut he was almost slender and not half so weak as fanny said he ought to have been immobility in bed his spiritual attitude of complacent acquiescence and the release of his whole organism from the strain of a restless intellect had set him up more than his influenza had pulled him down and it was a distinctly more refined and youthful waddington that barbara found sitting in the armchair wearing a royal blue wadded silk dressing-gown and fanny's motor-scarf with a grey mohair shawl over his knees mr waddington's convalescence was altogether delightful to him 
admitting as it did of sustained companionship with barbara as soon as it reached the armchair stage she sat with him for hours together she had finished the ramblings and at his request she read them aloud to him all over again from beginning to end mr waddington was much gratified by the impression they made recited in barbara's charming voice the voice that trembled a little now and then with an emotion that did her credit come with me into the little sheltered valley of the speed let us follow the brown trout stream that goes purling through the lush green grass of the meadows i had no idea said mr waddington it was anything like so good as it is we may congratulate ourselves on having got rid of ralph bevan and in february when the frost broke and the spring weather came and the green and pink and purple fields showed up again through the mist on the hillsides he went out driving with barbara in his car he wanted to look again at the places of his ramblings and he wanted barbara to look at them with him it was the reward he had promised her for what he called her dreary mechanical job of copying and copying barbara noticed the curious exalted expression of his face as he sat up beside her in the car looking noble she put it down partly to that everlasting self-satisfaction that made his inward happiness and partly to sheer physical exhilaration induced by speed she felt something like it herself as they tore switchbacking up and down the hills an excitement whipped up on the top of the deep happiness that came from thinking about ralph and there was hardly a moment when she didn't think about him it made her eyes shine and her mouth quiver with a peculiarly blissful smile and mr waddington looked at barbara where she sat tucked up beside him he noticed the shining and the quivering and he thought what he always had thought of barbara only now he was certain the child loved him she had been fascinated and frightened frightened and fascinated by him from the first hour that she had known him but she was not afraid of him any more she had left off struggling she was giving herself up like a child to this feeling the nature of which in her child's innocence she did not yet know but he knew he had always known it so much one half of mr waddington's mind admitted while the other half denied that he had known it with any certainty it went on saying to itself blind blind yet i might have known it as if he hadn't he had of course kept it before him as a possibility no part of him denied that and he had used tact he had handled a delicate situation with a consummate delicacy he had done everything an honourable man could do but there it was there it had been from the day that he had come into the house and found her there and the thing was too strong for barbara poor child he might have known it would be and it was too strong for mr waddington it wasn't his fault it was fanny's fault having the girl there and forcing them to that dangerous intimacy before his illness mr waddington had resisted successfully any little inclination he might have had to take advantage of the situation he conceived his inner life for the last nine months as consisting of a series of resistances he conceived the episode of elise as a safety valve natural but unpleasant for the emotions caused by barbara the substitution of a permissible for an impermissible lapse it had been incredible to him that he should make love to barbara but one effect of his influenza was apparent it had lowered his resistance and lowering it had altered his whole moral perspective and his scale of values till one morning in april walking with barbara in the garden that smelt of wallflowers and violets he became aware that barbara was as necessary to him as he was to barbara her easel stood in a corner of the lawn with an unfinished water-colour drawing of the house on it he paused before it smiling his tender sentimental smile there's one thing i regret barbara that i didn't have your drawings for my cotswold book the ramblings thanks to unproclaimed activities of ralph bevan were at that moment in the press why should you she said if you didn't care about them it's inconceivable that i shouldn't have cared i was blind blind well some day if we ever have a deluxe edition they shall appear in that some day she hadn't the heart to tell him that the drawings had another destination for as yet the existence of ralph's book was a secret they had agreed that nothing should disturb mr waddington's pleasure in the publication of his ramblings his poor ramblings one has to pay for blindness in this world he said a lot of people will be let in at that rate 
i don't suppose five will care a rap about my drawings i wasn't thinking only of your drawings my dear he pondered fanny tells me you're going to have a birthday you're quite a little april girl aren't you part two it was barbara's twenty-fourth birthday and the day of her adoption it had begun unpropitiously with something very like a dispute between horatio and fanny mr waddington had gone up to london the day before and had returned with a pearl pendant for fanny and a green jade necklace for barbara not yet presented and a canary yellow waistcoat for himself and not only the waistcoat on the birthday morning fanny had called out to barbara as she passed her bedroom door barbara come here fanny was staring fascinated at four pairs of silk pyjamas spread out before her on the bed remarkable pyjamas of a fierce magenta with forked lightning and orange running about all over them good god fanny you may well say good god what would you say if you'd got to Ugh, i'm not a nervous woman but it's a mercy he didn't get them eighteen years ago said barbara or horry might have been born an idiot yellow waistcoats are all very well said fanny but what can he have been thinking of i don't know said barbara somehow the pattern called up irresistibly the image of mrs levitt perhaps she said he thinks he's jupiter well i'm not what's her name and i don't want to be blasted so i'll put them somewhere where he can't find them at that moment they had heard mr waddington coming through his dressing-room and barbara had run away by the door into the corridor who took those things out of my wardrobe he said he was gazing dreamily affectionately almost at the pyjamas i did and what for to look at them can you wonder horatio if you wear them i'll apply for a separation you needn't worry there was a queer look in his face significant and furtive and fanny's mind with one of its rapid flights darted off from the pyjamas what are you going to do about barbara she said do about her yes you know we were going to adopt her if we liked her enough and we do like her enough don't we i have no paternal feeling for barbara said mr waddington the parental relation does not appeal to me as desirable or suitable i should have thought considering her age and your age it was very suitable indeed not if it entails obligations that i might regret you're going to provide for her aren't you that isn't an obligation surely you'll regret i can provide for her without adopting her how it's no good just leaving her something in your will i shall continue half her salary said mr waddington as an allowance yes but will you give her a marriage portion if she marries he was silent his mind reeled with the blow if she marries he said with my consent and my approval yes oh if that isn't a parental attitude and supposing she doesn't she isn't thinking of marrying you don't know what she's thinking of neither i venture to say do you well i don't see how i can adopt her if you don't i didn't say i wouldn't adopt her then you will he snapped back at her with an incredible ferocity i suppose i shall have to don't worry me he then lifted up the pyjamas from the bed and carried them into his dressing-room through the open door she saw him mounted on a chair laying them out tenderly on the top shelf of the wardrobe as if he were storing them for some mysterious and romantic purpose in which fanny was not included perhaps after all she thought he only bought them because they make him feel young all the morning that morning of barbara's birthday and adoption mr waddington's thoughtful gloom continued and in the afternoon he shut himself up in his library and gave orders that he was not to be disturbed end of chapter fifteen part two recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifteen section three of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifteen section three barbara was in the morning-room they had given her the morning-room for a study and she was alone in it amusing herself with her pocket sketch-book the sketch-book was barbara's and ralph's secret sometimes it lived for days with ralph at the white hart sometimes it lived with barbara in her coat-pocket 
or in her bureau under lock and key she was obsessed with the fear that some day she would leave it about and fanny would find it or mr waddington or any minute mr waddington might come on her and catch her with it it would be awful if she were caught for that remarkable collection contained several pen and ink drawings of mr waddington and barbara added to their number daily but at the moment the long interval between an unusually early birthday tea and an unusually late birthday dinner she was safe fanny had gone over to medlicott in the car mr waddington was tucked away in his library reading in perfect innocence and simplicity and peace it wasn't even likely that ralph would turn up for he had gone over to oxford and it was on his account that the birthday dinner was put off till half-past eight there would be hours and hours she had just finished the last of three drawings of mr waddington mr waddington standing up before the long looking-glass in his new pyjamas mr waddington appearing in the doorway of fanny's bedroom as jupiter with forked lightning zigzagging out of him into every corner mr waddington stooping to climb into his bed a broad back view with lightnings blazing out of it and it was that moment that mr waddington chose to come in to present the green jade necklace he was wearing his canary yellow waistcoat barbara closed her sketch-book hurriedly and laid it on the table she kept one arm over it while she received and opened the leather case where the green necklace lay in its white cushion for me oh it's too heavenly how awfully sweet of you do you like it barbara i love it compunction stung her when she thought of her drawings especially the one where he was getting into bed she said to herself i'll never do it again never again and i won't show it to ralph put it on he commanded and let me see you in it she lifted it from the case she raised her arms and clasped it round her neck she went to the looking-glass and after the first rapt moment of admiration mr waddington possessed himself of the uncovered sketch-book barbara saw him in the looking-glass she turned with a cry you mustn't you mustn't look at it why not because i don't let anybody see my sketches you'll let me i won't she dashed at him clutching his arm and hanging her weight on it he shook himself free and raised the sketch-book high above her head she jumped up tearing at it but his grip held he delighted in his power he laughed give it me this instant she said aha she's got her little secrets has she yes yes they're all there you've no business to look at them he caracoled heavily dodging her attack enjoying the youthful violence of the struggle come he said ask me nicely please then please give it me he gave it bowing profoundly over her hand as she took it i wouldn't look into your dear little secrets for the world he said they sat down amicably you'll let me stay with you a little while please do won't you have one of my cigarettes he took one turning it in his fingers and smiling at it a lingering sentimental smile i think i know your secret he said presently do you her mind rushed to ralph i think so and i think you know mine yours yes mine we can't go on living like this so close to each other without knowing we may try to keep things from each other but we can't i feel as if you'd seen everything she said to herself he's thinking of mrs levitt i don't suppose i've seen anything that matters she said you've seen what my life is here you can't have helped seeing that fanny and i don't hit it off very well together fanny's an angel oh you dear little loyal thing yes she's an angel too much of an angel for a mere man i made my grand mistake barbara when i married her she doesn't think so anyhow i'm not so sure fanny knows she's got hold of something that's too too big for her what's wrong with fanny is that she can't grasp things she's afraid of them and she can't take serious things seriously it's no use expecting her to i've left off expecting you don't understand fanny one bit my dear child i've been married to her more than seventeen years i am not a fool you've seen for yourself how she takes things how she belittles everything with her everlasting laugh 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 in time it gets on your nerves it would said barbara if you don't see the fun of it you can't expect me to see the fun of my own funeral funeral is it as bad as all that it has been as bad as all that barbara he brooded 
and then you came with your sweetness and your little serious face is my face serious very to me other people may think you frivolous and amusing i dare say you are amusing to them oh, i hope so you hope so because you want to hide your real self from them but you can't hide it from me i've seen it all the time barbara are you sure quite quite sure i wish i knew what it looked like that's the beauty and charm of you my dear that you don't know what a nice waistcoat you've got on said barbara he looked gratified i'm glad you like it i put it on for your birthday you mean she said my adoption day he winced it is good she said of you and fanny to adopt me but it won't be for very long and i want to earn my own living all the same i can't think of letting you do that i must it won't make any difference to my adoption he scowled so repugnant to him was this subject that he judged it would be equally distasteful to barbara it was fanny's idea he said i thought it would be you didn't expect me to have paternal feelings for you barbara i didn't expect you to have any feelings at all the wound made him start my poor child what a terrible thing for you to say why terrible because it shows it shows and it isn't true do you suppose i don't know what's been going on inside you i was blind to myself my dear but i saw through you saw through me she thought again of ralph through and through i didn't know i was so transparent but i don't see that it matters much if you did he smiled at her delicious naivete no nothing matters nothing matters barbara except our caring at least we're wise enough to know that i shouldn't have thought she said it would take much wisdom more than you think my child more than you think you've only got to be wise for yourself i've got to be wise for both of us she thought heavy parent that comes of being adopted when it comes to the point she said one can only be wise for oneself oh i'm glad you see that it makes it much easier for me it does you mustn't think you're responsible for me just because you've adopted me don't talk to me about adoption when you know perfectly well what i did it for why what did you do it for to make things safe for us to keep fanny from knowing to keep myself from knowing barbara to keep you oh, but it's too late to camouflage it we know where we stand now i don't think i do you do you do mr waddington tossed his cigarette into the fire with a passionate gesture of abandonment he came to her she saw his coming she saw it chiefly as the approach of a canary yellow waistcoat she fixed her attention on the waistcoat as if it were the centre of her own mental equilibrium there was a bend in the waistcoat mr waddington was stooping over her with his face peering into hers she sat motionless held under his face by curiosity and fear the whole phenomenon seemed to her incredible too incredible as yet to call for protest it was as if it were not happening as if she were merely waiting to see it happen before she cried out yet she was frightened this state lasted for one instant the next she was in his arms his mouth thrust out under the big rough moustache was running over her face like like while she pressed her hands hard against the canary yellow waistcoat pushing him off her mind disengaged itself from the struggle and reported like a vacuum cleaner that was it vacuum cleaner he gave back there was no evil violence in him and she got on her feet how could you she cried how could you be such a perfect pig don't say that to me barbara even in fun you know you love me i don't i don't you do you know you do you know you want me to take you in my arms why be so cruel to yourself to myself i'd kill myself before i let you why i'd kill you no 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 you only think you would you little spitfire he had given back altogether and now leaned against the chimney-piece not beaten not abashed but smiling at her in a triumphant certitude for so long the glamour of his illusion held him nothing you can say barbara will persuade me that you don't care for me then you must be mad mad as a hatter all men go mad at times you must make allowances listen i won't listen i don't want to hear another word she was going 
he saw her intention but he was nearer to the door than she was and by a quick though ponderous movement he got there first he stood before her with his back to the door he had the wild thought of locking it but chivalry forbade him you can go in a minute he said but you've got to listen to me first you've got to be fair to me i may be mad but if i didn't care for you madly i wouldn't have supposed for an instant that you cared for me i wouldn't have thought of such a thing but i don't i tell you and i tell you you do do you suppose after all you've done for me i haven't done anything done look at the way you've worked for me i've never known anything like your devotion barbara oh that it was only my job was it your job to save me from that horrible woman oh yes it was all in the day's work my dear barbara no woman ever does a day's work like that for a man unless she cares for him and unless she wants him to care for her as it happens it was fanny i cared for i was thinking of fanny all the time if you'd think about fanny more and about mrs levitt and people less it would be a good thing oh it's too late to think about fanny now that's only your sweetness and goodness please don't lie if you really thought me sweet and good you wouldn't expect me to be a substitute for mrs levitt don't talk about mrs levitt do you suppose i think of you in the same sentence that was a different thing altogether was it was it so very different he saw that she remembered it was a man may lose his head ten times over without losing his heart once if it's mrs levitt you're thinking about you can put that out of your mind forever it isn't only mrs levitt there's ralph bevan you've forgotten ralph bevan what has ralph bevan got to do with it simply this that i'm engaged to be married to him to be married to be married to ralph bevan oh barbara why didn't you tell me ralph didn't want me to till nearer the time the time did it come to that it did said barbara he moved from the doorway and began walking up and down the room she might now have gone out but she didn't go she had to see what he would make of it at his last turn he faced her and stood still poor child he said so that's what i've driven you to amazement kept her silent sit down he said we must go through this together amazement made her sit down certainly they must go through it to see what he would look like at the end he was unsurpassable she mustn't miss him look here barbara he spoke in a tone of forced unnatural calm i don't think you quite understand the situation i'm sure you don't realize for one moment how serious it is i don't you mustn't expect me to take it seriously that's because you don't take yourself seriously enough dear in some ways you're singularly humble i don't believe you really know how deep this thing has gone with me or you wouldn't have talked about mrs levitt it's life and death barbara life and death i'll make a confession it wasn't serious at first it wasn't love at first sight but it's gone all the deeper for that i don't know how deep it was till the other day and i had so much to think of so many claims fanny yes don't forget fanny i am not forgetting her fanny isn't going to mind as you think she minds as you would mind yourself if you were in her place things don't go so deep with fanny as all that and she isn't going to hold me against my will she's not that sort listen now please listen barbara sat still listening she would let him go to the end of his tether i'll confess in the beginning i hadn't thought of a divorce i couldn't bear the idea of going through all that unpleasantness but i'd go through it ten times over rather than that you should marry ralph bevan wait now before i spoke to you today, i'd made up my mind to ask fanny to divorce me i know she'll do it your name shan't be allowed to appear the moment i get her consent we'll go off together somewhere italy or the riviera i've got everything planned everything ready i saw to that when i was in london i bought everything she saw forked lightnings on a magenta waddington what are you laughing at barbara he stood over her distressed was barbara going to treat him to a fit of hysterics don't laugh don't be silly child but barbara went on laughing with her face in the cushions abandoned to her vision from far up the park they heard the sound of kimber's hooter then the grinding of the car with fanny in it on the gravel outside barbara sat up suddenly and dried her eyes they stared at each other the stare of accomplices 
come child he said pull yourself together barbara got up and looked in the glass and saw the green jade necklace hanging on her still she took it off and laid it on the table beside the forgotten sketchbook i think she said you must have meant this for mrs levitt but you may thank your stars it's only me this time he pretended not to hear her not to see the necklace not to know that she was going from him she stood a moment with her back to the door facing him it was her turn to stand there and be listened to mr waddington she said some people might think you wicked i only think you funny he drew himself up and looked noble funny if that's your idea of me you had better marry ralph bevan i almost think i had and she laughed again not mrs levitt's laughter gross with experience he had borne that without much pain girl's laughter it was young and innocent and pure and ten times more cruel you don't know she said you don't know how funny you are and left him mr waddington took up the necklace and kissed it he rubbed it against his cheek and kissed it a slip of paper had fallen from the table to the floor he knew what was written on it from horatio bish waddington to his little april girl he took it up and put it in his pocket he took up the sketchbook the little thing he thought now if it hadn't been for her ridiculous jealousy of elise if it hadn't been for fanny if it hadn't been for the little thing's sweetness and goodness her goodness she was a saint a saint it was barbara's virtue not barbara that had repulsed him this was the only credible explanation of her behaviour the only one he could bear to live with he opened the sketchbook it was fanny coming in that instant who saved him from the worst when she had restored the sketchbook to its refuge in the bureau and locked it in she turned to him horatio she said as ralph's coming to dinner to-night i'd better tell you that he and barbara are engaged to be married she has told me herself that child fanny is a saint a little saint how did you find that out do you think it takes a saint to marry ralph i think it takes a saint to to marry ralph since you put it that way end of chapter fifteen section three recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifteen sections four and five of mr waddington of wick by may sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine chapter fifteen section four dearest fanny i'm sorry but mr waddington and i have had a scrap it's made things impossible and i'm going to ralph he'll turn out for me so there won't be any scandal you know how awfully i love you that's why you'll forgive me if i don't come back always your loving barbara p s i'm frightfully sorry about my birthday dinner but i don't feel birthdayish or dinnerish either i want ralph nothing but ralph that would make fanny think it was ralph they had quarrelled about barbara put this note on fanny's dressing-table then she went up to the white heart to ralph bevan she waited in his sitting-room till he came back from oxford hello old thing what are you doing here ralph do you awfully mind if we don't dine at the manor if we don't why because i've left them and i don't want to go back do you think i could get a room here what's up i've had a simply awful scrap with waddy and i can't stick it there between us we've made it impossible what's he been up to oh never mind he's been making love to you oh if you call it making love oh the old swine as he said it he felt the words and his own fury falls short of the fantastic quality of waddington no he isn't barbara felt it he was simply more funny than you can imagine he had on a canary yellow waistcoat in spite of his fury he smiled i think he'd bought it for that oh barbara what he must have looked like yes if only you could have seen him but that's the worst of all his best things they only happen when you're alone with him you remember we wondered whether he'd do it again whether he'd go one better yes ralph we little thought it would be me how he does surpass himself the funniest thing was he thought i was in love with him he didn't he did because of the way i'd worked for him he thought that proved it yes yes i suppose he would think it 
look here he didn't do anything did he he kissed me that wasn't funny the putrid old sinner if he wasn't so old i'd wring his neck for him no no that's all wrong it's not the way we agreed to take him we'd think it funny enough if he'd done it to somebody else it's pure accident that it's me no doubt that's the proper philosophic view i wonder whether mrs levitt takes it ralph it wasn't a bit like his mrs levitt stunt the awful thing was he really meant it he'd planned it all out we were to go off together to the riviera and he was to wear his canary waistcoat did he say that no but you can see he thought it and he was going to get fanny to divorce him good god he went as far as that as far as that he was so cocksure you see i'm afraid it's been a bit of a shock to him well it's a thundering good thing i've got a job at last have you yes we can get married the day after tomorrow if we like black adder's given me the editorship of the new review no oh ralph how topping that's what i ran up to oxford for to see him and settle everything it's a fairly decent screw the thing's got no end of backing and it's up to me to make it last i say fanny'll be pleased as they were talking about it the landlady of the white hart came in to tell them that mrs waddington was downstairs and wanted to speak to miss madden all right ralph said show mrs waddington up i'll clear out oh ralph what am i to say to her tell her the truth if she wants it she won't mind she will frightfully not so frightfully as you think that's what he said well he's right there the old beast section five barbara dear said fanny when they were alone together what on earth has happened oh nothing we just had a bit of a tiff that's all about ralph he told me it was ralph you might say it was ralph he came into it into what oh the general situation nonsense horatia was making love to you i could see by his face you needn't mind telling me straight out i've seen it coming since when i don't know it must have begun long before i saw it how long do you think oh before mrs levitt mrs levitt she may have been only a safety valve that's why i made him adopt you i thought it would stop it in common decency but it seems it only brought it to a head no it was his canary waistcoat did that fanny the ghost of dead mirth rose up in fanny's eyes you're muddling cause and effect my dear he wasn't in love because he bought the waistcoat he bought the waistcoat because he was in love and those other things the romantic pyjamas because he thought they'd make him look younger well then said barbara it was a vicious circle the waistcoat put it into his head that afternoon it doesn't much matter how it happened i'm awfully sorry fanny i wouldn't have let it happen for the world if i'd known it was going to but who could have known my dear it wasn't your fault do you mind frightfully fanny looked away it depends she said but what did you say to him i said a lot of things but they weren't a bit of good then i'm afraid i laughed you laughed at him i couldn't help it fanny he was so funny oh fanny caught her breath back on a sob that's what i can't bear barbara his being laughed at i know said barbara by the way when you're dying dear if you should be dying at any time it'll be a consolation to you to know that he didn't see your drawings did you see them only the one he was looking at when i came in was it was it the one where he was getting into bed no he was only hunting god has been kinder to me than i deserve then he's been kinder to him too i fancy she went on i want you to see this thing straight understand i don't mind his being in love with you i knew he was head over ears in love and i didn't mind a bit i think he was reckoning on that he knew you'd forgive him forgive him it wasn't even a question of forgiveness i was glad i thought if only he could have one real feeling if only he could care for something or somebody that wasn't himself i think he cared for you barbara it wasn't just himself and i loved him for it you darling and you don't hate me you know i don't but i'd loved you even more if you'd loved him if i'd loved him yes if you'd gone away with him and made him happy if you hadn't laughed at him barbara i know it was awful of me but what could i do what could you do 
we all do it i do it mrs levitt did it i didn't do it like mrs levitt no but you were just one more think of it all his life to be laughed at and when he was making love too the most serious thing barbara that anybody can do i tell you i can't bear it i'd have given him to you ten times first then said barbara you have got to forgive me if i don't it's because it's my own sin and i can't forgive myself besides i let it happen because i thought it would cure him of falling in love of trying to be young when he didn't feel it i thought he'd see how impossible it was but that's the sad part of it he would have felt young barbara if you'd let he would have felt young barbara if you'd loved him if i'd loved him i could have kept him young i told you she said it was all my fault you told me ralph and i would never be old is that what you meant yes they sat silent a moment looking down through ralph's window into the market square and presently they saw mr waddington pass the corner of the town hall and cross the wide open space to the dower house you must come back with me barbara if you don't everybody'll know what's happened i can't fanny he won't be there you won't see him till your wedding day he's going to stay with granny he says she isn't very well i'm sorry she isn't well she's perfectly well that isn't what he's going for across the square they could see the door of the dower house open and receive him fanny smiled he's going back to his mother to be made young again she said end of chapter fifteen recording by expatriate in bangor maine End of Mr. Waddington of Wick by Mason Clare.